Unexplained Encounters is available as a podcast. Just look for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app. Sorry this episode is a day late on YouTube. I've been having pain in my right side along my back as well as nausea. So immediately, my paranoid self thinks, oh, obviously I'm getting torn up by a kidney stone. I went to the doctor, did a blood test, and got it back today. The doctor's note about it was basically like, dang, dude, you really came in here with nothing wrong with you and made me fill you up? Oh, shaking my head. So now I'm back, feeling fine, and I'm getting caught up. Enjoy this five plus hour compilation of scary forest monster sightings. Here's a little extra bit to my story, by the way. I'm awkward as heck. As soon as that doctor asked me to raise up my shirt so he could examine my lower abdomen, I yanked that sucker up all the way past my nippies. Immediately, I thought, wow, why did I do that? Man, look at his face, he's embarrassed for me. Now if I pull my shirt down to cover my puffs, he's gonna know that I know how awkward it is. So I stood there revealing way too much of my bod for about a minute straight while the doctor and I pretended this was perfectly normal. <sighs> End of story. This is why I tell my wife all the time, I shouldn't be allowed to go anywhere alone, I just embarrass myself. If you ever want more of my nonsense and adventures, follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails and you'll help me reach 12k followers. Thank you. Now, sorry for the delay, enjoy these stories. The Shadow in the Woods From Anonymous I live in rural New England. I like to spend my free time exploring the back roads and woods in the area. You see, I'm an artist, and I like finding beautiful, secluded places to paint or draw. I have one such spot not far from me that I like to hike regularly, and on one unreasonably warm November day, I decided to head out and spend some time in the woods with my sketchbook. The trail is an old abandoned logging road that meanders through the woods along a river and leads to a rocky ledge and waterfall. The path is bordered by stone walls that used to separate the fields and farmland that once dominated the area. The trail is known by locals, but not many others. Most visitors to the area prefer to hike the more well-known mountain trails nearby. It was rare for me to bump into anyone else, and I preferred the solitude. It was hunting season, so I was relieved to see as I pulled my car off the road that there weren't any vehicles parked at the start of the trail. I wouldn't have to worry about anyone disturbing me or me disturbing anyone else. Like I said, my goal was to find peace and solitude in the forest, not small talk. Nevertheless, I donned a blaze orange hat and I tied a bright scarf to my backpack so I would be visible. I hiked into the waterfall without any issues, spending a lovely morning at the base of the falls, photographing the scenery and drawing in my sketchbook. The forest was beautiful. I would just sit and soak it all in. I felt safe in those woods. After a while, I began to slowly work my way back, stopping frequently to take pictures or just admire the scenery more. I got about halfway down the trail where off to one side, there is a small graveyard from the 1800s. Directly opposite that, there is a gap in the stone wall and a small path leading down a ridge deeper into the woods, closer to the river. This was an unusual choice for me. I was wary of hunters this time of year, and just being a woman hiking alone, I always had the worst possible scenario in the back of my mind. I preferred to stick to the trail, play it safe, but the woods today were intoxicating. The light filtered through the last of the leaves clinging to the trees, casting a golden glow on everything. The path was overgrown, but I picked my way closer to the water. It had rained the day before, and the river was running full and fast. I could hear it rushing over the rocks at the bottom of the ridge. As I came closer, I finally caught sight of the river. I stopped there to admire the sight before me, then I pulled out my camera, pointing it at the river, and I began to take pictures. I moved closer, but as I did, I began to get this anxious feeling at the back of my mind. It was like something just wasn't right. I started to feel like maybe I was no longer alone out there. 
I chalked it up to paranoia. It was probably just an animal. And I started climbing down onto the rocks to get closer. When suddenly, I looked up to see a figure standing in the woods on the other side of that river. What was more worrisome was the fact that this figure seemed to be looking right at me, almost leering from behind a small group of trees. It startled me. I thought I was by myself, but maybe a hunter had hiked in after me and had set himself up out there, away from the main trail. I offered a timid wave. If it was a hunter, I didn't want to make more noise than I already had. The figure, though, did not acknowledge me. I looked closer, and I noticed that it wasn't moving. In fact, it was eerily still and really looked too tall, too skinny to be a person. It had to have been seven to eight feet tall, and although I had the distinct feeling that it was looking at me, I couldn't make out any discernible features other than a head and shoulders. It seemed to almost blend with its surroundings like camouflage. It was just this grayish silhouette. I thought that maybe it was a trick of the light falling through the trees. Maybe it was just a creepy shadow. I shivered despite the warmth of the day as the hairs on my arm pricked up. I shook my head and I turned my attention back to the river. I began walking along the rocks, snapping pictures of the flowing water. I felt silly that I'd spooked myself over nothing. I'd made it maybe another ten yards when I looked up again and my stomach sank as I saw what looked like the same dark figure now standing across the river from me in the trees. Were they following me? How did I not notice someone walking along the opposite bank matching my pace? I called out to them. Hello. Hello. The figure shifted almost imperceptibly, but didn't respond. It had to be a hunter, or maybe I'd gone too far off the trail and was trespassing. My heart was now pounding in my chest. I called out again. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just I was taking just some pictures of the river since it's so nice out. Really, I didn't mean to bother you. I'll be going now. It stared back in eerie silence. I looked away, and then I looked back to see that the figure had now vanished. I thought my mind must have been playing tricks on me. Whatever that shadowy figure was, I wanted nothing to do with it. My small, nagging anxiety was ballooning to panic. A shadow in the woods was one thing, but a shadowy figure following me was quite another. I turned and started making my way back the way I came, trying to keep my attention focused on my feet, worried that in my agitation I would slip and fall on the wet mossy rocks. But every time I looked up, that thing was directly across the river, sometimes only peeking from behind the trees, but always keeping up with me without ever actually seeming to move. Then it would just disappear and reappear like a flicker. The only comfort to me was that I kept a hunting knife in my pocket and the swiftly running river between me and whoever or whatever that was. That had to offer me some protection, right? I turned to look across the river for a last time, and sure enough, that thing was even closer now, still watching me. I didn't understand how it moved so quickly between the trees without being seen. I started up the steep ridge, and as the sound of the river faded, I could hear a rustle, then twigs snapping behind me. I turned to look, but the forest was still. I quickened my pace, but I knew there was no way I could outrun whatever it was anyway. I just tried to focus on my breathing, clutching the knife in my pocket, hoping that I wouldn't need to use it. I could hear the thing darting around behind me, branches and twigs snapping on my left, then on my right, like it was zigzagging across the path. I was so scared I could no longer turn to look behind me, I just tried to move as swiftly and carefully as I could. I finally made it back to the main path, and the noises behind me stopped. I couldn't hear anything behind me anymore, 
but I started noticing birds chirping again. I guess I hadn't realized that the forest had been almost too quiet by the river. I kept up a pretty brisk pace all the way back to my car, holding my knife the entire time. Mine was still the only car in the lot when I returned, so I know there wasn't another person on the trail with me. I told my husband about what happened when I got home, but he really isn't one for the spooky, so despite that gut feeling I had, we agreed it was probably nothing, and I really didn't think of it much after that. About a year later, I came across an article detailing monster legends and cryptids from the area, and as I read, I was blown away by the description of wood devils, tall, slim creatures that lurk in the woods. They're said to have gray skin and hair, and they blend in with the surrounding trees by standing still. It is reported that they move quickly, darting from tree to tree. My skin crawled while I read a description that eerily matched my experience. I can't say for sure what I saw, but I know it was not my imagination. I still go hiking in that area. I feel like if that creature wanted to hurt me, it had more than enough opportunity that day, but it chose not to. In my opinion, I think maybe it was just curious, or maybe it recognized I wasn't a threat, or maybe I'm just dumb lucky. I can assure you that whenever I go out to hike, I always bring my knife and my dog with me, and I never stray from the trail. Werewolf Waits for Me From Anonymous It happened about 10 years ago, when I was 13. Hunting season had just started in central Missouri. My dad and I had left the house to go hunting, and he told me to watch and make sure our dog wasn't let back in the house and instead followed us when we left. I looked back as he asked, but as I did, I saw a dog-like figure run across the road from the field in front of our house. I didn't really think much about this though. We had a creek in our backyard, and we'd often see coyotes at it. Fast forward to that night. We didn't see any deer, so we had nothing to bring home. I went to sleep that day, disappointed as any country boy would do, after waiting all day in a deer stand without seeing any deer. At around 1.30 a.m., I woke up. Our dog was scratching at the back door. When I let him in, I saw his tail tucked between his legs, and I saw something else then, too. A dog-like creature at the tree line. It was the same shape and outline as the coyote that I saw earlier. But now I got a good look at it, thanks to the full moon. It was definitely the same size as what I saw that morning, but bizarrely enough, there was what looked to be torn up cloth on its body. It had black fur and piercing red eyes. I could feel it staring right into my soul. Then I watched it stand up on two legs before it howled. At an alarming speed, it turned around and ran away. I could have sworn when it got on top of our sledding hill, I saw it turn around again, look at me, and grin. After that night, I never saw it again, and I didn't share this experience with anyone. My parents were the type, after all, that always found a simple explanation for everything. I did see signs of it, though, like a scratch mark ten feet up a tree and a set of tracks that started on all fours and crossed a creek before continuing on two. Every now and then, I hear a howl, too. I want to say I was scared, but really I felt calm. It gave me a feeling like I knew it, that it wouldn't hurt me. Update. I've begun sharing this story around the campfire as a campfire story, so as to not sound crazy, and I would tell it in third person. Not long after that, I ended up finding out that my dad saw it too. He was working in the field late on a night with the full moon. He then saw this thing on a hill howling at the moon. This startled him as he was quite a ways away from our house. 
After that, our dog became an inside dog. Though I had a feeling the thing wouldn't have hurt him, as he wouldn't have hurt me. Then again, who can say for sure? Followed by a werewolf. From Peak. This story took place last year. I live in a small town near a national park. I've been there all my life, and probably won't be leaving anytime soon. The same can't be said for my friends, though, who went out into the big city when it was time for college. Now, I also went to college, but to a town not too far from where I live. It would take me about half an hour to get there by bus. Two of my friends, the ones who are involved with this story, went out to the capital city of my state and lived there in flats, since the ride there would take them more than four hours every day. I soon dropped out since the college life wasn't really for me, but my friends stayed. When they eventually had some free time for the holidays, about two to three weeks, one of them proposed the idea that we go camping, since we all haven't seen each other for quite some time. I'm not really an outdoors person, but I said why not, and I decided to join them. One of my friends, Mike, I was really close with. We used to hang out every day before he moved, and we always played video games together. With the other friend, however, Gabe, I wasn't really that close. I did know him from primary school, but I didn't really talk to him much. We would chat here and there when we were in a group chat or on Discord, but nothing outside of those interactions. Originally, there were supposed to be four of us, but one person declined, so it was just us three. Mike and Gabe were pretty good friends though, so I wasn't worried that it would get awkward on our trip. Anyway, we would be staying for three days on one of Gabe's family members' properties. The dude was rich, what can I say? After we were done preparing, we set off. The trip there would be long. We were driving from 1pm to 4pm, but we had a pretty good time. Those three hours flew by pretty fast. When we finally arrived, Gabe's uncle was there to greet us. He was the one who owned the property. The property was a big forest in which his uncle and his buddies would sometimes hunt. His uncle said the forest was pretty safe, that he had never encountered any dangerous animals when he was hunting. Now, how Gabe talked him into letting three 18-year-olds go there unsupervised, and how he thought that was a good idea, I don't know. But I wasn't complaining. His uncle then led us into the forest. We followed. We walked on a dirt path through the forest for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then we went off the trail to where our camping spot would be. However, a few minutes after we left the trail, I got this feeling like somebody was watching me. I just brushed it off. That is until I saw something moving out of the corner of my eye. It looked like something black was running through the forest, but since no one else seemed to have seen it, I didn't speak up. Probably just my imagination, I said to myself. After another few minutes of walking, we made it to a small clearing where we'd be camping. After the uncle showed us around the spot, he went back onto the trail and out of the forest. We began setting up our tents pretty soon after that, but that would prove to be quite a challenge, considering none of us had ever set them up before. Outside of me going camping a few times before with my family, this was basically everyone's first camping trip like this, and as a note, I had never set up a tent myself, that job had always fallen on my dad on our family trips. After we somehow managed to get everything set up, we ended up chatting and joking around for a while. That's when Mike said, Let's go and explore around the forest. I want to see what's out there. Yeah, but what if we get lost? I jokingly replied. It'll be fine. We won't go far. We can just go in one direction so we don't get lost if you want. Mike insisted. And so we started to explore, going deeper and deeper into the forest. It wasn't really all that special, everywhere we looked was just trees and bushes. After about ten minutes of walking in a straight line, we noticed that some of the trees had weird markings on them. Some had weird symbols carved into them, 
Others just had big scratch marks. We were all getting bad vibes from it, but Gabe said that there were probably some kind of hunter marks, since his uncle and his friends used to hunt around here. That put our minds to rest, even though deep down we all knew it probably wasn't the case. When we began walking back to our campsite, I got a strange feeling, that same feeling I felt when we went off the trail earlier with Gabe's uncle. I felt like I was being watched. I began to look around us, but the only thing I saw were trees and tall grass. We did later see a deer on our way back, which was kind of nice. After we arrived back at our campsite, we started building a campfire, as it was getting dark then. We took out our food supplies and beer and started to cook. While we were eating and enjoying ourselves, Mike suddenly stopped and hushed us. He then told us both to look where he was now pointing. Gabe and I turned our heads in the direction of his finger. We soon saw what he was pointing at. About 300 to 400 feet away, there was something behind a line of trees. We couldn't quite see what it was. The only thing we could see was the color. Black, similar to what I saw when we were walking with Gabe's uncle. After we stared at it for a while, the thing moved farther away and we could no longer make it out. What was that? Gabe asked. I don't know. Maybe it was your uncle? Mike answered back, trying to explain what we saw. Well, I think I saw the same thing when we were still with his uncle, so it probably wasn't him. Maybe it's some kind of deer, I added. Uh, do solid black deer even exist? Mike asked with a puzzled look on his face. How do we know it's not a wolf or a bear or something like that? The evening soon turned into us bickering about the thing we just saw, and the conversation ended on it being a black deer. Satisfied with that answer, Mike soon went to sleep, as it was already night and we were all exhausted from the car ride and the hike we had to do to get here. Gabe and I stayed awake for a while longer, but he too soon went to sleep. I couldn't really sleep, because I kept thinking about what we saw and about those weird markings on the trees. But soon enough, sleep got me too. After I don't know how long, I was awakened by a large thud near my tent. I zipped open my tent to see what it was, and I saw something terrifying. On the ground near our campfire lay a dismembered corpse of a deer with both front legs missing and a big chunk taken out of its neck. The stench was unbearable. Soon both Mike and Gabe woke up too, only to be met with the same sight. About 20 feet next to it, there was something else, something standing in the darkness. From what we could tell, it looked to be about 8 feet tall and had these shining eyes like animals do. We were all standing there in silence, in shock. None of us knew what that was or what just happened. After we locked eyes with this beast in the shadows, it let out the scariest, blood-curdling roar I've ever heard. We ditched all our stuff there and we started running in pure darkness, hoping to find the trail and to escape. After running for a good while, we finally found the exit out of the forest. We climbed into our car and drove off at the speed of light. As we were about to leave, I looked back into the woods. There, at the start of the trail, were two glowing green eyes looking back. I have no idea what that creature was, or what it wanted. It didn't want to kill us, since if it wanted to do that, it probably could have done so a number of times before we escaped. My best guess is that it just wanted us out of there. After the event, I heard from Mike that Gabe tried telling his uncle what happened, but he didn't believe him and blamed it on alcohol, even though we only drank one bottle each. Our lives return to normal, and we frequently talk about it. None of us know what it was, but one thing's for sure. We're never going camping there again. I 
I hate rest areas. From That Guy Chimera. In a previous story I told, I was a rookie trucker that ran into something in Duncannon, Pennsylvania. Well, fast forward about three years. My mom passed away. Rest in peace, mom. I ended up getting a dog to help me cope and to give me some company in my truck. It was a German Shepherd with puppy fuzz still growing. One day after finishing up my trip, it was late and all the truck stops were full, like usual, so it was either the shoulder off a ramp or a rest area. Knowing my new little co-driver would need a walk, I figured a rest area would be more suitable and safe. Luckily, I ran into a familiar stop, but it was a stop off of I-40 in Missouri, where I usually see a lot of state troopers at, but never for truckers, if you get what I'm saying. This time, it was relatively empty, just two trucks and one car, but no signs of life. However, the place did look a bit run down, pretty much just as I remembered it. I figured there wouldn't be time for some training like I usually did with my puppy to go over commands. My dog was still clumsy and too small to get out of the truck by himself, so I carried him and he was always excited to walk. I don't blame him, but this time, weirdly enough, he seemed hesitant. I had to encourage him to come out, but he kept looking around, looking over his shoulders like something was going to be there. It creeped me out enough that I checked over my shoulder too. At that moment, my back was facing the tree line and the building where the restrooms and state map were. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, so I hopped back in the truck to grab some protection, just in case, like every trucker should. Our walk together was normal in the beginning. I wandered about 20 feet or so from the tree line and my dog stopped sniffing and began to focus on something. The curious puppy tried to get closer when a branch snapped. Now I was focused too in the same direction. I took a step, pulling the leash slightly as more snapping sounds erupted from in front of us, but it didn't seem to be getting closer. As soon as I told my dog to come on, I then heard the most confusing animal sound I've ever heard. It started out sounding like a bear, and it faded into what I could assume was an elk. It didn't sound perfectly like one of those things, just similar to both. Thinking rationally, or logically, my first thought was that it was a bear taking down an elk at night. Great, my luck must be high, I thought. With my dog at my leg, scared, trying to stay cool, I grabbed my protection, getting ready for anything. I turned on my flashlight. I knew I couldn't outrun some forest critter, especially carrying a 25-pound scared puppy. As I shone my flashlight around, I saw what appeared to be an arm. Well, I thought, that's all I need to see. It was shaped like it was coming from some lanky but muscular guy, but stretched out a bit more. Its skin was black in places, and where there was fur, it was dark gray. Its bicep alone was at my eye level, six feet. There were a few scars here and there, showing that this thing had gotten in several encounters. I couldn't see the hand completely, but I could tell this thing could probably palm a medicine ball. At that point, I felt as if running away would be the dumbest idea. Plus, I didn't want to turn around and lose track of it, so I kept backing away, shuffling backwards slowly until I felt pavement under my feet again. My dog never left my leg. I felt him moving with me, so I kept the leash loose. Suddenly, the arm moved like the body was turning or adjusting for something, all the while I'm cussing under my breath, still trying to move backwards slowly. I then make it in front of the building, a good distance away from that thing, but I kept my light on it, making sure it didn't move. Then a car pulled in, forcing me to put away my protection, even though I thought about just taking the chance of looking crazy. I said to myself, go for the car. Don't run, just walk. Hopefully that thing won't come gunning for us. As I walked past the car, I noticed it was a man and a woman. The guy said he saw my protection drawn and asked if I was okay. 
All I said was a bear ran through the trees, so I told him to be careful in this rest area. The lady told me that they lived not too far from here. There was a look on her face, like she knew I was talking about something else. She told me it was probably best to stay in my truck and to protect that dog, because, quote unquote, it was too cute to lose. I did as she said, but that night I didn't get much sleep. My puppy would not leave my side either. The people I've told this story to never believe me. I don't care. I know I saw that thing's arm, and I heard it roar at some point. What I saw, what I heard, none of it registers as some recognizable animal or person. All I know is I hate rest areas now, and you can probably see why. The Garden Stalker from Silver Bullet 54. I have a friend named James who used to live in the Midwest, near the Kentucky-Tennessee border. He enjoyed it there a lot, but eventually decided to move after he had what he called an encounter like no other. He swears by his life that everything he recounted to me about it was true, and he wanted me to share this story with others. He never talks about it nowadays because it just sounds so strange. In 2017, he had just moved after getting a new job. He found a nice ranch house after searching for a long time. He found that the price was almost as much as an average rent and asked the realtor why it was so cheap. She told him, well, the previous owner was going on about some kind of creature. James laughed as he was a skeptic about these kinds of things Ghosts, fairies, elves, Nessie, Yeti, you name it. These were all just flights of fancy to him. He didn't believe her and told her as much. The woman shrugged and didn't say anything further. And as he stood there, he thought he heard a small giggle from behind him. When he turned, he saw nothing. He ended up getting the place and moved in as quickly as possible. After moving in was when the terror began. One morning, he walked outside and found a dead rabbit. That was normal until he saw just how it was killed, completely gutted like a fish. He didn't see an eye for anything and wondered how it had been killed like that so cleanly. He also saw a trail of blood leading to a garden he had in the backyard. This made him feel uneasy. Suddenly, he heard this weird laugh coming from the back of the property. He sprinted back inside and slammed the door. He peeked outside, seeing this odd creature that stood only about two feet tall in the backyard. He says it looked just like a gnome. He immediately called the realtor, demanding to know why she had not mentioned it. She said she had, and he didn't believe her. James was determined to stick it out for as long as he could, but this gnome had other ideas. Every night, the gnome would emerge and scratch on the wall, knock on the doors, tap on the windows, all while giving off that blood-chilling laugh. Every morning, he would leave, but return at night. This gnome also gutted deer, more rabbits, squirrels, and birds, leaving the gruesome evidence behind for James to find. Eventually, James saw him come out during the day. In fact, James always looked all around his property before he left to go somewhere, so that he wouldn't be ambushed. One day, he came back from a movie at a friend's house and saw the gnome watching from behind a tree, just waiting. He and the gnome just stared each other down, but then the gnome began to frolic through the garden while laughing. James had had enough. He quit his job and moved away. On the day he loaded his final possessions, he turned out of the driveway and was going down the road when the gnome ran right out onto the road. James slammed on the brakes and waited. The gnome glared at him, then smiled and ran off. I don't know if someone else owns that house now. James doesn't know, and he doesn't even care. He and I both have the same thought. Whether or not someone owns it is a moot point. We both know the one constant that that gnome is probably still there waiting and watching for a new owner to torment.
creature near a military outpost. From Peak. Before I begin, this is not my own personal story. This is a story my dad told me some time ago, and I'm now sharing it with all of you, as it recently came back to my mind. This happened in the early 90s. At the time, there was a war in my country, so my dad ended up in the military like everyone else his age. After his training, he was sent to some old military outpost in the middle of nowhere. The nearest form of civilization was a small village located 15 kilometers or 9.3 miles from where he was stationed. So yeah, it was literally in the middle of nowhere. He was stationed there with one other guy named Sam. Their only job was to be on lookout for enemy troops. But since the outpost was located so far from where the war was taking place, Sam and my dad didn't really have anything to do. They kind of just hung out playing card games, drinking cheap beer to keep themselves occupied. The outpost was small, and it overlooked a forest, with a metal fence surrounding the forest and ending at the outpost. The first few weeks went by, and everything was exactly the same as when they arrived, quiet and peaceful. Then one night, while they were overlooking the forest, something happened. They were talking like they normally did, not really paying attention to the forest, since the war was basically on the other side of the country. But something felt off. Both my dad and Sam got this weird, nauseating feeling. All of a sudden, they started feeling uncomfortable, like someone was watching them. They both stopped talking and were scanning the area. However, there was no one near them. How could there be? They were miles away from anyone, and they were the only people stationed at that outpost. A few minutes passed, and the feeling still didn't go away. Confused and frightened, they turned to the forest. That's when they finally saw it. In the woods, right in the middle of a clearing, the two of them laid eyes on something. My dad described it to me as a humanoid figure, about four or five feet tall, with both feathers and skin. He couldn't really tell what color it was because it was dark, but he said it seemed to be all black with glowing eyes, kind of like a cat's. It was staring right at the two of them. Sam and my dad didn't know what to do. They didn't know what they were looking at, so they just stared back at it. About five seconds later, after making eye contact with it, the creature made the most loud and horrific scream my dad had ever heard. He said it sounded like a mix of a cat hissing, a deer screaming, and a man yelling for his life, all at the same time. Scared out of their minds, they readied their guns and were prepared to shoot this creature. That's when it started running. My dad says it ran as fast as a cheetah, but luckily not at them. The creature started running straight for the big metal fence that was around the forest and the outpost. It made a giant hole in it and continued running, never to be seen again. Safe to say that neither my dad nor Sam got any sleep that night. They would be at that outpost for about a month altogether, and they say they never experienced something like that ever again. Sam and dad stayed close friends after the war, and Sam became a good family friend. Both he and my dad say the same story, never changing any details. They swear that what they saw was real. I can't really explain what that was, because in this part of the world, in Southeast Europe, there's nothing that even closely resembles what they saw, either from old folk tales or actual animals. The only thing I can think of is a skinwalker, but far as I know, they're only in America, so I really have no idea. What happened when taking a detour from Newly Uncle? I saw something I can't explain while driving to my sister after having her first baby. This is what happened. It was a Friday night, and I had just finished a bad week at work so I just wanted to sit on the couch and chill. My phone rang and I saw it was my mom. Hi, Angie's in the hospital. 
I cut my mom off thinking something was wrong with Angie, so I answered, Are she and the baby all right? After a loud sigh coming from the other end, my mom continued, If you'd let me finish, you would know that she's in labor right now, so it'd be nice if you could come to the hospital. Oh, okay, mom, just tell me which hospital and I'll come straight away. Right away she told me which hospital it was. Quickly I put on my jacket, got in my car, and started the 90-minute drive to the hospital. Luckily, it wasn't that busy on the road, but I did come across a detour sign, so I was forced to take a longer route. This route took me through a long country road. No tarmac to be seen for miles, but there were a few beautiful houses and trees. I drove for about 10 minutes on this country road when I heard what sounded like someone screaming. I stopped my car and I began to look around, trying to see where the scream came from. However, the sound was gone now. I got out of my car and walked towards the tree line. When I was about a foot away from the trees, the scream came again. I called out, Hello? Hello? Are you okay? Are you okay? Do you need help? Need help? And immediately the scream came again. I began to run in the direction of the scream until the scream was so loud that I stopped to look around. Still, I did not see anyone or anything making the noise. All I saw were trees and bushes. I wanted to walk back to my car when I heard a different sound. I would run. A voice and a terrifying message. Of course, I did exactly as it said, and I hightailed it back to my car. On my way back, I heard something following me, keeping pace with me. I grabbed my car keys, and when I saw my car in the distance, I pressed the unlock button. When I was at the car, immediately I opened the door, got in, and slammed the door shut, quickly locking it. I took a look at the tree line nearby, and I saw something standing between the trees, Glowing yellow eyes, rotting skin, bones that could be seen through that skin. The look of this creature sent chills down my spine, so I quickly started the car and floored it. The road was full of bumps, but I didn't care. All I wanted to do was to get away from that thing. After about half an hour, I finally hit tarmac again. I was so happy that I was on the highway. When I reached the hospital, my niece was born already, and of course I got to hold her. When it was time to go back home, I told my mom I'd like to spend the night at their place. I did not want to come across that thing again when driving home at night. The Gray Man in Wisconsin From Athletic Hunter 934 this encounter happened when I was younger. I was maybe around 10 at the time. I wasn't as athletic and in shape as I am now. The story starts when I was at my great-grandparents in southern Wisconsin during a family get-together. They live on the outside of a small town called Norwalk. On my great-grandparents' property is several acres of woods. And as some of you know, the forest is not a very safe-feeling place. Me, my brothers, and some of my cousins decided to walk around the woods on the property. As we were walking along a logging road, we pass a pile of tires. I start to get this weird feeling, and being a kid, I didn't say anything to the others. As we pass by this pile of tires, I turned around. I look over at the deer hunting box stand nearby, which was where I got my first deer a couple of years ago. And as I turn around... My brothers and cousins are gone. Confused, I walk up the hill, still on the logging road. I reach the top of the hill. I wanted to get a good view to see if I could find my siblings and cousins. As I turn back to face the way I came from, what I saw then still has me confused to this day. I saw a man walking along the trees next to a field about 40 yards away. The man or what I thought was a man, wore no clothes. His skin was a very light gray, almost white, and it appeared smooth, with no hair at all on his body. In fact, I didn't see any genitalia. It didn't seem to notice me at the time, 
It was just walking along those trees. But then it stopped and stood still for what felt like a few minutes. After getting more details about what I saw, I ran down the hill on the other side, and thankfully, I ended up running into my cousins and brothers, who were at the bottom of the hill. Being me, I didn't say anything to them. I'm now 17, turning 18 in September. And even now, walking through the woods when I go hunting gives me the same feeling I had that day. Transylvania Brigalici, from Opris Vlad. I live in Romania, more precisely, Cluj Napoca City, widely known for the Untold Music Festival. As you may know, this region, Transylvania, is popular for vampire myths and legends. Today, however, I want to present a different kind of native creature that may roam freely in the dark. As a child, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. They were living in a village not far from my city. In the daytime, I was helping them at the farm, but the most exciting time for me was the nighttime story time. Because, after dark, my cousins and I would gather around Grandma. She had plenty of stories to share. Most of them were scary, though. Maybe she wanted to scare us to keep us from going outside at night. Who knows? Maybe out there, there are really some scary night creatures. Now, one story that remained in my mind and still sends chills down my spine is about a Pricolici. Some say that a Pricolici is a mix of a vampire and a werewolf, with a better resemblance of the latter. My grandma described him as a bipedal wolf, with glowing eyes and the capability to talk. Allow me to share with you her allegedly true story. This happened in my grandma's youth. She was at the village school, together with her best friend, Sava. They both had been punished for not doing their homework, so they had to kneel down on corn seeds and stay after school hours until their homework was done. Kneeling down in corn seeds is a very painful experience, but that was a long time ago. Honestly, I'm surprised there was even a school in the village at the time. Anyway, it was late November, so the sun was setting fast. After the two of them finished their work, they both decided to go home together to Sava's house and spend the night there. Sava's house was located at the border of the village. You had to pass through a small forest to get there. That night, it was nearly a full moon, and the wind was blowing gently with the smell of rotten meat. At a certain point, my grandma felt as if someone was watching them. Suddenly, they both heard this evil laugh from the trees above them. They panicked and clung to each other. From a tree branch, a humanoid black shape emerged from the dark. It had yellow glowing eyes, and its head resembled a rabid wolf. But the scariest part was its continuous evil laugh, as if the creature was mocking them and it knew they were going to die. What do you want? Leave us alone, my grandma screamed. I will devour your souls and bathe in your blood, the creature responded with a demonic voice. They started to run, the creature pursuing them closely, jumping from tree to tree. Its shadow was projected to the ground by the pale light of the moon, so my grandma knew when to avoid its grasp. Fortunately, they were not too far from the nearest house. They started knocking at the door when they arrived at it, begging for someone to open up. An old man and his wife let them inside. The beast continued to laugh at them, saying that it would devour their flesh. The woman prayed to the Lord with them, and the old man rubbed the doors and the windows with holy incense. He also put crosses at every door handle. That night, Nobody in the house could close their eyes to sleep. The old man told the girls that the creature was a Brigalici, an undead spirit that comes to torture the living. The following day, the old man went to church, and together with the village's priest, they formed a mob. They had torches and sickles. One of them told the rest that the creature was hiding during the day in an abandoned barn. Once they got there, the beast was sleeping in the hay. 
there was a smell of rotten meat and animal bones. A village man poked the belly of the creature, and it screamed out in pain. It soon found it was vastly outnumbered. He cursed them all and promised it would be back for revenge one day. With a strong jump, it broke the barn roof and disappeared. Ever since then, no one has ever seen anything suspicious, not even the people from the nearby villages. I was thinking about this particular story because I'm back in my grandparents' village, walking in the cemetery near the woods. I brought some flowers to show respect for my grandma's tombstone, and I tried to remember all the good moments we spent together. And suddenly, out of nowhere, I smelled the scent of death nearby, and I swear I heard this evil laughter. Something in my backyard from Haunted, Texas. I've always lived near the forested areas of Texas. Our backyard is just a fence and behind it, there is a huge, almost endless forest. I pretty much grew up running around that forest. I could never have imagined the terrible things that reside there. I was about 12 years old when this event happened. My mother had left to go shopping my dad was at work, which left me at home with my sister. I'd been making dinner while my sister sat in the living room, watching the princess and the frog. I'd made a pot of mac and cheese. After I finished up in the kitchen, my sister and I sat on the couch watching the movie. It was on that scene where they turn into frogs. My sister was laughing when we suddenly heard an odd scratching sound. It sounded like it was coming from the backyard, where the woods were. It was odd but I just thought it could have been a coyote. I've never been so wrong. The scratching continued for another five minutes when I suddenly heard a voice, an odd raspy voice like one coming out of a radio. It sounded near perfectly like my mother. Children, let me in. It said in this sickening sing-song voice. I froze. Why would my mother come in through the backyard? Why not through the garage like usual? I led my sister away from the door as the scratching continued. I set my sister in a closet and I told her not to open the door until I told her to. As I closed the closet door, the backyard door had begun violently shaking. Whatever it was outside had begun screeching too, sounding like a mix of a human and a coyote. When it all at once stopped, the silence was deafening, almost sickening too. Suddenly, the realization hit me. A small tap was coming from behind me where the front windows were. I regret ever turning around, because there stood this thing. Its limbs were twisted. It had joints in all the wrong places. It looked almost like a deer and a wolf mixed. It had rotting skin, and I could almost make out a smile. I felt tears streaming down my face as I heard it laugh, a laugh coming from this thing. Rage and hatred towards this thing rose up in me. It was terrorizing me and my sister, who I could now hear weeping from the closet. But then I suddenly heard the sound of the garage doors opening. My mom was finally home. When I looked back to the window, the thing was gone. My mother walked in. She saw me crying and quickly ran over to comfort me. We went to get my sister out of the closet. I was just glad she didn't have to see that disgusting creature like I did. We told my mother what had happened. She passed it off as us having overactive imaginations, saying it was just a dog or coyote. But I knew it wasn't that. But what it really was, I don't know at all. Later that night, there was a constant tapping on my window all night long. That was the last I ever saw of it. I hope it was the final time I encounter it. The Shadows from Mr. J Me and two of my other friends, Edwin and Conrad, really loved the woods. We'd bike over to the gate that led into the woods. Edwin, Conrad, and I had a certain spot we really liked to go to. 
We were told that there were coyotes that came out after 5, and we were at the spot that we loved at 5.30. The area we liked to go to was a nice place, with a few shallow pits and several little leaf piles. About 15 yards away from that, there is a clearing. The clearing will be a major part to the story. The icing on the cake there was the two-floor fort. There were even ladders set up. At around 5.45 that day, Edwin and Conrad started panicking. They began pointing to the clearing, and when I looked, in the middle of it, I saw two large shapes. Both looked kind of like coyotes, but they were much too large. I looked away for a split second, and they'd vanished. Some kind of primal instinct most likely caused by the horrid dread from seeing the shadow coyote things welled up in me. Conrad, Edwin, and I scrambled up the ladders of the fort and sat there for a few moments before Edwin proposed that he and Conrad would fight it off. Being the smallest of the group, I was also the easiest target. So, the two larger guys wanting to help protect me, I felt honored and terrified at the same time. Then that terror turned to cold, primal, inhuman fear. I was horrified. Conrad had heard something towards the other side of the woods. The three of us formed a circle, each of us on a different side. We scanned the woods and after a few moments of silence, we bolted, jumping the fence into Conrad's yard, which, to much convenience, we were just a bit behind. The two boys bolted, leaving me in the dust. They ran and beckoned me aggressively, telling me to run too. I listened, adrenaline pounding in my ears. We never ever returned to our fort again in fear of those shadow things. I thought it was a dog. From C. Philly 100 I was driving home from work one night on a dirt road in rural California outside of Santa Cruz when I spotted a dog, or what I thought was a dog, running along the side of the road. It was running away from me, so I couldn't really see its face at first. But when I pulled up alongside it, it looked at me, and that's when I got the shock of my life. The face of this animal looked like a human, although its eyes were reflecting the light, giving the creature a somewhat rather animalistic appearance. The more I looked, the more I realized that this was actually a person wearing some kind of light gray homemade animal fur outfit and running awkwardly on all fours, like how a child pretending to be a dog might do. The person had a skull on top of their head that might have been a dog or coyote, with more fur on top of that. I say a person because I couldn't really tell if it was male or female. Their body was mostly covered in fur and their face was painted white and red. It wasn't a very large person, though, as it really did look like a dog at first. After it saw me, it stood up and started slowly walking towards the car. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't move. I felt as if I was under some kind of mind control or something. I couldn't take my eyes off this person. Steadily, they approached my car, one foot in front of the other with their arms down at their side. Then they smiled at me and I saw that their teeth appeared to have been sharpened down to triangular points. That's when the reality of the situation finally hit me, and I watched with horror as this person reached into their furs, producing a 12-inch kitchen knife. I hit the gas and went bumping down the road, but when I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw that this person was chasing me, and not only that, they were easily keeping pace. I was probably only about 100 yards or so from my driveway when I crashed into a ditch on the side of the road. I looked in the rear view again, but I could no longer see this person. I threw the door open and didn't even bother closing it. I just started running as fast as my legs could carry me, all the way down my driveway and into the geodesic canvas dome tent where I was living at the time. The tent had one clear plastic window that I immediately covered before starting a fire in the stove and grabbing a wooden baseball bat that I had by the door. I could hear something outside the tent, walking around, dragging what I assumed to be that knife along the side of my tent. Suddenly, the knife began stabbing into the canvas fabric. I screamed and hit the exposed blade with my baseball bat. 
The blade withdrew, leaving a small hole in the tent. I waited a minute before throwing a shirt up over the hole. The dragging sound continued, and it was all I could do not to lose my crap, so to speak. There was no cell service out there, so all I could do was keep the fire alive until I ran out of wood, probably around two in the morning. By then, I could no longer hear any activity outside, but I dared not fall asleep. I must have dozed off at some point, however, because I awoke to the sound of birds chirping outside. I walked out cautiously and looked down to see a heaping pile of fresh human excrement on the ground. I walked around and inspected the puncture in the side wall of the tent. Sure enough, there were two or three small holes in the wall. There were some bare footprints in the ground, but it was so muddy, it was difficult to decipher much. I tell you what, though. I got dang near an entire truckload of salt to pour all around the tent, as well as up and down the driveway, and sprinkle throughout the woods as well, just for good measure. I don't know if it was the salt or just good luck, but I never did see that person again. It Ate Our Cows From Aberdeen I live on a small farm next to Glacier National Park. It's nothing expansive, just a little old place my grandparents built that my family continues to live on. We raise chickens here, some pigs too, and we used to have cows. That brings me to my strange story. There's a reason we don't have cows anymore. Something killed them. Back at the start of 2008, we had three cows named Jess, Sheila, and Marnie. We had planned to use them for milk, but they ended up mostly being big old pets that kept the grass short and clear of weeds. As spring started up that year, something strange began to happen. Back then, every night, I had to go outside right after dinner to make sure the cows were locked up in the barn. There are coyotes out here, and they've taken a chicken or two, and we didn't want to give them a chance at nipping at the cow's legs and causing permanent damage. I headed outside that night, beginning to pull Marnie inside the barn, then Jess. As I went out to retrieve Sheila, I heard this bizarre rumbling moan from the tree line, which set maybe 50 yards from the barn. I couldn't tell how deep in the woods the moan had come, but it didn't sound right. It wasn't like the scream or moan of a person or any animal I'd ever heard. It sounded so alien to me. It gave me goosebumps, and immediately I wanted to go back inside. But I knew my parents would be mad if I went inside without fetching Sheila first. I sighed, gritted my teeth, and walked towards the old girl. She was standing at the edge of the fence, maybe ten yards from the tree line, which was on the other side of that fence. The fact I had to walk closer to that forest to go get her really spooked me. The closer I walked to it, the more creeped out I got. I jogged over, just trying to get this over with. When I got to Sheila, I clicked the rope leash to her collar and tugged on her to get her to follow me. But she wouldn't budge. What's wrong with you? I said, and I tugged again. Still wouldn't budge. But she did let out a grunt. I'd never heard her do that before. I walked over and looked around her to make sure she hadn't hurt herself. When I checked her front legs, I nearly screamed. There was something wrapped around her leg. It shimmered in the moonlight as if it was covered in some thick slime, and it pulsated every other second. It was curled all the way up her leg, nearly to her ribs. I remember thinking, what in the world is that? My first thought was some kind of worm, snake, or leech had latched itself onto Sheila. First things first, I grabbed a stick to poke at it. I was not about to touch that thing with my bare finger. The moment I poked it, something crazy happened. In the blink of an eye, the thing slithered off of Sheila's leg and rapidly retracted in the direction of the forest. And I mean it when I say retracted. The thing was so long that this was only one end of it, and the other end seemed to still be in the nearby woods. I watched it pull away, pushing the grass to the side as it did, until this end of it disappeared into the tree line. 
Do snakes and worms and leeches slither backwards when running away? Surely not. This was something else, and I had no clue what that something else even was. I quickly pulled on Sheila, who now followed my lead with a bit of a limp. As we got closer to the light on the barn, I took a look at her leg. The fur and skin along her leg was all shredded up exactly where that creature had been latched onto her. I tied her to a post in the light and ran inside, fetching my mom and dad. My little brother came along too, morbidly curious as to what was wrong with the cow. I pointed at Sheila's leg and explained, she was standing at the edge of the fence out there by the woods. I tried to bring her to the barn, but this long, worm-looking thing was wrapped on her leg. My dad was bewildered. My story sounded crazy, but the wound was there to prove it. A worm, huh? That big, that could do that to a cow? Not sure about that. I think maybe the poor girl got caught in some wire or bramble. Got twisted on her leg. Dad, it was a living thing. I poked it with a stick and it yanked itself clean off. He raised up and scratched his head. Well, I trust you saw something on that poor thing. Never seen anything like it, to be honest. We bandaged up her leg and left her cozy in the barn, making sure to lock it up nice. Come morning before school, I ran outside to let the cows out as was also my responsibility. I was worried about Sheila all night, and I wanted to see if she was doing any better. The moment I opened the front door and looked out at the barn, my heart sank. The barn doors were wide open. That couldn't be right. My dad was with me when we locked it up the night before. We couldn't have both been that absent-minded. I ran over to the barn doors and checked the locks. Sure enough, the chain was just dangling from the handle of the barn door on one side, and the padlock was on the ground, now open. I picked up the padlock. The moment I touched it, I was met with a slimy substance. Ew, I said. The padlock was busted. I couldn't get it to click back down. If I had to guess, it looked like someone had managed to literally yank the padlock open. But why was it so slimy? It wasn't long before I noticed the grass laid back in a wide trail, leading up to the same edge of fence Sheila had been standing at the night before. No way, I said under my breath. I began to follow the trail before catching myself mid-step. First, I needed to check on Sheila. I turned on the lights inside the barn. Jess and Marnie were fine, but Sheila was gone. A trail of hay led up to the door as if she'd been dragged away but there was no blood on the ground. Did a person do this? I followed the trail in the grass then, all the way up to the edge of the fence. I gasped when I saw it. The wooden fence had been broken in one spot, making room enough for something as big as Sheila to fit through. But near one of the posts was a leg, a cow's leg with a smooth curling wound around it from top to bottom. I looked past the fence. The grass was laid back all the way to the woods. I ran to get my dad. I showed him what I'd found, and I heard him curse under his breath when he saw Sheila's leg near the fence. I was crying quietly then, knowing that we probably would not find Sheila alive. Dad sent me off to school in a hurry that day, telling me not to worry about it. As my mom, brother, and I drove away to school, I saw him head into the woods with a rifle and a flashlight. That day at school was slow and worrisome. I couldn't stop thinking about Sheila and my dad. I was beginning to think that that dang slimy thing had come back and dragged Sheila out of the barn. I mean, what else could explain that slimy lock? I just wanted to get home. That afternoon back at home, I found my dad at the kitchen table drinking a coffee. It was never a good sign to see my dad drinking an afternoon coffee. He always kept his coffee to the early morning to keep him awake. If he was drinking it late, it meant he wanted to be wide awake for some time, and it was already 4 p.m. Did you find her? I asked. Yep, I'll tell you, but don't tell your brother. Mom already knows. 
I nodded. She's dead, hun. Found her about half a mile into those woods. She got dragged pretty far by something before it ate up nearly half of her. I was sad, but I sort of knew that the news wouldn't be good. That's probably why my next question was an odd one. Was there some slimy stuff on her? He looked surprised at first, then he sighed. Sure was. I don't know what it was that got her, and it's best you don't think about it either. I ain't gonna let nothing get you or your brother or your mama. He tried to reassure me, but I wasn't feeling any better about the situation. In the matter of two weeks after that, Jess and Marnie would both be dragged away from the fields and into those very same woods the exact same way, each of them partially eaten when we found them. I was very upset about this, and we ended up putting a lot of time and energy into keeping the pigs and chickens we had safe too. But nothing ever came for them. Dad thinks whatever was out there moved on after eating the cows, but he was never too keen on getting more cows in case he was wrong. That was a long time ago, a very odd and very unsettling memory for me to dig up. I wish I knew what it was. I think that's the worst part, to have seen something that strange, that dangerous, and to never have confirmation of what it was, and yet I still live here. Seeing something eat my cows, I had nightmares for a while that my family might be next. I still have those nightmares on occasion. Maybe it's still out there somewhere. Maybe there's more of whatever it is. I've always thought that the slimy worm thing was just an appendage of a much larger creature. I guess I should be happy I never saw the rest of it. I hit the dog man from O Montana. I was never a firm believer in the paranormal but I've always loved listening to people's strange encounters. After this, I can no longer doubt my belief in things that can't be explained. This is my bone-chilling experience. This story happened in 2020 during the pandemic. As everyone knows, the world shut down and everyone and everything went on lockdown. As for me, I got a lot of time to practice what I love, and that is baseball. I live in Montana around Glacier National Park. I was 17 at the time, and to put it into perspective, I'm 6 foot 4 and have a good build, but I'm a gentle giant, and I get paranoid rather easily. I know, right? Big guy that gets scared. That's me. Now, I have a huge backyard and 78 acres of dense forest. In those acres, there's a shooting range, some ATV trails, and a small creek. I'm not a stranger to being outside and exploring the woods. One day, while at around four-ish, I was out riding my ATV on one of the trails we'd made. Suddenly, I saw something dart from the corner of my eye as I turned around a bend. I slowed my ATV down, and I looked in the direction that I saw the movement. I then noticed the only sound I heard was my ATV. So, me being a curious fellow... I turned off my ATV and listened. It was dead silent out there. I swear, even the forest itself was on mute. That's when I heard it. Footsteps crunching leaves and sticks. These were slow and heavy footsteps. I could tell it was deliberately trying to be quiet. Then, no later than five seconds after I turned off the ATV, the footsteps stopped. Growing up outdoors and in the woods, when it goes dead silent like that, when not even the bugs are heard, that means something dangerous is on the prowl. My mind began to race as I realized there was a predator around here somewhere and that I needed to leave. After all, there are bears in my area and we've seen plenty of them on our property. I was not in the mood at the time to deal with one. Right as I was about to turn the key to my ATV and start it up, I heard a singular tongue click sound. As if whatever it was, was trying to get my attention. 
Heck no, I muttered as I turned the key and sped away from there as fast as the ATV could go. But sadly, that was only the beginning of my experience. I sped home and ran straight inside, telling my mom who was cooking dinner at the time. She paused and looked at me with the most confused look on her face. I knew she didn't believe me, but I asked what it could have been. There was no way a bear made that tongue-clicking sound and walked on what sounded like two feet. My mom brushed it off, saying maybe it was just my imagination, or maybe it was an exhaust pop from the ATV. Yeah, I guess, maybe, I said, even though I knew that was not an exhaust pop. A couple of days later, I stopped thinking about the entire thing. A few weeks went by without any problems until one day, while I was outside with my German shepherd, Rusty, playing some baseball with him around dusk, I hit a baseball into the woods and he went to fetch it to bring it back to me. However, he stopped dead in his tracks and began to stare into the woods. I saw his ears starting to twitch. I was confused at this sudden behavior, so I called his name about four times, but he didn't budge. He stood there, still, staring at something in the forest. Then, here's where it gets crazy. He suddenly backed up, real slow, and starts to growl, baring his teeth and snarling and barking and just going straight up berserk. He's a family dog that has been with us for many years, and not once has he ever acted like this. My mind was in a panic, because I'm like, oh crap, he just teed off something, possibly a bear. I start to run over to him, making really loud noises to see if I could scare off this bear or whatever it was. That's when it jumps out at Rusty. I must have been 30 feet from Rusty at this point, and I was dumbfounded, horrified. The creature that jumped out was like another German shepherd, but twice his size. It had dark brown fur, it had the head of a German shepherd, but its eyes were bloodshot and they were glaring at me. Its legs were all bent backward. It had human hands with claws that looked like daggers. It stood about six feet tall and it seemed extremely skinny, as if it was malnourished. Instantly I knew from the stories I had heard that this was a dogman or werewolf. It completely turned its attention from Rusty to me and started to growl slowly creeping towards me. My heart hit rock bottom. My whole body just went numb. My instincts screamed at me to run, and I suddenly had the biggest adrenaline boost ever. But I was not about to let my dog get absolutely shredded to pieces. I've heard about the damage they can do to deer and animals. It charged at me then, snarling and covering 15 feet in what seemed to be only two steps this beast was filled with such rage and hatred. Desperate and in a panic, I swung the metal bat I still had in my hand as hard as I possibly could. It connected with the thing's face. When I hit that dogman or werewolf thing, I knew I'd racked up something in its head. I heard a loud clink as it staggered backward and almost fell completely over. Then Rusty went for it biting at its arm as it let out a small howl. With a quick and powerful smack, Rusty was sent flying several feet in the opposite direction. My heart pounded, seeing Rusty on the ground. I felt scared, but also angry now. I swung the bat again, connecting once more, but leaving a noticeable dent in the bat. I swung again, and this time I swear I dislocated the thing's jaw. It tried to snarl at me again but this time a weird sound came out of its mouth. The best way I can describe it was a drunk growl. It even seemed surprised that it sounded different. It paused and had a humanoid look of confusion on its face as it shook its head, realizing the damage. Then its bloodshot eyes stared right into my soul and I saw the rage only build up more inside of it. I knew my metal bat would not be a match for it anymore. I raised it up again to swing, but thank the heavens above there was a gunshot. The beast was hit by a 30 caliber round from my dad's custom hunting rifle. 
I snapped my head back toward the house to see my mother with the rifle in her hands, aiming another round as she screamed to get back. She fired again, hitting the creature in its leg. It howled a painful, forced howl as it turned around and ran back into the forest. I sprinted over to Rusty, picking up the huge dog and running back to the house with my mother scanning the tree line. As she did, she backed up into the house with me. We got inside and locked all the doors and windows. She runs up to me, hugging and kissing my face, praising the Lord I was okay. She admitted she saw the whole thing, then ran and grabbed my dad's rifle out of the gun safe. She then ran outside, just in time to shoot it. She turned to Rusty and told me to examine him while she kept watching the tree line. She had the gun at the ready. Rusty had no major injuries, thank goodness. There was a cut on his shoulder and that was about it. We called the police and told them about everything that happened. I broke down, letting all my emotions flow freely, and to our surprise, they explained they'd been getting calls about this weird dog that had been running around town lately. We called my dad and explained the whole thing. He ended up leaving work early to come home. To be safe, we stayed at a relative's place for a while, and we ended up selling that house which was honestly quite sad, but maybe it was the right thing to do. Due to the experience, we moved closer to town. I'm now positive that things exist that we don't fully understand. So, everyone listening, please be careful if you live next to the woods. There are things in there that are not bears, and they will not hesitate to end you. Tree People From EMFH About a year ago, in Great Falls, Montana, I was living in a camper with my boyfriend at the time, Chris, and my friend, T. One late night, it was freezing cold in the middle of winter. None of us could sleep, and all our phones were dead. The camper had no power, so Chris and I decided we were going to go to the bank, just right down the street from where the RV was parked, because they had some posts with outlets in them. When we got there, we plugged in our phones. As my phone was charging, we heard a really weird noise. I began looking around. There was this tree nearby that was about three feet away from us. Standing in the middle of this tree was a woman. She was motionless and just staring at me. I freaked out, turning and whispering to Chris. Do you see that woman? He looked around for a moment, then replied, uh, What woman? I don't see anyone. I froze for a second, then looked back at the tree. That woman was still there. Trying to take my eyes off of her, I looked up, and to my surprise, I saw two branches. The left side had six babies, and the right side had six kids. I started to look around more, and I saw 16 more of these things, all in the distance, just staring at me from the trees. I looked over at a bench under a tree at the entrance of the bank, and I saw an elderly couple. I could tell they were the same kind of people. Once I saw them, I began hearing voices, but they were in different languages. I hurried to my phone and turned it on, Using Google Translate, I repeated what was said. It seemed to be random things, or perhaps they were telling me a story. After looking up for my Google Translate, I looked around and they had all disappeared. I told Chris that we need to leave. As we were grabbing our things, getting ready to head back, I heard the talking again. I tried putting it in Google Translate as well. Google Translate came back with, Scene 2. I looked up again, seeing the old people and the woman. I began to yell back, You're not real. You're just in my head. Go away. The moment I said that, I saw the woman's mouth curl into a smile, showing the whitest teeth I'd ever seen. I told Chris to hurry. We grabbed everything, all while that thing just smiled at me. I was not sticking around. The two of us began running off, 
and I heard them say something else. My phone didn't have service, so I had to wait to get back to Wi-Fi to put it on my phone. I kept repeating what I'd heard under my breath so I wouldn't forget it. As soon as I was back, I put it into Google Translate. It said run. When the woman smiles, you're in danger. I was freaked out, but tried to stop thinking about it. As the night went on, I kept having this strange feeling like someone was watching me. It seemed to be coming from the window. I looked through it. I saw that old couple on the bench across the street. They'd followed me back. I began to cry, but after a while I calmed down. I looked outside again, and they'd disappeared. I never saw them again. To this day I won't go back to that bank at night. That was the weirdest and creepiest thing I've ever experienced. Hunted by a Werewolf From Eli A. I've never felt like I was enough. It's the same story you've probably heard from so many others before me. When I was presented with what I wanted to do with my life versus what I should probably do with my life, I decided to go the route of joining the rat race because it meant food on the table and the slim chance of having enough income to fund what I really wanted to do. Too bad there's absolutely no sculpting work in Cheyenne, Colorado, which is where I'm from. Being enrolled at the Laramie Community College with an accounting major certainly isn't something that's filling the missing part of myself that seems to keep growing every day. Neither is being stuck driving for Uber to pay for it all. Knowing that money could go towards materials, a promoter, or fees to have my work featured at expos over in Denver, but is instead going towards tuition, books, and whatever new software program my professors make us buy, which are only ever used for one semester and never touched again, it kills me inside. Especially if it means dealing with all the nonsense I face every day at work. Whether it's rude customers, unprompted one-star ratings, or people leaving garbage in my car. I question why I decided to make driving strangers my means for getting through college in the first place. For every pleasant conversation or good joke, I get about 30 of the aforementioned instances and then some. One night, no matter how much z I took, it was impossible for me to sleep. I guess I once again threw myself into another one of my existential spirals, where I began to ask myself over and over if I would ever be where I wanted to be in life. I know we've all had those moments, but mine seem to get uglier and uglier the older I get. For those of you who don't know, when you drive for Uber, you're given the option of participating in a promotion each week. For instance, if you make 50 trips, you're given 200 bucks, or if you drive 70 trips, you make 300 bucks, and so on. That night as I lay awake in bed, knowing I was only a good five trips away from making an extra 350 bucks, I figured I could get up, get those rides in, and maybe even take a few days off. Lord knows waking up at 4 a.m. every morning makes you appreciate those on a level you never had before. With that, I grabbed my keys and headed out to work. Fast forward three and a half hours later. I was in the middle of taking my last customer of the night to his mountainside cabin, having picked him up from Denver. On one hand, I hated these trips because they always took you far out and away from literally everywhere else. On the other hand, they were always a guaranteed hefty fare. Plus, usually, there was a darn good tip. If only I had half the dough these cabin owners had. Plus, they were great for turning your brain off and enjoying the drive, since you wouldn't be on the busy city streets. But tonight, that meant another existential crisis in the form of picturing everyone from high school being in better places than me, actually having moved on and out of Cheyenne. Thank God the trip was almost over so I could try and blast some music to drown out my thoughts. I dropped off my customer, who generously gave me a $30 cash tip. Upon receiving it, I had to promise myself not to blow half of it on lotto tickets again. I said goodnight and put in the directions back home. That Zeke will may have kicked in later than it should have, and it may have been 3 in the morning but at least I made my promotion and I had a tank's worth of gas money in my pocket. I looked out the window at the full moon, then below at the city lights in the distance and at the miles of woods that surrounded me. I thought to myself if I had to be stuck in some backwoods town with a four-digit population, at least it's one as gorgeous as this. Driving down a mountain when your eyelids feel like they're a hundred pounds each 
It's a position you don't want to find yourself in, unless you want to unintentionally give in to that urge to jump when you're standing on the edge of a cliff. But a roll of the window is always just the trick for me. I look down for literally one second to find the window switch, and crash. I screamed from the sudden noise and the simultaneous thud. I saw a large mass roll away from the front of my car at immeasurable speed, stopping in the middle of the road. I took a second to collect myself. At that moment, I thanked my lucky stars that I had full coverage on my car. After taking a second to breathe, I came to the realization that whatever I hit was probably dead, judging from its lack of movement. Figuring leaving a dead deer in the middle of a downward mountain road could mean life or death for a different driver, I got out of the car to drag it off the road. After briefly analyzing the damage to my bumper and hood, I turned to move the deer to the side of the road. At about 30 feet away, I thought to myself, good thing I'm moving this guy, I can barely see it from here. As I walked, I took notice of something. This deer looked to have black fur. Nothing unheard of, I thought, nothing I'd ever personally seen before, but surely it wasn't an impossibility. At 20 feet away, I began to understand that this was not a deer. This animal was absolutely massive. Judging it from that distance, all splayed out on the ground as it was, it could easily clock in at seven or eight feet in length. Is it a grizzly bear? I wondered to myself. A really dark furred grizzly bear. That had to be what I hit. I've never once heard of a grizzly bear encounter in Colorado. Ten feet away, I could see scraggly fur and pointed ears. This wasn't a bear either. So what the heck did I hit? Then I saw it move. I stopped. This creature got up as if from waking up from a long nap, showing no physical evidence of getting hit by a 2,000 pound vehicle at 30 miles an hour. It stood up on its hind legs and faced me. I know I'm not crazy. The full moon was out on a cloudless night. This was not a case of me seeing things. What stared me down was eight feet tall with blood red eyes and teeth and claws that would put a grizzly bear's to shame. My heart felt as if it stopped. We both just stood there, frozen in time. Then it hit me. There's no way, no way in the world I was looking at what I thought I was looking at. If what I was thinking was true, I began to wonder how we were treating these things as mere legends all this time. I refused to believe that what I was looking at was actually there. But that didn't change the fact that it was. There were so many unnatural things about this creature from standing on paws like a wolf, but wielding arms like a man. But above all else, the beast looked so demonic. The crazed look in its beady eyes and the way it snarled, with a twisted face, an expression of such malice, it just made it seem like something someone would only see in hell itself. I instinctively uttered, Jesus Christ. Christ. The beast instinctively blinked. I foolishly wondered if, perhaps like with demonic possession, the uttering of Jesus' name would be enough to ward off the creature. Just above a whisper, I say, Jesus, again. I had visualized what would happen so easily. It would grimace, shake its head, then just run off into the woods. But I was dead wrong. Instead, I swear that thing smiled at me. The most hideous and deranged smile I've ever seen or ever will see as if it was amused by the name. Slowly, I took a step back, keeping eye contact. I'd recalled this from my time spent at summer camp when I was a kid. Keep eye contact and don't break into a run and panic. The creature mirrored my actions, taking a step towards me. I took two steps back. It took two steps forward. Then I got an idea. I took a step to the side and two steps back, but the creature just took two steps forward drool dripping from its fangs. Then I gathered the courage and took one step forward, and the creature didn't move. Then I turned and sprinted to the car, hearing massive footsteps sprinting behind me. What happened next only took maybe three seconds to transpire, but it felt as if an eternity passed. As I was twenty feet away from the car, its steps were loud and powerful. I could feel the earth shaking beneath its feet. At ten feet away, 
The power in its step was cut in half, but its speed had tripled as I heard it drop from two legs to four. Five feet away, I stick my arm out to close the car door, which thank God I left it open. I could feel hot breath on the back of my neck. I forced myself to ignore the sense of smell with the strong stench of carrion protruding from behind its teeth. I jumped into my car, slamming the door shut and locking it. But the beast was so close to me, I slammed its muzzle before closing the door. And it didn't like that. Not one bit. I only realized the true terror of what happened next later on. The creature trying to open my door with the handle. The fact that I was facing a creature with such strength, speed, and senses, now paired with the sentience of a man, would later make my blood run cold. It punched its massive clawed fist through the window, breaking it. I shifted into drive and floored the gas pedal, almost causing my transmission to slip. I screeched away from the creature, more shaken up than I've ever been my entire life. I've had to hide in my cellar from tornadoes when I was a kid, and I've had a close encounter with a child predator, but nothing has left my core as brittle as this. As I sped away, I thought I was safe, but I was dead wrong. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw two glowing red eyes following me. This monster was still chasing me. On all fours, it had no problem keeping up. I pressed harder on the gas, going 60 now. I flashed back to hearing about a classmate in high school who died in a crash after going 50 on a downward mountainside road. The beast went from directly behind my car to right next to me. I was going 70 then. I sped up to 80 and it still showed no difficulty keeping up with me. It was so close to me now, with no glass window any longer to offer even the most pathetic and ineffective barrier between me and it. I saw those red eyes up close. I'm not sure if it was anger, hatred, or hunger that was behind those eyes, but whatever it was, I was sure it was evil. I knew I had to focus on the road. Going down a mountainside at 80 miles per hour was practically guaranteed death, so I knew I needed to focus. I was cautious and crept up to 90, but the beast kept up. Granted, it looked like it was taking an effort to do so, but nothing that wasn't doable for this monster. The trees and the rocks were flying past me then. I swear if I had let this monster startle me in any way and have my arms twitch in reaction, I would have flown off the edge of that mountain. The road began to curve to the left. I had to slow down. If I didn't, I would certainly die. I had no choice but to push down on the brake. The beast caught up again and began to snap its jaws through the window, its viscous drool flying into my face with each chomp. Then, a miracle. Before I had time to even mentally process that it was there, an 18-wheel semi-truck appeared. It was passing through the oncoming lane, previously hidden by the curve of the mountainside. The beast noticed and moved away as much as it could, but we were both going so fast it could only go so far. It slowed down and moved a bit to the right, but the truck hit it. I watched it launch into the air like a rag doll. I gave a nervous laugh of relief. If given more time to actually let everything that happened sink in, I would have cried. I thought to myself that this would make a heck of a story to tell, a story that, little did I know at the time, had hardly begun. A few minutes passed, and while I may have lost the creature, I was still driving way too fast down the mountain to avoid any chance of it catching up. Unfortunately, I had forgotten about a really deep looking puddle that I remembered spotting on the way up the mountain. Before I knew it, water shot up from the sides of my car and any control I had was lost. I crashed into the metal barrier and by some work of God, I was going slow enough that I didn't end up catapulting myself over the edge of the mountain. After collecting myself for what felt like the millionth time in the past half hour, I knew that my car was definitely screwed now judging by all the warning lights that went off. I got out of my car and didn't even bother to look at the damage. I took out my phone, screenshotting my coordinates, and figured I'd call my insurance company tomorrow. I looked at how far away I was from my house, and to my surprise, I was only a five-mile walk away from my own place. I lived right at the edge of the woods that I was standing right in front of, so I made the decision to walk home. 
I just wanted to keep moving, get home as soon as possible, rather than wait around in my car for a tow truck, playing with the chance of that creature finding me again. So into the woods I went. Two hours later, I had about a mile to a mile and a half left of walking before I had reached my house. I was still having trouble comprehending everything that went down on that mountain. Was I understanding this right? Werewolves are real. Why did it want to kill me so bad? Is that trucker that hit it okay? Questions I could only ask myself every 20 minutes or so. If I thought about them for too long, then every sound I heard in the distance would have my heart beating out of my chest all over again. I decided that what's over is over, and that I would focus my thoughts on literally anything else. So I began to think about which TV dinner I would heat up when I got home. Lord knows I wouldn't be able to sleep. As I walked, I noticed something. The crickets, owls, and every other woodland animal went completely silent all at once. The other takeaway I got from summer camp came crashing down on me. If everything just went silent, there's a good chance that means a predator is nearby. Then I heard it. The sound that will haunt my nightmares for the rest of my life, the loudest, most unholy howl echoed through the woods. This was nothing like any wolf howl, or even those found in your typical werewolf movies. This sounded so unnatural, so pained, almost as if the beast had taken a spear to the heart. I stopped dead in my tracks, feeling my heart sink into my stomach while doing so, because that howl didn't sound very far away. I stood still for a moment. Then, without thinking, I just took off into a run. Back on the mountain, everything happened so fast and so suddenly, I didn't have time to process everything that went down. I was numbed with the adrenaline combined with fight-or-flight instinct, but now that I'd calmed down at least some, and I knew that it was approaching, my mind began to run along with me. It had found me. It had survived a hit from a semi-truck, and it found me. It must have caught my scent, and went out of its way to hunt me down. Another howl, so much closer then, even with thick woods to navigate through, and an infinite number of low-hanging branches to dodge, this monster was making serious ground at an alarming rate. One second I was running, the next I was on my back, blood dripping down my face. It took a second for me to comprehend what happened in the haze I was in, but I quickly figured out I'd run straight into one of the lower hanging branches. I slowly got up. Things were quiet, but not as quiet as before. I looked to my side. There was a waterfall, maybe 30 feet in height, about 10 feet from me, and a rather rapidly flowing river at the bottom of it. For a second, the broken silence calmed me down. Then I heard a deep and guttural growl. If pure malice and malevolence could be brought to life through sound, that's exactly what I heard. And it wasn't a short growl, lasting a second or two. No, this went on for what felt like minutes, growing more and more aggressive. I knew that running was no longer an option. I only had two realistic ways out of this. Jump down into the river, or climb up the tree that just knocked me down. I had no idea how deep the river was, but if it was too shallow, or if I jumped and landed funnily, I knew 30 feet would mess me up bad enough that I would have no chance of making it out of the woods alive. With that, I jumped as high as I could, grabbing a branch above the one I ran into and pulling myself up. Immediately after doing so, the beast leapt out and would have tackled me on the spot if I'd waited any longer. I started to climb the tree, praying all the while that this thing wouldn't follow me up. How wrong I was, with absolute ease, the creature began climbing, following me up the tree. It moved slower when climbing, so I did have more of a chance of getting away, but it was still way faster than I could go. I looked down at it, and saw it was closing in on me. I saw bits of fabric hanging from its teeth, and prayed that that wasn't from the trucker. Out in the open with no car, flight was no longer a viable option. Then I sprouted quite possibly the craziest idea I've ever had. With no more than a second's worth of planning, I jumped off the branch I was on, pulling my knees in as close to my chest as possible. Then at the last second, I shot my legs out as straight and as fast as I could, right before I would have landed on the creature. Somehow despite it outweighing me at least three to one, I was able to knock it out of the tree. 
The thing tumbled to the ground and rolled right off the cliff into the rapids down below. Miraculously, I was able to grab onto a branch after kicking it to avoid the same fate, getting my hands covered in tree sap. The water below was moving so fast, I only caught a glimpse of it being swept away in the distance. I let go of the branch, coming down much harder than anticipated, hard enough that I felt it in my stomach. But my only goal was to get the heck out of there as soon as possible. So that's what I did. I pressed forward, traumatized to the point of mental and emotional numbness. The beast may have been gone, but everything about it was still haunting me, right on down to the darkest, deepest corners of my psyche. Every sound I heard was a howl. Every little reflection of light was those ungodly eyes. Even the memory of the reek of its breath had made permanent residence in my nostrils. After what felt like an eternity to my feet, yet only a minute to my mind, I made it out of the woods. And there it was, home. Even the immovable feelings of misery and dissatisfaction that plagued me in that house during the waking hours of the day were completely non-existent then, and in their place stood sanctuary and safety. The fall from the branch from before left my ankle sore, so I shambled into my house as quickly as my entry allowed. Now, there's a field between my house and the woods that stretches about a half a football field. I was maybe three quarters of the way there when I felt it. At that point, it was unmistakable. In hindsight, maybe I had heard footsteps before, but I'll never know for sure. When I turned around, there it was, standing on its hind legs. I saw how heavy it was breathing, even from that distance that I was at. It was then that I knew that this creature did not seek me for hunger, but out of hatred. Just as before, we just stood there, only for a moment. This time, it made the first move, dropping onto all fours and running as quickly as it could towards me. I still believe when writing this that the adrenaline that exploded inside me at that moment was enough to suppress the injury I sustained not even an hour ago, and it was nothing short of divine intervention. I ran to my back door. The beast was practically on top of me in no time. I knew my door was locked, but I also knew where the key was hidden. I ran up to the door and picked up the potted plant next to the door. I know, it's not the smartest place to keep your spare key. But in a small town like this, there really wasn't much need for top-of-the-line security. I knew I wouldn't have time to unlock the door, so I did something which may have turned out to be a mistake. It was either be torn to pieces or get mad, so I chose the latter. I took the pot and threw it straight at the monster's face. By then, it was only ten feet from me so it was by no means a lucky shot. It definitely wasn't expecting it. It whipped back after impact. I used the precious seconds I had now while it was stunned to get inside my house. I turned around, beginning to close the door. I got it just three inches from closing when something began to push on it from outside. That creature was far stronger than me. It was able to inch the door open against me. I knew that I couldn't win this. I took the chain lock and right in the nick of time, I was able to latch it onto the keeper, stopping the door from inching any farther. The beast, however, wasted no time. It used the entire mass of its body to bang against the door. The first hit shook the dust from the top of the door frame. The second one made the keeper on the wall loosen. Between that and its next hit, I closed the door and locked it. It hit against the door a third time, but nothing happened. Fourth hit, nothing. After a fifth and unsuccessful hit, the onslaught stopped. I dared not look out the window to see if it had given up. The mere sight of me just seemed to anger the creature. I made my way upstairs to the second floor to peek out the window behind the curtains of my bedroom. Halfway up, I nearly had a heart attack. A loud crash penetrated the short-lived silence in the air. The darned thing must have burst through my kitchen window. With no time to recover from the fright, I ran up the stairs and into my room, where I kept my 38 Special Revolver for home defense. I made it to my room, closed and locked the door. Then I hurried to my bedside table drawer and pulled out my gun. After turning off the safety, I checked, and it was loaded. I heard all sorts of furniture crashing and glass breaking downstairs. I figured if that's keeping it content for now, so be it. But of course, it didn't. It came for one thing, and that seemed to be me. 
I heard it slowly stomp its way up my stairs. I could tell it was on its hind legs then, judging by the speed and weight at which it was moving. Memories of me cowering at the very thought of the boogeyman when I was a kid came rushing back to me as I now hid in my room, trembling on the verge of tears and fear. It broke down the door to my study room, trashing it much like it did downstairs. Then the bathroom door was broken. It knew I was up here. I knew that even with all six rounds, a creature that big and that ferocious would not easily be taken down. And with the way it seemed to just brush off getting hit by a car, launched by a semi-truck, and falling down a cliff and into rapid waters, six little bullets at best could briefly incapacitate it, I guessed. I knew I was dead. This thing was going to knock down every door to find me. If I was lucky, I'd get in four, maybe five shots before it ripped me apart. Then I remembered my room was directly above the steel cellar doors outside my home, but if I did what I had in mind, there truly would be no other option left. All I could do after that would be to pray that this beast had had enough for the night and simply go away. As it knocked down the door to my storage room, I tucked the revolver between my belt and waist and opened my bedroom window. I stuck my feet out first and dropped myself to the ground. That burst of adrenaline from earlier had long gone and my already messed up ankle got hurt even further. I stumbled to my cellar doors and opened them. I looked up, seeing the beast sticking its head out my window, sniffing around. It stopped, then looked down, spotting me. With a grisly snarl, it brandished bloody teeth. I almost froze then. It went back inside, and I knew it was then or never. I closed the cellar doors and locked them shut. I could hear from outside the creature burst through the window, crashing down on the ground in front of the cellar. Once again, it began banging against the doors. This cellar was meant to withstand Category 4 tornadoes, but even those monstrous storms were natural. I wish I could tell you how many times that thing bashed itself against the cellar doors, but I honestly lost track after 40. By then, the doors had already began to bend. That memory acts as my idea of hell. A creature with nothing more than a hunger for your blood to be spilled, slowly breaking its way into where you're hiding, afraid, knowing that it's a matter of time, not a matter of if. Suddenly, there was a pause. A minute passed, and after having a second to figure out what to do with my fear, I decided to heck with it. I've never felt as if I'd done enough with my life, and I decided then, for once in my life, I was going to take control and prove to myself that I had it in me to not let something keep me down. I would take this quiet moment to catch the creature by surprise. It seemed as if one of us had to die for this to end, and I was going to do whatever it took for that not to be me. I burst open the cellar doors, raising my gun ready to aim and ready to fire, but the creature was gone. I frantically looked around, even back up at my bedroom window. It wasn't there any longer. Then I noticed the dawn had broke. Sweet, sweet sunlight had started shining over the tops of the trees, overtaking the dark of the night. A sight I truly never thought I'd ever see again. I tumbled to the ground, crying with relief. I had survived. That day, I took care of my car filing a home insurance claim too, referring to the incident as a break-in. I checked myself into a hotel about a mile away from my house. My house would be under repair for the next week, so my insurance company provided free lodging while repairs were underway. At the front desk, the person working there asked me if it mattered where I stayed, and his question made me wonder. I asked if I could be put into a top-floor room, after assuring them that my ankle injury was nothing more than a sprain, that I would have no problem getting up there, I made my way to my room, where for the first time in years, I had no trouble throwing myself in bed and going right to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night. I got up and looked out the window. Despite the long distance, I was almost certain that I saw a dot moving around my house. I shrugged it off, knowing there's no way to be certain what it was from that distance. Before I turned away, I heard what could easily be mistaken as a train whistle. But I knew in my gut what that sound was. That was a howl. And almost as if to reassure me that it was a howl, as soon as I heard it, 
the dot made its way back into the woods behind my house. That was enough for me to start looking at cheap, out-of-state apartments. Hopefully, where this monster won't find me. Inside, it waits. From Miro F. K. I spend a lot of time hiking out there in the wilderness, just me and nature. The natural world, undisturbed, pure, a weird sense of wonder. So when my wife, June, had to move for work, she sold it to me that we would have a little cottage to ourselves and a nearby forest for hiking. We never wanted kids, happier to have a few cats. It was a great commitment until you leave the house for another home. The cats prefer the old place. I'm not exactly proud to say we have left a trail of houses across the country with new owners having to put up with cats. After about three weeks, we're settled in and somewhat unpacked at the new place. The morning of, I was excited to head off into a new forest. June was excited for me. She could tell I was eager, made obvious by the silly grin on my face. I'd spent the night before packing, checking, double checking, and checking again. She did the usual recall of must-have items. Water, food, first aid, all that stuff. I get the silent look as she nods to the closet. The gun. I always carry while hiking, just to be safe. She's never been a fan of guns, understandably, really. Then she asks, is the weather forecast good for the day's hike? Clear skies and mild winds, I told her, adding, it isn't my first rodeo. With a smile, a little tradition we have. June never really liked hiking. She hates sweating, bugs, and way too much walking. It's not a bad hobby to have. She's probably glad that I'm not a drinker, gambler, or sports fanatic. I guessed she was hoping I would find a friend here that I could go hiking with, so she didn't have to come along. Kissing June goodbye before she headed to work, I set off in the car. It's about a 30-minute drive out of town up the local national park. I arrive well before noon and park. There are only a few cars there as I pull in. A family was unpacking their things for a picnic on the nearby benches. Some kids were running about the playground. I geared up, checking everything again. There was a small cabin by the car park. A park ranger who was outside smiled away, giving a few friendly waves. Just to the right of the cabin is a display board, showing the available routes, color-coded for the difficulty they offer. Each had an estimated time, terrain grading, elevation, wildlife that roamed the area, and waypoints for camping or facilities. I took a quick snap of it all with my phone, ensuring the picture was decent quality. I zoomed in and out to make sure I could read the map correctly. The park ranger offered me a map. I accepted it and thanked him. Then he asked, First time here? Yep, I say. Just moved into town. Been itching to head up here since we arrived. Welcome, he says. Have you much experience hiking? Yeah, I've been at it a few years. Good to know. All I ask is you stick to the trails. We don't need anybody getting lost up here. Will do. Have a good one, I say. Have a good hike, smiles the park ranger as I head on in. I picked the most difficult looking route. It had steep inclines, rough terrain, and the longest trek. It was estimated at a six hour round trip. I'm happy with that. Plus, that route gave me an opportunity to look down over the town and surrounding area. About three hours in, I stopped at one of the waypoints. There was a small camping area. No one was around, so I figured I was the first one up, or else it was just a quiet day for hikers. I used a restroom that was available, had a snack, and hydrated before heading on up the steepest part of the hike. I take in the songs of birds, random rustling of bushes as I go on. As I made it to a certain clearing, the one that allows you to look over the town, I paused for a bit. I took a picture and I sent it to June, writing a message with it that said, Reached the top already. Piece of cake. I clicked send and waited for a reply. After a moment, there was no reply, so I assumed June was busy at work. I took another few pictures along the way, of streams and birds and places where the sun shone through the trees in a certain way. Picturesque, you could say. As I rounded the peak and began my descent, I spied a small break in the shrubbery. The sight of it was very tempting. No more than a few meters in, I tell myself, then right back out, never losing sight of the trail. I picked my way through, being cautious with my steps. The high grass and brambles made it a bit of a challenge, but I faced worse. 
I came to a point where the sun didn't touch. The density of the trees above wouldn't allow it. Then I felt a small wave of something. It was hard to describe, but it felt like entering a room and you can't remember why you even went in there. I didn't feel like I was lost or confused, just unsettled. I was unsettled by the silence too, because just before there had been noises, but now there were no birds tweeting, no rustling. My mind goes to defense mode. There must be a predator nearby, has to be. I flicked back through my memory of the display board. There weren't any real predators that it mentioned. The largest animals out here were listed as foxes. I fumbled my phone from my pocket, still no sounds. I unlocked it and saw that I had a message from June. Where are you? I replied, at the top. I pocketed my phone and turned to head back onto the trail. My head was on a swivel just to be sure. I made a quick mental map to where my gun was, left hip. I reached to be sure and for some reason it was on my right hip. That's weird, I muttered. It's strange because I'm left-handed. I paid no mind to it. As I meandered back onto the trail, a wind flew in at me, mild at first, which is to be expected. But it grew, and it grew fast. Small white flakes came in too. What? I asked myself. Snow? How? Before I could make it to the trail, a swirl of snow came spiraling in at me. Flaky at first, then heavy and relentless. I edged to the trail, now covered in knee-deep snow. The sky above was gray now and thick with clouds. Only a few minutes ago, a few puffs of cloud lazed through the sky. This doesn't make any sense, I thought. It's summer, my wife's month, June. I peered through silted eyes to my left and right. I knew the trail led back down to my right, but it was now blanketed in snow. How could this be, I kept wondering. It didn't make any sense. There was no reason for it. The wind and chill cut deep, and I moved back into the small break to shelter myself from the wind. It felt warmer in there. It was a weird contrast between howling white and warm greenery. So I decided to move farther back into the tree line. Before I knew it, it felt as if the wind and chill had abated. But the darkness still lingered. I figured it would be best to wait out this unexpected blizzard in a warm spot. I guessed it would be warmer even farther in, and it was. The high grass and brambles seemed easier to deal with. I glanced back as often as possible, keeping a close eye on the way out. Again I checked for my gun, left hip, wait no it was the right hip, but why? I spotted a clearing up ahead. It was a little overcast, but had no snow. This was nonsensical. I moved on just to get a place with a better source of light. As I neared the clearing, it began to darken. There were a few flakes at first, but as I stepped into the clearing, the snow got heavier. What in the world is happening? I checked the weather before coming here, I thought. I saw a line of trees that veered to the right. I followed them, and the gray sky moved quickly into dark. It happened so fast, my eyes didn't even have time to adjust, like walking into a dark room. I looked back. More darkness. The pathway seemed thicker than it had been when I went through. My footfalls and breaks in the long grass weren't visible. I was freezing at this point. Arms huddled around myself, teeth rattling. This was so weird. What was even weirder was the swirling snow that made no sound. Despite the speed of the wind, the tall trees around, too, there was no sound coming through. Nothing. I rounded into deeper grass and snow, and at a certain point, I can't be sure when, the fall of snow stopped. The wind died away, and I was left in an open space of white. Kind of. Until my eyes adjusted, and I saw what was ahead of me. A log cabin. A small mercy until I realized it was surrounded by a wire fence and barbed wire. Each corner post of the perimeter was higher than the fence and topped with floodlights. I could feel my face numbing to the cold, but the snow had stopped and the wind was gone, but the chilly air remained. What struck me as odd, besides the fenced-off cabin in the middle of the woods and the unexplained blizzard, was also the fact that I could not see my breath. It should have been coming in clouds. 
but it wasn't. The cabin set about a hundred meters inside the perimeter of the fence. I made my way closer, hand on my gun not drawn, but glancing about. The cabin had a light on, a steady plume of smoke flowing from the chimney, and the door was open. Maybe someone had just stepped out to get some more wood for the fire. The thing was, the snow around the cabin was undisturbed. The lure of the heat beckoned me towards the fence. I saw something on the fence that I didn't expect. Signs that read, do not disturb, stay out, trespassers will be, and one crude sign looking nothing like the rest. Written on a piece of cloth in some kind of brown paint, it read, don't. Now, I'm usually one to obey the rules, but the cold was encouraging me to ignore the warning signs, despite how well placed and blatant they were. I fished my phone from my pocket. The screen was the same as before. I sent a message to June, then cursed myself and called her. The dial tone told me there was no service. I peered down at the screen, no bars, no internet, and two new messages from June. I love the view. And, call me please. I sent a message back. I'm okay babe, found a cabin, gonna stay until the snow clears. That blizzard came out of nowhere. Love you. The message of course didn't send just yet, but right at the moment I needed some shelter. I took a look around. Still no sign of life, no sounds or anything. All that I could see were the tracks I'd made this far. I put my phone away and I told myself, screw it. I began to climb the fence, happy to get out of the knee-deep snow, if even for a few seconds. I landed on the other side, sinking into the snow. For some other unexplainable reason, the snow on that side wasn't as deep. I looked to the cabin and saw that the door was still open, smoke still puffing away. Then something caught my eye. It was just off to my right. My hand flicked to my hip, then realized once again my gun was still on the wrong hip. What I saw sent a wave of fear up my spine, the perfect outline of a man facing me, all dark, unmoving, and extremely sinister. He was at the far corner opposite me, and to make things even creepier, he was on the snow, but not ankle deep in it like me. Hey! Hey! I called out, like an idiot. Just looking for some shelter. He or it didn't respond. It just remained still. No matter what I did, I couldn't make out its face from there. No features at all. From this distance, its skin didn't look like skin, it looked more like leather. I made a sidestep toward the cabin, and that silhouette matched my movement. I paused, and so did it. I began to breathe rapidly. I stepped forward, and it mirrored my step again. Then I reached for my gun. I, uh, got a gun on me. I yelled out, an implied threat. The silhouette remained still, even without eyes that I couldn't see. I could feel it watching me. I stood still for a minute, and it did too. I took a slow step, and it did the same. I glanced over at the cabin, and back to its, uh, owner? Guard? Whoever it was. I drew my gun then, pointing it at the ground, but making it obvious what I was doing. I'm gonna go on in. Still, nothing. I took another step towards the cabin, then a step back, and did it again. It really didn't want me to be in there, and I couldn't stay out here. I held the gun steady and slowly sidestepped again, then forward like an awkward chess piece. I estimated in about another 20 steps we would be face to face. I somehow began to sweat, pure anxiety and fear. I don't want any trouble! I screamed one last warning before I bolted for the door. It matched my pace stride for stride. As I neared the door and as it neared me, I pointed the gun one-handed waiting for it to come close enough. To my shock and delight, as I dove for the door it slowed and stopped. Inside, I landed on my back, spun around, gun pointed shakily as I kicked at the door to close it. I saw something that made me scream. The thing outside was now joined by exact copies of itself. There were about four more of them huddled in behind it. I jumped forward as the door slammed shut. I pressed against it and swung the extra latch into place. My breathing began to slow as I felt a tiny piece of calmness and safety. 
I glanced out the window, but due to the brightness of the interior of the cabin, I had to cup my hands around my eyes to get a good look. I couldn't help but feel that they might come towards the window and smash it, then try to pull me out. I braved it anyway, and what I saw through the glass was unsettling. They were lined up in front of the cabin, perfectly spaced out and perfectly still. I backed away from the window, turning to take in my surroundings. A basic cabin, in a sense. A bed, a back door, four windows, two in the front and two in the back. There was a door to the left, a bathroom, I assumed. A small table and chair sat next to the bed. There was an old radio on top of the table, along with a lamp. In the middle of the room was a huge mat with a strange pattern sewn into it. Of course, another weird thing, no fireplace. Where was the smoke from the chimney coming from, I thought. I resigned myself to the idea that it was all a ploy, a well-placed piece of bait to get me in. Why would the things outside want to keep me out? More things that didn't make sense. Nothing made sense right now. I switched from figuring out what was happening to what I could do to stay safe and eventually get out of here. I checked my phone. No service still. Probably the weather. Could be the area, though. I scanned around again, then found my gaze locked on the wall. The one bare wall. Because from that angle, I could see words scratched into the wood. I moved about to take them in and get a better understanding of what I was dealing with. At the right angle, I was able to read it all. Stay in the dark. Ignore the radio. Stay out of the bathroom. Give up. Praying doesn't help. You are not alone. The last few words were not a warning like the rest. They read, Jimmy was here. Scared. Love you, Mandy. I know that song. I'll beat you. Gonna try and leave. Wish me luck. None of those words inspired promise. They could all be lies, too. After all, the smoke had been a lie. Why not this? I turned towards the radio. I doubted it worked. Could be a wind-up radio. I moved over towards it, and the little plastic dials lit up. Static came on from it, full blast. I could feel the cabin itself reverberating. I couldn't help but cup my ears and drop to my knees, and as soon as it started, it stopped. I was in a state of panic then, and I moved over to the front door, my hand hovering over the door handle. The floodlights on the exterior of the cabin caused light to flow through the cracks of the door. A sudden sense of urgency set in. I kept thinking, I have to leave. I have to. I ran to the back door. As I made it there, a shadow blocked the light flooding in from the cracks. One of them, a silhouette. I turned and darted back to the front door, and yet another shadow crept over the cracks of light. These freaky things, I thought. I pulled my gun, popping two rounds through the door. There were no screams, no cries of pain, just the floodlights dying out and blood-curdling whispers. We cannot let him out. I continued to panic. I reached for my phone. I laid eyes on the lock screen, which displayed the clock, which was now jumping between different times. 1800 hours, then to 2100 hours, 1400. It cycled through times over and over. I winced and looked around. On the table by the bed was a piece of paper that I didn't notice before. I approached with caution. It seemed to be an index, which wasn't a surprise at this point. It showed the letters of the alphabet from A to Z in squares, and next to those squares was a number. The letter A was 1, B was 2, and so on. Something clicked and I checked my phone again. It was jumping in the same pattern. 1800, 2100, 1400, over and over. I realized 18 would be R, 21 would be U, and 14 was N. Run. What a crappy warning, I thought. Great advice. I began to circle the room, holding my gun in my right hand. It felt as if something was wrong with me because my left hand, which was dominant, suddenly didn't feel dominant anymore. I tapped my head trying to think, but no new ideas were coming to me. I went to the front door, and in one quick motion, I opened it. Outside, I saw those five figures, and just as I opened the door, all five of them darted at me. They seemed to flicker to me instead of running. 
I saw them for what they really appeared to be. The dark skin they had wasn't really skin. It was dark and leathery like latex, stretched over jutting bones and joints. Every twitch they made as they tried to impede my exit showed a flicker of tendons underneath. They had no eyes, just a slit where the mouth should be, a ghastly smile of jagged green teeth underneath. I jumped back as they reached for me, and the whispers came again. He can't leave. It's too late. Hide. Then the door swung shut without me touching it. I was actually kind of relieved because I was now separated from those figures again, but once again terrified to be alone as well. I almost felt safer with those leathery people than I did on my own. Why was that? Did they reach to kill me or reach to save me? The radio started up again, even louder than before. I felt every pulse of that static. There was a message this time coming through. I could hear the words, mine, a break, followed by, now. I was staring at the radio in. I had been kneeling on the mat on the floor when the mat suddenly began to move. Startled, I jerked away and watched the mat squirm. I reached out and grabbed the mat, and the radio stopped. I pulled it back. Below it on the wooden floor was a perfectly shaped 8x4 rectangle, a sort of trap door. Then something hits it from below. I scurried back, finding myself by the bathroom door. I reach out and pull the handle down and flounder my way inside the bathroom. The bathroom was bright. I shut the door and waited. I could hear the sound of a heavy slam of wood and something rattling about. My mind went into overdrive. He can't leave. Was that message for me? At this point, I felt as if I was going insane. I got up and checked my gun. I checked the bullets, counted them. There were 12. Outside had gone silent. I breathed heavily, bracing myself. I heaved in a big breath and jumped back into the room, opening the bathroom door. There was nothing that had changed. The lamplight was still working. I looked around once more, my eyes drawn to the wall of warnings. Then I looked back to the flipped back mat. The gaping hole in the wooden floor flipped back. The trap door had been opened, and there was now soil scattered about. Suddenly, I hear a meow. There's a cat at my feet, swirling between my legs. I recognize it right away, a cat from my first house with June. It couldn't be. I knelt down and scooped him up. One arm holding Luna, the other my right hand wielding my gun, I walked about the room as the cat squirmed and hissed. Whispers outside came again, repeating the message that I could not leave. I did my best to keep my wits about me, trailing the gun from corner to corner. As I looked to the message on the wall, which had somehow disappeared, no matter which angle I looked at, then I heard another whisper. You're not alone. This had come from inside the cabin. Quickly, I scanned the room as I moved closer to the front door. I looked side to side, up and down. I peered at the gaping hole in the floor, but I still didn't know where the whisper had come from. Luna hissed again, and I tried to calm her. I needed to focus to make sure nothing attacked us. But then, I lay eyes on it. As Luna lets out a wailing whine, I spot this shadowy creature clutched high in the corner of the room. It had no arms, just black tendrils that stretched back into the corners of the room. Its feet dangled like crow's feet. They flexed hungrily, waiting for something to clutch onto. They snapped in my direction. I darted for the door, dropping Luna as I did. I flung the door back and dove into the snow. I felt the grip of something grasp my backpack. I struggled to wriggle free. The leathery creatures outside moved in, and instead of attacking me, they went for the talons on my back. I cried for help as those leathery things began to tug me free. I scrambled up and sped my way to the fence, anything to get out. I looked back. How couldn't I? I saw those leathery creatures beat at the talons as they reached out through the door. Luna sprinted out between it all, and the talons seemed to melt down behind her. As I neared the fence, the leathery creatures turned and swarmed towards me. I unloaded my gun, headshots all around, Luna pouncing after me. The creatures dropped. 
I took the time to scurry up the fence, Luna doing the same. Now she clung to me, purring as I swung over the top of the fence and landed awkwardly on the other side. I got up with Luna clutched in my arm, and the gun pointed at the bodies of the leathery creatures as they floated upright to their feet. All at once they rushed the fence, teeth bared, whispering, He escaped. To my surprise and relief, they didn't pursue me past the fence as I staggered away backwards my gun still raised. I turned and hobbled my way back, the wind and snow howling at me. I holstered my gun and stuffed Luna into my jacket, moving as quickly as I could. I wasn't sure how long I was fumbling through the snow. I got that forgetful feeling again. An edge of panic hit me, and I reached for my right-hand side, but the gun was gone. I checked my left side. There it was. I used whatever energy I had left to run. Eventually, I emerged through the tree line onto a dry and warm pathway. The sky was bright and clear now. A group of people turned to me as I stood there, and they asked if I was okay. I reached for my gun, scared. Then I recognized one of them, the park ranger from earlier, who said, It's him. Relax, son, we've been looking for you. What? I asked. He approaches me steadily, hands raised to show that he wasn't a threat. Your wife let us know that you hadn't come home. I stepped away from him, using my free hand to grab my phone. The screen lit up. It vibrated. I read the date on the screen. Four days had passed. There were over 60 missed calls, voicemails, over a hundred texts, all from my friends and family. What? No, I, I was only in there for an hour, I, I think. Then the park ranger said something that made me break down and cry. You've been missing for four days. Hearing it from him, the realization finally fully hit me. A few days after that, everything seemed to calm down. I spent a few days in the hospital. I held my wife close and tight when I got to see her. She asked me so many questions. I told her I would explain everything. She smiled when I showed her Luna. She was understandably baffled telling me there was no chance that was actually Luna. I think she just went along with it, though, as it may have been the only thing that got me through it all. On my last day in the hospital with Luna on my lap, June listened on as I told the sheriff about how I spent a day or two, maybe, in a small, hollowed-out tree, how I rationed my food, how I attempted to kill small animals with my gun. It was the best explanation I could come up with to explain all the bullets being used. The sheriff nodded along, poking a few holes in my lies when he asked how I managed to stay so clean and well-shaven in four days' worth of being lost. I played the confusion card in those moments. June knew I was lying, though. She smiled and stepped in with, It doesn't matter. All that matters is that he's safe and home. The local paper wrote of how a hiker went missing, how he was safely back with his wife. They asked me if I'd like to be quoted with anything. I just told them to thank everyone for their time and effort. Finally, I got home. At the door, I let Luna down. June and I walked into the kitchen, and she began to make some tea. She turned, face sad and scared, and asked, What really happened? I knew this was coming. I couldn't lie, not to June. She took her phone from her pocket. You said a blizzard came out of nowhere and you found a cabin. When I told the park rangers about it, they laughed at me. I was confused, I lied. I had to. The truth would just make me sound insane. I really can't be certain. That part was true, because I truly couldn't be anymore. And in her loving way, she put her phone down and smiled. Take your time. You're home and that's what matters. A few days later, I hadn't slept very well, as is to be expected. I kept waking up in the night sweating. I had so many questions. Those things, the leathery creatures, they wanted me to stay out, but once I was inside, they didn't want me to leave. And that thing that came from the floor, they beat it back. They saved me, didn't they? About a week after it all happened, I was pacing the living room one day as June was asleep in bed. Luna sat by the window. I couldn't stop thinking about that thing in the cabin. 
I was certain then that those leathery creatures were trying to keep me out and that other thing in. How I Lost My Leg From Anonymous I won't lie to you. This is a strange thing for me to finally talk about after all these years. For the sake of mine and my brother's privacy, names and locations will be changed. You can call me Jake, and my brothers, James, Justin, and Jackson. About six years ago, my father passed away in a tragic car accident. Dead on impact, is what they said. Didn't feel a thing. Although I did find some comfort in the fact he didn't suffer, it was still a massive loss for the family. My father was a great man. He was a doting father to his four boys and a loving husband to our mother. He had strong arms and a pure heart, going out of his way to improve the lives of everyone around him. He was there to teach and shape us in every step of growing up, and we all carried his best qualities in life. The summer after his passing, my oldest brother, James, suggested that we go camping to honor his memory. The four of us agreed, of course. Setting aside our commitments for one measly weekend was a small price to pay. It meant we could go do the thing he loved the most together. Personally, I had no conflicts, being a salary man that had weekends off anyway. James was between jobs at the moment and thought that the trip would be a good way to realign his energies. Justin had to simply cancel a few work meetings and explain multiple times to his partner that he wasn't allowed to go. That weekend was just for us. Jackson, however, had just gotten married to his wife about a month prior to our trip, so he had the most difficult time trying to get away. His wife was still very much in the honeymoon phase and could not stand the thought of being apart for more than 24 hours. When the time finally arrived, we had all gathered up our old camping gear, then piled into Jackson's SUV. The trip was going to take about two hours, but we didn't mind. We used that time to catch up and laugh. By the time we arrived at Dad's favorite camping site, the sun was already going down. The temperature out there in the mountains drops quickly at night, so we rushed to get our tents set up and our fire going. I, unfortunately, by then was very drunk and ended up snapping one of my tent poles, leaving my shelter in a useless heap on the forest floor. Thankfully, James had my back and he didn't mind sharing his tent with me. It was the only two-person tent anyway, but still, it was a kind gesture. Another hour passed and we were all set up. We sat around the fire telling ghost stories over s'mores. It couldn't have been more perfect. The cool night air was fresh, alive with chirping insects and the hoots of owls. I think it was the buzz I had going, but I thought that the owl sounded sick or something. Its hoot sounded more like a gasp, a death rattle. I shook my head clear of the morbid thoughts and looked up at the sky. The stars shimmered down upon us, bright and beautiful, as we enjoyed our brotherly bonding. Jackson and I both tried and failed miserably to tell a scary story. I couldn't stop laughing long enough to be ominous and spooky, while Jackson just simply sucked at storytelling. We would constantly forget the lines and we weren't able to make it make sense. We booed him, lovingly, until he stopped and gave up, opting instead to make us more. Hey, Justin said suddenly, quickly putting on a serious expression. Did Dad ever tell you guys about the... Thing that lives out here. There were some murmurs as we all looked at each other, confused. Uh, no, haven't heard that one, Jackson responded, crossing his arms. James and I agreed, pondering why we hadn't heard the story as well. Justin sighed deeply and looked up, meeting each of our eyes before he continued. It was my 18th birthday. He and I made a deal that to celebrate, we'd go camping just the two of us. James rolled his eyes and smirked. Yeah, cause you always needed extra help with everything, Cupcake. He had to teach you how to be more manly. Justin narrowed his eyes at our eldest brother and pointed the sharp end of his marshmallow skewer at him. 
Hey, I'm not the one that ruined a whole tent because a snake scared the literal pee out of him. We laughed as James put his hands up in defeat. Alright, you got me. Continue with your story. Justin took another few moments to look around at us before he decided we were done interrupting and continued. We arrived here, of course. It's always been Dad's favorite spot. The second night we were out here, we began to hear these weird hooting noises. I kept trying to explain it away as a sick or injured owl, but it just never sounded right. The third night, Dad came and woke me up. When I looked at him, he was all panicked and sweaty. The look in his eyes as he told me to grab my bag, it was the scariest freaking thing I've ever seen. He never answered my questions, just locked me in the car and grabbed what he could of our stuff as fast as he could. I felt a twinge on the back of my neck as my brother spoke. Did I not hear a sick-sounding owl just earlier? He continued. After we began driving back, Dad started to speed as soon as we hit the main road. The ride back was silent. Eventually, finally, he turned to me and asked if I saw it. I told him no, of course, and he just nodded and looked back at the road. I never knew what it was that he was talking about, what he saw. The silence was deafening as he finished the story. Jackson sat still, not realizing his marshmallow was still in the fire burning. James broke the silence before I could. No way, is that why we never came back here? I thought Dad just got too old and tired to keep roughing it like this. I nodded in agreement just now realizing that he was correct. For the past four years, until my father's untimely passing, he had simply refused to go camping here again, no matter how much we begged him. I'm surprised he never told you all that was the reason, Justin said softly. Then again, I bet he didn't want to sound senile. I'm not sure why, but I lifted my beer up at the moment and smiled, sadly. Well then, I said, this one's for you, Dad. We've come to reclaim your beloved camping site. Monster be darned. My brothers all cheered and clinked their bottles and cans to mine as we all took a deep pool of our beverages. Later that night, Jackson and James put out the fire as Justin and I hid away the food in the bear bag. We all said goodnight then and drunkenly stumbled our separate ways to our tents. As I unrolled my sleeping bag and got settled in, James entered the tent. His eyes were red and he looked absolutely beat. We gave one last good night to each other and let the alcohol rock us to sleep as the wind rustled our tent. Sometime later, I awoke with a headache and a very full bladder. Quietly, I got up, trying my best not to disturb my sleeping brother as I exited the tent walking a good distance away to try and find a private spot to do my business. Once I had relieved myself, I picked up on a strange sound. No, wait, there was no sound. The woods were dead silent. My heart began to race as my camper's instinct kicked in. A completely silent forest is a deadly forest. I pressed my back up against the tree I just peed on and stayed as still and quiet as possible. Out of the dead silence, there came a slight rustle, then a hoot of what sounded like a sick owl. My blood went cold. I slowly glanced above me, the hair on the back of my neck raising up in a primitive warning. Then our eyes met. That thing in the tree. It was pale, eyes black as the night, it slowly crawled down the trunk of the tree straight towards me, long fingers and arms reaching out, both thin yet lean with muscle. It opened its disgusting mouth, lined with rows of sharp teeth, and let out that horrible noise again, louder this time, almost as if it was taunting me. In that moment with this horrible creature making its way to me, the flight instinct finally kicked in, 
I screamed bloody murder and began to huff it, the thing hooting in excitement as it chased behind me. I felt tears falling down my face as I ran, my legs and lungs burning, my heart pounding. Right as I was almost back to the site, I felt something hit me square in the back. It had caught me. It had pounced and knocked me flat on my face, claws digging into me. I screamed again, in pain this time, feeling teeth sinking into the meat of my calf. I felt flesh and muscle tear as it jerked its head back. I couldn't run anymore. It had crippled me. I gave up. I had no energy to fight, no way to run. All I could do was lie there and wait as this thing began to eat me. In a sudden flash of red, Jackson appeared out of nowhere in his long johns, tackling the creature off of me. Get him up and run! He screamed. He then turned and planted the head of our hatchet between the thing's shoulder blades, causing it to shriek and hoot in pain. I felt the arms of James and Justin lifting me up, all but dragging me to the SUV as we clambered away, Jackson right on our heels. The drive to the hospital was a blur. I felt nauseous, coming in and out of consciousness as my brothers tried to keep me awake. Justin tied his shirt around my calf. I'd lost a lot of blood. The area of the bite burned. I awoke in the hospital bed sometime later. James was by my side and quickly called down the hall, bringing in the rest of my brothers and our mom. They all spoke to me softly, gently preparing me for the news that I had lost my leg. Apparently in the span of 24 hours and despite the doctor's best efforts, it had become so infected they had to amputate. In an effort to not sound insane, my siblings offered some BS story about how I got my calf caught in an illegal bear trap, and I tried to walk it off for a few days. They left out the monster and made me sound incompetent, but it was better to be dumb than a loon. After all these years, I've finally gotten used to the prosthetic leg. I'm fully mobile and enjoy all the comforts and activities of a normal life. I will offer one piece of advice. Please, just please, think twice before you delve into the deep of the dark woods. You can never guarantee that you are truly alone. The Thing I Saw in My Front Yard From Duane The story begins in October of 2021. I was watching over my parents' home while my mom was in the county hospital due to a lung disease called pulmonary fibrosis. It's tough to know that one day you'll smother to death from lack of oxygen. However, this story begins at my family home in South Central Kentucky. I own the place now, a 10-acre small farming homestead that's been in the family since 1974 just after my parents were married. It's situated right there on the Tennessee-Kentucky line. So on that night, my baby brother, who has since passed on from this life to the next, was with me. While everyone else was at the hospital with my mom, we were about to go to bed. I lay down, but I couldn't seem to fall asleep. I had this feeling of dread and uncomfortableness seeming to engulf my mind I couldn't shake it off. I couldn't drift off to sleep. So I got up from my warm bed. It was a somewhat cool night, so I wrapped up in a blanket to stay warm. I walked over to my desk and sat down to read for a while. As I was reading, I heard something outside the front door. Something like a whistling sound, or some sort of long chirp. It kept getting louder as I sat there very tired from all the work I'd done that day. Finally, the noise got so loud, I rose from my seat and walked over to the front door. Now, my parents had a very tall flower stand in the front yard, which was seven feet and six inches tall from top to base. This is where things get a bit hairy. So I looked out the front door. Lo and behold, I see this huge black figure it was at least a foot taller than the flower stand, 
I know this because the figure was standing not two feet from it. As I unlocked the door, as quietly as possible, I stared at this thing for what seemed like forever, before it suddenly began to walk away from the stand to the back of an old worn-down garage that my grandpa built in the 80s for my dad. Then it was out of sight. My mom, my dad, and baby brother are all gone now. It's only me and my two girls left. This thing didn't look like anything I've seen before. It wasn't a Bigfoot, it didn't have antlers. It was just huge, hairy, and black as coal. I didn't see its face at all. It had moved to the other side of the road and into the forest. I've never seen this thing since then. If anyone has any information on this, let me know. Birthday Gift From Miss Marie O2 This happened in October of 2021. I've lived in North Alabama my entire life, save for living in Mississippi when I had college classes. I'm a girl, but I've always been a sort of son to my parents, especially my dad. He had raised me hunting and fishing every chance we could get. He taught me how to walk quietly in the woods, how to stop every few steps to look around and listen to the woods and your surroundings. You'd think that with his background, I'd be pretty comfortable spending my time in wooded areas or just in rural outdoor areas in general. For the most part, I am. However, I get really intense paranoia when I'm in the woods after dark and I never venture out without a firearm. After this experience, I'll never again question my preservation instincts. The night of my last birthday, my boyfriend surprised me with a little trip to a secluded riverbank, where he and I had gone hammocking before, as well as where my dad and I had spent many fishing excursions. He pulled into the boat ramp parking lot, turning into a smaller side road, and parked his truck with the tailgate facing the river and the hood right against the tree line. It was about 8 p.m. then, so it was already dark out, which put me on edge just a little bit upon arriving at the riverbank. I tried not to get too scared, though, and I focused on enjoying the evening my boyfriend had set up for us. He came prepared with an endless supply of goodies for me. Slice of cake, my favorite candy, soda, cheesecake, and he even blew up an air mattress for us to lay on in the bed of his truck. We stayed there listening to music, talking and enjoying each other's company for about half an hour before a cop rolled into the parking lot. Knowing we weren't doing anything wrong, we didn't even have alcohol or anything of the sort, we exchanged small talk with the cop when he came to see what we were doing. Well, this is new, he said at first, referring to a couple of teenagers on an air mattress in a truck bed on the riverbank at night. We laughed a bit with him, acknowledging that the situation probably seemed a little odd. But after some general exchanges with the cop, he ended the conversation with, All right then, y'all be careful out here. Some crazy crap's been going on lately. Don't want y'all to get caught up in anything. We gave him a brief, Yes sir, will do, as he got back in his car and pulled out of the parking lot. At this point, we had stuffed ourselves with cake and various other goodies, so we decided to just lie down together and look at the stars. A bit of time passed as we did so, and I'd become entirely at ease with being out there in the dark. I trusted my boyfriend. He's had a few more intense encounters than I have with wildlife and just generally creepy situations in rural areas, so I felt safe with him. That was until twigs snapped from within the tree line that the hood of the truck was butted right up against I shut up mid-sentence when I heard it. My boyfriend and I lay there still and silent while we waited to hear the noise again. Now I've heard my share of animals in the woods, and I also know the general mannerisms of the animals we have in that area. For instance, I'd heard packs of coyotes howling along that same riverbank before, but I didn't think one lone coyote would venture so close to us with our music and lights from the truck. We don't have any large predators either. The occasional bobcat would come around, but they tended to be pretty shy, and any cat would definitely make sure to be completely silent 
when approaching something they weren't sure about. Some rustling went on from the same direction as the original twig snap, and I whispered to my boyfriend, almost inaudibly, What was that? He briefly put a hand over my mouth, a gesture telling me not to make a sound, which put my heart rate through the roof. We lay there, listening to what sounded like footsteps heading toward the parking lot along the tree line. This absolutely freaked me out. Whatever it was, be it a regular animal or something else, it was very close to us, and we were lying out in the open. These sounds traveled out of earshot, but we remained still and quiet for a bit longer to make sure whatever it was had gone far enough away from us for us to safely move around without imminent threat. I was close to tears by then, anxiously suggesting to my boyfriend that we should pack it up and leave, while he insisted that we would probably be fine staying a little longer. I felt awful about wanting to cut our night short, because his birthday surprise for me was really sweet, but my gut just was not having it. Reluctantly, he gave in to my suggestion of leaving. We packed everything back into the truck, me constantly looking around and listening every minute or so, until the only thing left to take was the air mattress. I'd leaned up against the side of the truck bed as he hooked up the pump to take the air out, when a goose called out from the riverbank about ten yards from us. Not thinking much of it, we continued packing up, until we heard a more frantic goose call. And my boyfriend jumped out of the truck with a hasty, that goose is being attacked. Get in the truck. He didn't have to tell me twice. From inside the closed vehicle doors, we listened as this goose on the bank screamed out several more times before being cut off mid-scream, having been finally killed. I was terrified at the moment. I couldn't make sense of why any normal animal would be so bold as to approach our vehicle then actively kill another animal within a short distance of us. This thing didn't seem to have any fear. Sitting in silent panic as my boyfriend rubbed my arm to comfort me, he never got scared in situations like that, we allowed some time to pass before he said he would go back out and finish taking care of the air mattress. I was scared for him imagining all kinds of scenarios where he could be attacked by something as I sat in the truck. I knew he had to get everything situated so we could drive away though, so I watched through the back window and even cracked my door to keep an eye on him. Soon he finished with the air mattress and he just sat it in the back seat. That's when a huffing sound came from the bank where we'd heard the goose dying. My adrenaline went insane then, I called out to him urgently and semi-quietly to get his butt back in the truck, but instead he pulled out his flashlight and shined it along the bank, walking slowly in that direction. That idiot, I was thinking. I'd rather not sit here and witness his brutal death by some animal or thing, whatever it is. He stepped toward the parking lot, still shining the light down the bank. Then he stopped and he said, I see it. He spoke so calmly. I urged him again to get back to the truck, which this time he finally listened. Once he was in the truck with the door shut, I asked him what it was. Was it a coyote? A cougar? He cocked his head. Uh, no, no, neither of those. It was dark and low to the ground and pretty big too. That made up my mind. I told him to drive us out of there that instant, and he obliged. I never saw the thing he described, and I'm glad I didn't. My boyfriend has always internalized any fear or strong emotion, so I don't think his mild reaction to the encounter was phony. Later on, he admitted to me that he acted that way so I wouldn't get any more scared than I already was. I have no idea what it was that was lurking around us that night, but I'm grateful my birthday evening didn't turn out morbid. What's in my forest? From Basic Peaches 
I am a female, and I moved to Florida a couple of years ago. I never once thought that something sinister could ever dwell in my area, but I guess I was wrong. I discovered it very quickly after moving here. My family doesn't own a farm, but we do have plenty of animals. Chickens, geese, cats, and dogs, to name just a few. My cats and dogs normally stay inside, so they were never touched. But the chickens and geese were often mutilated by something, beyond recognition. Most of the time, just the feathers would be left, and maybe a foot or a wing. Logically, this could be explained as a raccoon or a bobcat. But when the geese began to go missing, that had to be something different. For the people who don't know, pilgrim geese are big birds. They're loud when they get attacked, but several of our full-grown adults went missing without a trace. Obviously, they could have flown off, but we kept their wings clipped so they couldn't. However, the screaming, that is what gave me the 100% assurance that something wasn't right in those woods, because something out there would scream, and it sounded like a child and a woman being murdered in the most cruel ways. I asked my neighbors, but of course it was the usual, stay out of the woods at night, that they answered with. Fast forward a couple of years, and this creature had just become part of the regular for me, and for some reason I never thought of it much anymore. My parents were leaving town for about two weeks. They did this yearly, sometimes twice a year, so leaving me by myself was never an issue. I wasn't a party person, and they had no reason to distrust me. The first rule I disobeyed, though, was the have-no-people-over rule. About two hours after they left, I started up my car and went to go get my girlfriend and a few others. We did what most teenagers do. Smoked and drank, but nothing super extreme. That first night, we just hung out. Skip ahead to the third night. It was just me and my girlfriend, Alice. Alice and I were just lazing around the house when she brought up the idea to go for a walk. At the time, it was 2 a.m., so I figured what was the worst that could happen. I didn't live in the middle of nowhere, but far enough in my little community that some people didn't even know there were houses towards the woods. We ventured out and were having fun when she turned to me and suggested, we should go in the woods. For three nights in a row, we could hear the screaming all throughout the night, and I thought that would be the last place she'd want to go. But we did anyway, my naivete telling me that this creature probably lived deeper in the woods than we were going to go. We set out, using our phone flashlights, giggling and holding each other's hands. We'd only been dating for a few months, so we were still in the honeymoon phase. I was enjoying myself. Overall, it was a perfect summer night. We walked far into the woods, and we soon found a clearing. Alice skipped to the middle of it and spun around with a smile. I had not yet stepped into the clearing when I got that uneasy sensation. I have terrible anxiety, so I brushed it off as Alice making me nervous. She giggled at me and said, Take a picture. I promptly took out a disposable camera and snapped a picture. I walked over towards her, tucking the camera in my hoodie pocket and holding her in a tight hug. Her head rested on mine since she was a little bit taller. She took a deep breath which made me look up at her and her looking down at me. I love you, she said with a smile. In that moment, I was so happy. My heart fluttered and I opened my mouth to say it back when, to the left of me, a voice spoke. I love you. It came in my girlfriend's exact tone, but it sounded so distorted. It felt as if my heart dropped right into my stomach. I could tell hers did too, as her smile disappeared. I looked towards the voice, and it felt as if my heart had tumbled out of my body and onto the forest floor. In the light of the full moon, this thing, a buck, stood just outside the clearing. But there was something wrong with it, all wrong. It stood on its hind legs like a man. Its lips had been curled back into a smile with rows and rows of sharp teeth, 
and a tongue hung out, dripping with saliva. That's when I realized the bird noises, the crickets in the forest had gone completely dead silent. The wind pushed towards the buck, which pushed the scent of decay away from us and further back. I pushed Alice behind me, like my five foot six self was going to do anything to protect her. I love you, Vina. It spoke and used the nickname Alice had given me. It stepped out into the clearing. It must have been seven feet tall. Its arms and legs were too long for its body, and its body didn't even look like it was alive. It was so skinny, to the point where the bones cut out through the skin of the deer. Alice screamed and took off in the other direction. This thing began to laugh as I hauled tail behind her. I had no flashlight, and it was beyond me how Alice took off without running into anything. But of course, I managed to faceplant into the forest floor. I looked up, tasting the blood from my nose, and as I was about to take off again, this thing grabbed the back of my hoodie and threw me backwards. The impact of me hitting the ground knocked the breath out of me, making me want to cry. I took in a shaky breath when it grabbed my leg and pulled me close. It stared at me and screamed in my face, I love you, Vina. I grabbed the nearest thing my arm could reach, which was apparently a rock, and I smacked it as hard as I could in the face. It seemed to howl, and it stumbled backwards. I took off as fast as I could to catch up with Alice. We must have run over a mile with this thing crashing through the woods behind us before we burst out of the woods and scrambled back into my house. We locked everything down behind us, turning on all the lights. She finally got a good look at my face and told me the blood from my nose covered half of my face and most of my neck. Blood from my knees and legs seeped through my jeans and out the rips. She told me she thought I was going to pass out on the spot but she did her best to clean and bandage me up. Alice and I just sat on my bed, not sure what to do after that. We didn't speak, not even when the dogs began to go crazy. Alice grabbed my hand as tightly as she could. The pain from my nose now gone, I could only feel the throbbing of my knees and legs. Something outside was tapping on the house and scurrying across the roof for hours. Eventually, Alice fell asleep, but I couldn't. Every noise made me jump. Every growl from the dogs made me want to soil myself. I felt so guilty. I knew what was in those woods, but I was just so wrapped up with Alice, I'd completely forgotten about how dangerous this thing could be. And it knew her voice now. It knew my nickname. I did not sleep the rest of that night, and at first light, I woke Alice up, and drove her back home, where we both passed out in her bed exhausted. Eventually, I went back home with Alice, and we stayed a few more nights, each night hearing that thing outside, screaming and running around. I'll never again underestimate what is in those woods. The Creature on the Battlefield From B. Dowd, 62 I'm a 19-year-old guy. This story happened on a national battlefield. To be specific, Prairie Grove Park in northern Arkansas, right in the Ozark Mountains. On an early December weekend, I and hundreds of others would participate in a reenactment of Prairie Grove, Arkansas. My group of friends were all around my age and would always try to have fun on these weekends, either going to a dance, drinking, or just walking around during scheduled times. It's a lot of fun. That weekend started as usual. Friday, everyone showed up and I met with all my friends. After we got dressed and formed into a battalion, we marched off to our camps. Nothing eventful happened Friday night. Many of us were just tired from driving so many miles. We were sleeping in big tents Friday night to keep warm from the icy winter winds. Saturday started off normally as well. We did a battle for the spectators, chilled around camp, and enjoyed ourselves. Come Saturday night, though, that's when my life would be on the verge of death. After our mock battle, they sent my battalion into picket, 
which is taking the post and watching for the enemy. When it was my company's turn for picket duty, it was around 1 a.m. This usually lasted about an hour and a half. My partner and I were stationed on the farthest end of our line of pickets. Our left side was unprotected. Around 30 minutes in, we began to hear footsteps to the left side of us. We gathered our rifles and kept alert for any enemy pickets. After 15-ish minutes, we didn't hear anything and we let our guards down to rest. I lit my pipe and I began to relax. Then, all of a sudden, we heard a scream coming from behind us. Then there was another scream in front of us. Something was running through the tall grass we were guarding. We could barely see what it was. What we could make out was this large, dog-looking shadow illuminated by moonlight. We called out to the other pickets to fall back to our officer, but before I could begin the return, a huge rock was thrown at my back from behind me. It hit me, and I fell down, the wind taken from my lungs. I could see my partner running while I gasped for air. As I looked over to where the rock could have come from, I was left frozen in fear. This seven-foot-tall black creature was standing in the tall grass in front of me. It was a pale, rugged thing with black eyes, a slit for nostrils, and a smile as big as its head. Its arms were far longer than they should have been for its size, and its claws were dripping wet with what appeared to be blood, and I could only imagine where that blood had come from. After a few very long seconds, it took a step forward. I gathered my mind and courage and reached for my rifle, hoping to defend myself with my bayonet. I stood up, legs trembling so badly I felt I was going to pass out. I ran and ran as fast as I could then, but I could hear that creature following behind me. With every step it took, it made loud, heavy thuds. I could feel this thing's breath on my neck too. Too scared to turn around, I kept running until I reached my company. I nearly cried when I got there from the adrenaline rush and terror. They were wondering what the heck was going on. Apparently, they didn't see or hear anything that was chasing me, but I was certain that I saw fear in my partner's eyes. That night, they didn't make anyone else go on picket duty. I didn't sleep that night either, scared that the creature would come back. I stayed close to the fire, not for warmth, but security. When dawn broke, I found that I had three six-inch long cuts in the back of my coat. After getting the courage to go back to the scene, with a few friends of course, we found a dead deer where I'd been stationed. It also had three long cuts going across its body. I decided then to just pack it up and leave. The drive back home was a silent drive. All I could think about was that creature. I didn't get much sleep the nights afterward too, putting a toll on my grades. I barely passed the semester due to sleep deprivation. I decided to take a six month long break from reenacting, just so I could gather my confidence to sleep outside again. I know one thing. I will never return to that reenactment ever again, fearing that what I met before will not be so merciful next time. Possible Wendigo in West Virginia From Anonymous I live with my aunt and uncle in Charleston, West Virginia. I had to move in with them for personal reasons. I live in a suburb with some forest around it, so not really near some big city. There's a creek that I like to walk to and fish in when the weather allows, so I know the place pretty well. This happened a couple of months ago, and it's the first time I've told this story to anyone outside my family. I'm part Cherokee, as my uncle, father, and grandmas tell me. My mother's side of the family isn't. I think this is what gave me my instinct 
to get away from whatever I saw that day. I had one of my cousins from my mother's side of my family come to visit me over the weekend. I was 14 and he was 8. He loved spending time with me. I'm like a big brother to him. That day I took him fishing down at the creek that I was just writing about and we walked quite a ways down to one of my favorite spots. We started fishing for about 10 minutes when I heard a stick snap far up into the forest behind us. I thought it was a deer or another small animal, so we just kept on fishing. A couple of minutes later, I hear another but bigger stick snap. This time I could tell it was a bit closer to us, but still far away enough that I didn't worry about it. I still thought it was a deer stepping on something or a squirrel knocking a branch off a tree. We continue to enjoy fishing. About another 10 to 15 minutes later, we both heard something that sounded like what I thought was a deer or buck call right behind us in the tree line. By then, we were both freaked out and started to pack up when I heard it again from right behind us. Then, this horrible stench hits us. It smelled like the rotten corpse of some animal. This is when I began to realize what this thing might be that was scaring us. I told my cousin we needed to get up and leave now in a firm tone that I usually don't use to speak to him with. We then heard it again, and I looked back, and I saw this dark, skinny, tall creature jumping down the hill behind a tree. What I saw had to have been around seven or eight feet tall with these huge hands and fingers. We took off then, straight up the bank in front of us, cutting straight through someone's yard and onto the main road. We walked about five minutes away to my little neighborhood home. We got inside and we told my aunt and uncle, who were sitting in the breezeway smoking. Of course, they didn't really believe us, so we went to my room. My cousin left the next day, and after that I swear I've seen that thing out my window once or twice. It was always in a bush, always far away in the field past my backyard. I believe what I saw that day may have been a windigo, and I haven't been back to that creek since. It comes when it rains, from just a simple username. This happened a few years ago. I am six foot one and pretty fit. I was taking my dog out at about 11.45 p.m. A light drizzle of rain was beginning to come down when all of a sudden I hear a strange sound. It was similar to the sound the apes made in the movie Planet of the Apes. Now I thought I was just hearing things. I live in Virginia. I know there are no monkeys out here. Finishing up, I brought my dog back inside quickly. I locked all the doors and closed the blinds just in case. Before long, I hit the pillow and I was fast asleep. At some point, I woke up. I checked my phone, which read 2.33. I was wondering what in the world woke me up. I looked over towards the glass door that leads to a small deck. It didn't have a blind, so when I looked out it, I saw this dark shape just perched on the deck rail. Now the deck was two stories up, and the deck hangs off the house, so I was then wondering how in the world this thing or person got up there. I looked away just for a moment, and when I looked back, I saw the bright yellow eyes of the thing. I couldn't make out any other features, except for the cloth-looking stuff around its waist. I swear the moment I blinked, it was gone. This takes me to the second day. There was no rain that day and nothing odd happened. Three days after that, a heavy rain had begun coming down. I was able to take my mind off that weird creature I saw. I left my blinds open that day and fell asleep on the couch. I suddenly woke up to a cracking noise. I had left the outdoor lights on. I looked at the window, and there it was again, that thing from before now trying to get inside. I got a much better look at this thing, and I thought the devil himself was coming to get me. It had gray, sagging skin, too loose for its own body, 
It was very thin and tall, ribs sticking out like a sore thumb. The eyes were bright yellow, and the odd thing about it was it had these sort of antlers protruding from the head and they had stuff hanging off of them. I looked at its body again. It looked decayed. Suddenly, it let out some kind of screech and it was gone again. When I went outside the next day, there in the mud were some human-looking footprints with coyote prints leading away. I wish I could say I never saw it again, but I did. About two weeks later, in the middle of the day, a light rain, much like the first time I saw it, came down. I spotted the thing again. It was standing in the field outside my house. Without a thought, I ran back inside, grabbing my 270 caliber rifle. I aimed at it and fired a single shot. I watched as that thing screamed that same god-awful noise, then went the other way. The day after that, I asked to stay with my parents until I found a new house, as I was definitely not renting that one anymore. I now live in Northern Virginia, and I've never had any problems since, but sometimes when I'm alone, I see those yellow eyes and hear the god-awful screech in the distance. If you live in the southeastern part of Virginia, I warn you, there's something that only hunts in the rain. Something Imitating Our Cows in the Fields From Anonymous I was at my grandfather's farm, which is on Native American land in Wisconsin. My dad had made jokes about the farm being an old Indian burial ground, which now I kind of believe. This supernatural thing I encountered that night heavily unsettled me, as now I know that past experiences my dad and uncle had with supposed wendigos and skinwalkers might be true. Now, on to what happened. I had just finished up shuffling corn silage into our blower, heading up to my dad's old square body truck to drive over to mine to work on it. I drove over there and got the treble light out, plugged it in and popped the hood on my truck. I just hung the treble light on my hood when I heard the cows bellowing. Now, I would have shaken this off as normal, but it was coming from the direction of our fields. I drove my dad's truck down to the barn to tell him. He then told me to go check the gates to see if the cows had ripped them down. But the gates were still up. I had the truck running with the lights on, and I shut it off. The same bellowing noises came from the fields, only now more distorted. Like it wasn't coming from cattle, it was coming from something trying to imitate the cows. It was too high pitch and almost sounded like it was crackling. I went ahead and drove my dad's truck back up to my truck. I put the light away and closed up the big steel shed my truck was next to. All the while, the sounds of those quote-unquote cows got more distorted, like some sort of unnatural animal both breathing and screaming very loudly. The bellows were happening in quick succession. This wasn't normal. Our cows never sounded like that. I was walking back to my dad's truck when I heard possibly the most unsettling sounds in about five seconds. From two different directions came two loud screams, not ear-piercing, but still plenty loud. Then, from the same direction that the cow sounds had come from, I heard coyotes howling. I bolted to the truck and hit the gas, not wanting to find out what could mimic cows and coyotes. I told my dad about it, and he asked what it was. I just told him I would tell him in the truck. Then he did what I didn't want him to do. He began to say, oh, skinwalker, a skinwalker. I yelled at him not to say its name. Eventually, we went back to the shed. Our farm yard isn't too big. From the shed where my truck is to the barn can't be more than 25 yards. But eventually, we went back up there with my grandpa's truck. Once there, my dad swapped the receiver hitch so we could hook it up to a kick bale wagon that my grandpa was going to bring back to our neighbors in the morning. I didn't want to be there much longer, so this didn't make anything at all better. Now, what makes everything about this story worse is that we have these stereotypical tall cornfields. It's good for business this year. They're probably 12 feet high in some places, 
but I hate the fact that something could be hiding in there so easily. I'm sorry if the writing was sloppy, but I'm really shaken up by this, and I'm probably not in the right headspace. If I encounter anything more regarding this, I'll let you know. Now, if you're still wondering about what my dad and uncle might have seen, I can tell you here. The story goes that it was the early 2000s. My dad and his older brother were out cutting firewood around late fall or early winter. It would get dark around that time, around 4.30 p.m. My uncle alerted my dad to something chasing deer across the field and on a hill. Whatever it was, it was gaining on the deer, and according to my dad, it looked half wolf and half ape. So yeah, that's that. Not sure if that would be a wendigo or a skinwalker. The worst part about all this is that the cows were up near our cow yard, which was near the fields, and to me it seemed like something was out there, trying to communicate with them, trying to lure one or more away. Our cows aren't allowed out in our fields either, so this really scared me, and while writing this, I just heard breathing through my AC in my room. So, yeah... Maybe I'll just go cry now. The Wenchuge and the Wendigo From Sea Spirit 81 I'm Native American. I've lived on a reservation my entire life. The res is surrounded by a thick blanket of pine trees, but after the first few meters, it thins out. Normally, the forest is bustling with hunters, trappers, and the occasional hiker, but the elders of the res forbid anyone from staying in there past dark. Of course, no one actually enforces the rule. It's just like a superstition. There are a lot of superstitions around the res, but this is the most prominent. Around winter break of my senior year, me and my friends had snuck out to do what teens do. Be way too loud and drink enough alcohol to clean out a full-body paper cut. It was me and my two buddies. Let's call them J and B. Me, J, and B were hanging out by an old rusty pickup that had been there since before we were born. It had broken down on the edge of the res and had been there ever since. We were having a philosophical conversation about the passage of time, since our adolescence was almost over, and soon we would spout into responsibility. We had nearly polished off the bottle when, out of nowhere, a squad car of all things began to round the corner. Now, we were 18, which is one year away from legal drinking age in Canada, so naturally, we took off. We ran straight through the woods. I wasn't thinking about the warnings that had been drilled into me since childhood. I was thinking about what my dad would do to me if he found out what I was doing out here. While I tried to keep track of my surroundings, and not throw up at the same time. I quickly lost track of B and J. I stopped in a clearing, grabbing my knees to catch my breath. In between gasps, I let out an audible, dang it. While my eyes adjusted to the newfound darkness, I tried to look around to see where I was. Suddenly, it hit me. Reality set back in. I was in the woods, in the dark, halfway to passing out, and based on my surroundings, I was lost. I'd run track in high school, and although I never got any medals, I was still pretty darn fast. But even in my intoxicated state, I knew that I should not have been able to run out of sight from the res. Just as that sobering reality set in, I heard something that made my nausea worse. From maybe 30 feet next to me, in the brush, I heard my own voice, but it wasn't exactly me, if that makes sense. It was more like I was talking through static. Something out there had repeated my words. Dang it, dang it. Just as it said that, the forest was met with complete silence. I stood there, shocked. I thought, or rather hoped, it was just one of my friends, but that thought was quickly extinguished when the thing repeated. Dang it exactly as it had before. I didn't think about running. I knew that if I did, this thing would chase me. At least, that's what I thought it would do. But what happened next was much worse. A large bunch began to shake violently, and all I could do was watch from my petrified state as the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life stepped out of the brush. 
It stood nearly nine feet tall. It was deathly thin and seemed to be rotting. Its body was covered in matted patches of fur, its legs bent backwards like a goat. When my eyes met its head, I nearly soiled myself. Its head was similar to a deer skull, but instead it held flaming yellow eyes and teeth sharpened to a point. As this monster slowly lumbered towards me, I tried desperately to run, but my body remained frozen. I never did understand how a person could be frozen in fear until that very moment. The thing was only a few feet away, my life flashing before my eyes, tears dropping from my face with each terrible slow step the beast took. Suddenly, a flash of white. The monster was no longer in front of me. It took me a second to even realize the thing was gone, but when I did, I looked over to see where it was. Now it was lying on the ground, and on top of it was what looked to be a pale man. At least I thought it was a man. What I saw had ungodly pale skin, thin ribs, and stretched limbs. The thing on top the creature's chest was clawing and kicking and screaming at it. God, that screaming. It echoed throughout the woods. It only took about four seconds of that screaming before my motor skills finally came back to me. My mind was screaming at me to run. It didn't matter where, just away from these two abominations in front of me. I ran for 20 minutes straight without stopping until I came to the highway that led to the reservation. And once I got there, I threw up on the pavement. It took another 10 minutes to walk to the res, and the entire time I was terrified that those things would come back. When I got home, I realized I'd lost my keys. So I banged on the door until my dad came to answer it. I must have smelled pretty bad, because the first thing he did wasn't punish me. Instead, he looked concerned and asked what had happened. I was too tired, so I just passed out on the couch. When I woke up, I finally explained myself with a lie, telling him some bogus story about a bear. There is a bit of an epilogue to this story. A few days later, I asked around. I had questions that needed to be answered. I asked about who I should talk to for spiritual guidance. Everywhere I went, I was pointed to one lady, an elder in the center of town. I came to her and we spoke in her living room. I asked her about the things I saw, and this is what she said. She told me of the Wendigo and the Wechuge, two spirits similar in nature. The Wendigo is a spirit that can take over your body when you partake in the eating of your own kind. It will turn you into a ferocious creature that craves nothing more than raw flesh. A Wendigo's skin is said to be resilient they can mimic voices almost perfectly, but they're ruthless and cunning. A Wendigo will do anything to get its prey, except compromise its hidden nature. A Wechuge is a spirit of vengeance. When a weak person becomes strong and uses his strength to pick on the weak, they will become susceptible to the Wechuge. This will turn them into a deer-skulled, goat-legged creature, which lives to humiliate. They look to kill people in humiliating ways, like mocking them with their staticky voices or using their claws to mark their body. Wachuge have weak skin but heal quickly. They will always eat a portion of their victims as a sign of dominance, but their host can still be persuaded. Whereas when a Wendigo takes over, it can control the victim in whole. But even if you can reason with a Wachuge sometimes, they're not likely to listen. When the elder finished telling me this, I asked, which do you think won? And she told me this, both are fast, strong, and cunning, but the Wendigo is more so. A Wachuge's wrath is no match for the hunger of a Wendigo. I was a skeptic. From Sanderson 550. I recently started backpacking, but the adventure got stale. Not that I didn't have fun with it, but it just stopped scratching that itch. Soon I found out about stealth camping. That was more promising. Note from the narrator here, stealth camping is where you camp outside of designated camping areas, 
sometimes in places where you're not allowed to be camping and without permission. Anyway, back to the story. After a few stealth camps under my belt, and all my friends being impressed by my latest cemetery campouts, I knew I was on to something. One night after leaving the bar, I decided to sneak down to an area owned by the city. It was part of a park near the river. My plan was simple. Hike down to the park, move toward the river, find a clear spot, and set up my bivy for the night, and leave before dawn. So far, everything was going as planned. I curled up in my sleeping bag and looked at the sky. It was a perfect night. No one knew where I was. I felt so free. Before long, I was dozing off to the music of crickets, frogs, and cicadas. At some point, I woke up. Nature was calling, but then something else actually called out. Steve. Someone had said my name. But who and why? No one knew I was here, as I said before. If anyone needed me, they would have texted my phone or called me. I ignored it while I took care of business. Then again, a voice not quite male and not quite female, but just enough to confuse me, called out again. Steve. My mind raced back to all the stories I've been told. Then a certain lesson I'd been told as a child took hold of me. I acted accordingly to that old rule to never answer if something calls your name in the woods. It made sense now. Years of mockery have now faced me. Years of laughing at superstition have now offered me hope. Years of hearing how to deal with the unnamed that calls you in the night would save me. I obeyed what the elders of my youth instructed. I did not answer those calls. I ignored them as best I could. I crawled back into my sleeping bag and bivy and held on until dawn. Eventually, I heard crows and I saw daylight. I crawled out and packed up and got the heck out of there. I now believe. Don't go in the woods at night. Don't whistle at night. Don't answer if it calls your name and never speak its name. I only needed to obey one of these rules this time. I added the rest for those who might mock but need them later, just as I did. I don't think that's a deer. From C. Philly 100. My buddy and I were out hiking around the Estes Park, Rocky Mountain National Park area with his two daughters. It was very close to Twin Owls, if you know where that is. We were having a great time, even though the girls kept insisting to stop and draw on the dirt. It was a bit icy, so I had to put his youngest up on my shoulders at one point, and then I almost slipped, which would have been catastrophic, but luckily I didn't. So we continued on our way. The sun was starting to go down, and we figured we'd better head back down to the trailhead. My head was on a swivel, looking for cougars, which are quite common in the area, and we did have two little girls with us after all. I noticed a pair of rather large antlers peeking out from behind a tree, and I had to do a double take, because these antlers were at least 15 feet off the ground, much too high for any kind of deer or even elk. Almost as soon as I noticed them, it snapped its head in our direction, and I could see something was off about this creature. It didn't appear to have any eyes, just two solid black pits where the eyes should be, and the skin seemed to be peeling off around the empty eye sockets. Its lower jaw was hanging down, and it had teeth like those of a canid, long and sharp and somewhat yellowed. I nudged my friend, not wanting to alarm his daughters, nodding in the direction of that thing. He looked over too, then gasped. Then the girls screamed. Just then, it wrapped one of its arms. Yes, this thing had freaking arms around the tree it was standing next to, and it actually broke the tree in half before taking a jolting step forward, revealing a leg that reminded me of a giant jackrabbit. It brought its hands around to the front, similar to a praying mantis, with long slender digits ending in short black claws. The other weird thing was it had brownish fur and patches, but its flesh was very droopy, even hanging off in sections. 
and had a rank odor too. I watched the creature swell up its chest before letting out the most god-awful scream I've ever heard. We grabbed the girls and began to run. I could see that thing in my peripheral running alongside us about 20 yards to our left. It looked to be almost galloping and it was incredibly fast due to its massive size. We soon hit a snowfield and slid down, putting a bit of distance between us and that abomination. My friend's eldest daughter had twisted her ankle in the fall, and she was grimacing in pain. We started to hear then a low whistling sound, almost like when the wind passes over an empty glass bottle. The sound filled our ears and seemed to drown out everything else around us. Then there was a loud shriek, and that thing went flying over us, landing with a thud down in the clearing below before turning and rearing up to its full size. At that point, I'm not ashamed to say I think I might have just soiled myself, and we all screamed. It looked at us before slowly walking towards us, still holding its hands in that creepy praying mantis position. Even if I had a gun, I don't think it would have made a difference. This thing was easily a solid four or five hundred pounds or more, a true apex predator. It let out a low and guttural growl and I felt paralyzed from fear. People talk about infrasound as a hunting technique utilized by large cats to subdue their prey, and honestly, it felt a lot like that. It walked right up to us, and I nearly puked just from the smell. The creature sniffed the air around us. None of us could move a muscle. We were caught like deer in the headlights, unable to move, unable to utter a sound, unable to even breathe. It reached out one of its long, bony fingers toward my friend's youngest daughter, and I swear I thought I heard the thing whisper, She's perfect. In that moment, something must have snapped in my friend, because he went into action swiping the thing's hand away from his daughter before grabbing onto its antlers and yanking them to the side, which didn't do much, but it did crack one of the antlers in half. I grabbed the girls, and we were able to slip around to the side, while it let out an evil hiss and swiped at my buddy. But he was quick and darted under its arm, stabbing it in the ribcage with the broken antler shard. I heard the thing scream, and we ran for our lives, because, well, our lives depended on it. This time, I had his eldest up on my shoulders. She was around eight or nine at the time, so not super heavy, and with my adrenaline pumping, it felt like nothing. I looked back and saw my buddy running behind us. He swooped up his youngest, and we made a mad dash for the vehicle, which was now thankfully in sight. We got to the car, putting the girls in the back, and hastily strapping his youngest into her car seat before jumping in and revving the engine. It took me a moment to realize we were still in park. I cranked it into gear and threw up a wave of dirt and pebbles peeling out of there. The girls were sobbing and, honestly, I felt like crying myself. We got down to Estes and called 911, but of course no one believed us. They thought it was just a prank call. Not wanting to get in trouble for calling the emergency line again, we drove all the way back down to Boulder before stopping to let the girls go to the bathroom. I'm still processing all of this, even though it happened over two years ago. But whatever that thing was, it wasn't a deer. The Thing Behind My Greenhouse From Jude W. This happened in the autumn season of 2019. Now in the living room of our house, we have our couches set against a big window, facing away from it. When you open the back door, the first thing you see is an old carport, about 30 feet in front of the door. Then off across your left is a small greenhouse about 50 feet away from the house, there's a juvenile oak tree about five feet behind that greenhouse. The house is old and small, as are the windows, so we can hear mostly everything that goes on outside. It's not very pleasant, truth be told, but we make do. My mother and I were sitting on the couch one evening. It was about nine o'clock at night. I was on my phone, and my mom was watching TV. Since it was autumn, all the leaves from the trees had fallen onto the ground. 
we have a 25,000 square foot yard and the most trees on the entire block, so the grass was almost blocked out by the sheer amount of leaves we had. So we're just sitting down, minding our own business, when we begin to hear the leaves rustling about. I don't think too much of it at first. After all, where we live is a pretty windy place. Then, clear as day, I hear running. Something with two legs was running through the leaves at an alarming pace. I looked at my mom to be sure I wasn't imagining things, and sure enough, she looked horrified. Now, she's an incredibly tough woman who fears nothing but to see her looking scared. That scared me more than the thing outside. I grabbed a knife, and my mom grabbed her gun. We opened up the back door and turned on the porch light. Nothing, just pitch black. All our trees hide any form of light. We stepped outside and looked around us, using whatever light our phones allowed. While we could see the outline of the greenhouse, no details were really visible. I then began to hear an owl, which is incredibly bizarre because of where we live. There aren't any owls here. We live in a somewhat urban neighborhood. The closer I listened to it, the more fake this owl sounded. It was more like a man trying to sound like an owl, saying, Woo! over and over. I asked my mom, are you hearing that owl? I never got an answer, because right before she opened her mouth to speak, we heard a slow and menacing knock coming from our greenhouse. It wasn't a fast knock. No, it was a taunting knock. Whoever was watching us wanted us to know it sees us. Knock, knock, knock. My mom pointed her gun to the greenhouse but our phone lights let us see nothing. We weren't going to dare get close to the greenhouse. That hoo-hoo-hooing continued, slower this time. Every minute or so, we would hear it. My mom goes to pull the truck into the yard to shine the headlights at the greenhouse and illuminate whatever was here with us. That entire time, I never took my eyes off the greenhouse. I was looking for any form of movement, but still, nothing. Knock, 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 it continued. Soon my mom pulled in the truck and turned on the brights. When my mother used to be fuming angry with me, she would yell and get this smile, an evil twisted smile, like it was saying, I'm gonna tear you apart. Well, my mother opened the truck door and leaned out just enough so she could point her gun at the greenhouse. When I saw her, she had that smile. I heard the owl again, and I asked once more, Mom, do you hear that owl? This time, she responded, the smile dropping from her face, never breaking her gaze off the greenhouse. Jude, that's not an owl. That's someone trying to scare you. That sentence sent chills down my spine. I started to cry. I ran inside and called my friend, tears streaming down my face. I wanted to call her and tell her goodbye because I was convinced that whatever was in our yard had horrible intentions and that I'd never see her again. I told her what happened and she told me to breathe. She tried to calm me down but to no avail. I then heard my mom call my name, so I told her goodbye and hung up, even though my friend was yelling at me not to go. I went back outside. My mom says the cops are on their way and she needs to put the gun up. I told her that I'd stay outside to keep watch. We both made the mistake of taking our eyes off the greenhouse. When she went inside, I looked over at the greenhouse. That's when I was greeted by a gray figure peering at me. It was a solid seven feet tall at least, because it was as tall or taller than the greenhouse itself. It was standing behind the greenhouse, but in front of the oak tree. Its arms are what I remember most. They were so insanely long. There were no other features, no face, no distinctions in the body other than it being tall and gray. I looked at it, and I had to do a double take. By the time I looked again, it was gone, and so was the knocking and those hooing sounds. All of it gone, just like that. The cops arrived not too long afterwards. Two cops go to the greenhouse, guns out. 
One of them goes inside the greenhouse and the other one checks around it. But nothing was found. No footprints in the leaves, no signs of life. They rolled it out as maybe a possum or raccoon. I didn't dare tell them about it. I know what I saw. People don't believe me. And if you don't, that's fine. It doesn't matter to me because I know it's true. I've done research about Wendigos and skinwalkers, but I don't know if it can be one of those because we live in an urban area. I've never seen it again. I've experienced things that aren't related to this, but I've never seen such a monster again in my life. I hope by the end of this, you realize that there are things in this world we don't understand. And to tell you the truth, I wish I never knew. There are monsters in Yosemite National Park. From Adam. There were fires in Yosemite National Park here in California on June 26, 2022. They were the Washburn fires that spread quickly. These fires revealed something that science cannot explain. I am a firefighter, and during the fires earlier this year in California, a lot of rescue crews were called to help. I swear on everything I hold dear to me that there has to be some sort of monster or monsters in that national park. Myself and three other firefighters saw something that changed our lives. Two days before we got sent to deal with the Washburn forest fires, our captain told us that they needed volunteers and that our department was able to send four of us. That would be me, J, E, and S. I went home and told my wife what was going on, that I had to leave to help out with the Washburn fires. At 3.30 a.m. on June 26th, I was awakened by a call from S. Yeah, what is it? I said. S replied, Hey Adam, I know it's early, but we've been asked to come leave ASAP. Seems the fire is spreading pretty fast, and the crews there need help towards the northern side of the fire. I told him I'd meet him at E's place. He said he'd already called Jay, that Jay was already on his way to my house. I got up and told my wife what's going on. She didn't say anything, she just looked at me, concerned. Finally, after about a minute of silence, she said, I love you, please be careful. I replied, I love you too, don't worry, I'm gonna be fine. I truly believed that. Being a firefighter for almost six years, I learned a thing or two. I got ready and set my bag by the door. I started to make myself a cup of coffee when my phone notification went off. It was Jay. Said he'd be pulling up in a minute. I looked out the kitchen window and I saw Jay pulling up in the front yard. I met him at the door and invited him inside, asking if he'd like a cup of coffee, but he declined, saying he had some in the truck as well as several packs of Red Bull. We set off then, meeting at E's place, where we loaded up into two trucks packed with all of our gear. Living in California, if you don't know, it's hot during the summer and at that time in the morning it was about 77 degrees, but during the day away from the fire it was about 103. We drove for two hours and by then we got pretty close to base camp when we saw some animals running away from the fires off to the side of the road. He said over the radio from the other truck that we needed to slow down to avoid hitting any deer or something else. Jay responded, you're only cautious because you don't have insurance. We laughed and carried on more cautiously. By the time we made it to base camp, we could see the hillside glowing in the distance. We saw rescue crews pulled over on the side of the road. We stopped and asked about the situation. One of them said he had to pull the camp farther back due to how much smoke was coming through. Crews were coming down there, setting up a new camp here. We put the hazard lights on, pulling off next to the other unit. A few minutes later, about 18 more units showed up. That's a lot of people trying to get control over this blaze, which was now quite close to a small town and some homes. Another two units kept going past us. The captain commented that the campers who had been found were alive, but they had inhaled a lot of smoke and were suffering from dehydration. One of them had mild burns. We got geared up, checked our masks and tanks, got our axes ready, and were given a starting position. 
Now, controlling the spread of fires and keeping a lookout for all of your men and other people is trouble. Fighting this blaze went on for weeks, rotating crews and six-hour shifts. This fire was massive when we got there in the beginning, and it was only about 20% contained. We got a call that one of the civilians at the Southgate Brewing Company reported that they had a younger brother, who had not been heard from in a couple of hours, that he was supposed to be back at his cabin. Our unit was the closest to it, so we went to check it out. That call came on July 2nd. S and I had gotten our things ready, and he was almost done sharpening our axes since we have to keep them well maintained in these situations. Jay was getting the location of the cabin while he and the captain marked a route, trying to figure out the best way possible at the moment. We left about half an hour later. We took the ATVs that were available to use, and we made our way to the location of the cabin. On the way there, we saw other crews working and the sound of helicopters overhead. An hour into our search and rescue, we found the cabin, covered with fire retardant from helicopters flying above. Even so, it had some fire damage. E notified base camp that we found the cabin and gave them a description. Over our radios, we heard base camp give us the okay to search, but to be cautious of the structure, they let us know that another unit was heading our way to provide support. J and S checked the sides to make sure we could enter, but E already went in like an idiot. Worried about E, I followed him instead of waiting. We went inside. It was smoky still, but what was much worse was the body we found. It was burned, but it looked like it had been torn into first. We stood there horrified. Jay said, what the heck happened here? S was walking around, checking, and suddenly a loud crash was heard. We looked back. S was gone. We scrambled to where we saw him last. We heard him yell and looked around. His cries seemed to be coming from a crawl space trap door kind of thing on the cabin. S yelled up at us to get a rope because his ankle had been broken. Now a lot of people might assume a 5 foot drop like that wouldn't be dangerous, but our gear weighs between 70 and 80 pounds on a normal day, and during large fires it could contain an extra 20 pounds. Jay asked S if he could stand up. He tried. He was able to get up and lie against the wall. E tossed the rope down to him. As he was wrapping the rope around himself, he looked up at us and began to laugh. He joked, saying at least the axe didn't go up his butt. We laughed, but carefully got him out. J and E got him to the door. I went and pulled the ATV around close to him, and I got him on board. E checked his foot. No blood, which was a good sign, but his foot was swelling up like a balloon. J volunteered to take him back to base, and we agreed. E told me to grab a camera off the ATV to take photos of the scene because of the body inside. We finished up, called it in, relaying all the information back to camp. The captain told us the unit coming to help us had to be turned around and that we needed to head back ourselves, but we weren't finished with the scene yet. By the time we were done there, we realized it was mid-afternoon. E went back inside at one point, slowly walking in so as to not disturb anything of the scene. Then he called me inside. I went in and saw him pointing his flashlight into the hole in the floor. Look, animal tracks. They look like dog prints, but a lot bigger. Now, I was assuming it was a big dog. I didn't really believe in any sort of supernatural stuff. We left that cabin, and standing there right next to our ATVs, we saw something. There was this tall dog-looking thing, or perhaps some weird bear. I don't know what it was exactly, but when I saw it, I just stood there, frozen in shock. Then I was yanked backwards. I hit my back in the floor. E slammed the door shut, well, what was left of it, and he slid the charred couch and dresser in front of the door. I tried to ask what he was doing, but he put his hand to my mouth and glared at me, as if to say, quiet. Now, E is ex-military. He'd been in the army for eight years. I've never seen this man show an ounce of fear, but there he was, pale white. He looked how I felt. He began to look around, axe in hand. 
He checked the three windows without touching them, but the one that was broken he covered with a small end table that he stuffed quietly to the frame of it. We both looked at each other then, not saying a word. Then we both remembered there was a massive hole in the floor. We looked around, then had an idea. We flipped the kitchen table onto its top, then slid it over the hole. We were thankful it was big enough to cover it. I whispered over to E. We're gonna have to leave soon. But he told me to simply listen. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. He shushed me and said listen again. What? All I hear is the wind and fire. Exactly. Something that big out there has not made a single noise. We called the captain up on the radio. We said we were stuck in the structure as it collapsed and we needed evacuation. We heard them say that Metaflight was on its way. We let them know to be cautious as a frightened bear was in our vicinity. The captain acknowledged that information. You think we can make it to the ATVs? I asked E. He paused before he said anything and he looked at me. I'm not sure. Did you see that thing's hands or paws or whatever the heck it had? No, no I didn't. I just saw its face. You think it's some idiot in a ghillie suit? No way that was a person. Too big. Those who know how tall ATVs are, this thing's knees were about the height of the handlebars. Outside, it looked as if it was getting dark out. In reality, I think the winds had shifted and smoke began to push towards us. We knew we'd be in trouble soon. Plus, we had less than an hour of air in our tanks. The timer on our watches began to sound. Suddenly, the back wall where the bathroom was at sounded like someone was kicking a bass drum as hard as they could, just louder. We shot straight up, axes in hand. Then, even through our helmets, we could hear this deep growl. There was such bass to it. We could feel it in our chests. We were only a few feet from this thing, and all that stood between it and us was a weak door. Adrenaline and fear coursed through my body. We heard the helicopter coming closer. E spoke. We need to move closer to the door, now. We rushed to the door. I pushed the small couch out of the way as E knocked the shelf out of the way too. We pulled the door open. Then, as we did, the table over the hole flew straight up and this brown furred creature stood up there. It was waist high from the hole. The two of us ran out, shutting the door hard behind us. Metaflight was just overhead. They lowered a rope ladder. We quickly scrambled to it and climbed as fast as we could. Finally, after forever of climbing, we were inside the helicopter, gasping for air. He looked at me. We, we made it. I looked over at one of the medics on board. Then E told the pilot to wait. He grabbed a flare camera, and through the infrared, he grew pale. I could tell even through his dirty face. Get us out of here, he shouted. He sat back down. I could see tears making a clear path along his soot-covered face. We made it back to base, where Jay met us when we landed. He went with us to get checked out. He asked what happened. I said the building fell on us. While we rested in the medical tent, I looked over at E. What did you see through the camera? Slowly, he looked up at me, and he said simply, Six. More tears fell down his face. It took me a second to understand what he was saying. We had been surrounded. There were six of those things around and in the cabin. We were both flown to the nearest hospital, where we had to stay for a few days. After that, we were cleared to come back, and I didn't mind, but only if it meant helping out at the edges to stop the progression of the fire. On August 22nd, weeks later, they finally got it under control. Soon after that, E resigned, getting a job working as security. A few weeks back, at the beginning of October, E and I told S and J what really happened. J midway through his drink, coughed and sped out his beer. <laughs> really? <clears throat> about four days before the fire, we found a group of six by a small pond about two miles away from the cabin. They all appeared normal, but they gave off this weird vibe. They refused treatment, 
said they'd only been in the area because their car broke down. Funny enough, we didn't find any cars, nothing of the sort on the service roads. All six of them were big guys too, about six foot four and easily over 230 pounds. I asked, could you recognize them if you saw them again? Oh yeah, you don't forget these kinds of people. They made me want to leave them there and never come back. Then he spoke up. I understand that feeling. I work with a big guy, a security guard like me. Makes me feel uneasy, like I need to get away from him. S laughed. Hey Jay, that's probably one of your werewolf friends. I laughed, tossing my empty beer bottle back into the box to grab another. Hey, Adam. He said. I looked up at him and said, What's up? He pointed his bottle towards a green pickup truck that was pulling in down the street. Uh, what about it? Well, that's the truck the guy at work drives, but the owner said he was on vacation, or hunting or something. We all looked up at the truck. A large man was just getting out. We all laughed. S said, let's invite him in for a beer. The sun was setting, and we all began getting ready to leave S's place. We put the chairs back in the garage, picking up the bottles from his driveway. As Jay was walking to his truck, the guy with the green truck at the house at the end of the street got into his truck and began heading down the road. He slowed down and pulled right up next to E's window while he was sitting in his car. Hey, ain't you the new guy at work? E replied, uh, yeah? Pretty chill job, ain't it? I'll catch you later. He then drove off in that green Dodge pickup, and all I could think about was how dirty that truck looked. I looked over at Jay and he stood there staring straight at the truck. I asked if he was alright. Did you have too much to drink, buddy? I added, trying to be funny. He looked straight at me. Adam, that was one of the guys I was telling you about. Monster in the Woods from Anonymous. I was 13 years old back then. I lived in a medium-sized town close to a forest preserve, about two minutes away from us. My family and I often walked down those trails. They curve up and down every which way, so it can be difficult in spots to see up ahead very far. It was October, but there were still leaves on the trees, one day after school, I came home and put my bag down on the ground. I went into the kitchen, which overlooks the backyard. In the backyard, I saw something strange. There was this animal the size of a grown man on the ground. It was about 10 feet away from me. Even though it was still quite bright out, the creature was pitch black. It seemed like a shadow had peeled itself off the ground and crouched down. All my breath was taken from my lungs, and I just stood there. Eventually, it looked at me and froze, its black eyes drilling into my soul. Then it stood up, revealing legs. They were unnaturally long, and with impossible speed, it ran towards our fence and jumped right over. I was so shocked, I just stood there, with a terrified expression on my face. Eventually, I broke out of my shock. Being the ignorant teenager I was, I ran outside onto the street, looking both ways. On the left, I saw it again. It saw me as well and ran down the street. It ran down the path to the forest preserve, and I followed it. Walking down the path, I noticed something weird. It was quiet, and I mean like it was absolutely silent. No bugs, nothing. I was slightly weirded out by this, but kept on walking down the path. About halfway down, I saw it again. That thing was standing there over a dead deer in the middle of the trail. Again, I found myself unable to move. Once more, it spotted me. It then let out the loudest, most ear-splitting screech I've ever heard and began running towards me. I began to run back faster than I'd ever run before. Maybe it didn't want to catch me. Maybe adrenaline can do some pretty fascinating things. If 
but I managed to make it home, slamming the door behind me and collapsing on the couch. I was both exhausted and terrified. I could hear it walking outside for some time before finally leaving. When my mom got home, I didn't tell her about this, knowing that she wouldn't believe me. I didn't tell anyone else either. For now, I haven't seen it again. Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets. My friend's dog saved our lives. From Anonymous. One year, around mid-September and early October, I went to visit a friend of mine who lived in Oregon, basically up in the middle of nowhere, where it's really all trees, trees, and more trees. For security reasons, I'll call him Tom. Tom lived alone with his dog, a pit bull named Nemesis. Despite his breed, he was a very kind and charming dog. I lived in California, so the drive up to Oregon was a pain but I've known Tom since kindergarten. I would do anything for him, considering him my best friend, and I knew he would have done anything for me. Anyway, I eventually make it to his little cabin. It's not the best in its class of cabins, just a small two-bedroom place with a living room and a small kitchen. When I first stepped out of my car, I noticed a couple of things. First, it was awfully silent, like you could hear a pin drop silent. Second, the moment I entered those woods, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched or even being followed. I greeted him at the cabin door. We talked about how we were and played with Nemesis a bit. We hung out until the early hours of the morning, which was around three. After that, Tom showed me where I was staying. I unpacked my things and got into my sleep attire and went to bed. Only about an hour later, I began to hear noises outside. I couldn't make out what it was exactly, but as I got up, I heard a faint scream, followed by what sounded like a screech and a woman screaming at the same time. Instantly, I jumped out of bed and opened the window next to my bed a bit. I listened for about two minutes straight, but by then, there was nothing but silence. I sat there looking at the window, thinking I was tired or just hearing things. In that moment, as I was reaching for the window to shut it, I heard it, a girl screaming for help, followed by that screech scream sound coming from the woods outside. Right away, I ran to the door, swinging it open to be greeted by my friend and nemesis. Did you hear that, Tom? I asked. Yeah, yeah, I did. Let's go check it out, see what the heck is going on. I was about to take off when Tom said, Wait, we shouldn't go out there unarmed. You can never be too sure. He then ran over to his chest, opening it to pull out a small pistol. He handed it to me, and he took his 22 LR. The screaming and screeching was getting louder and louder. Together, we bolted toward the origin of the noises. When we came within about 50 feet of the woods, I shouted, Hello? Hello? Anyone out there? And as if to answer me, the cry for help came again. Follow our voices! Tom shouted. Several seconds more of us shouting back, we made out a figure of a girl running through the brush and trees. As she got closer, we could tell that her clothes were all torn up. She had blood on her arm, back, legs, and her abdomen. When she saw us, she had a startled look on her face, but she ran even faster towards us. When she got to us, she didn't slow down and practically crashed into me, knocking us into the ground. Tom then shouted, What the heck is that? As I lifted my head above the girl's shoulder, I saw this thing. It was charging at us on all fours. As it moved, it gave off this squishy sound like when you get your shoes wet and step in them. The creature itself was very skinny, but what really stood out to me were its eyes. They were a bright, fiery red. Tom, run! Tom, run. I shouted at Tom as I picked up the now weakened girl. We made a mad dash back to the cabin. Tom ran in front of us, the girl constantly shouting to hurry. 
Here and there, Tom shot at the thing. I think some of the shots connected, because a couple of times when he fired, it responded with a screech, something that sound pained. Even so, it was getting closer and closer to us. We were nearly to the front door. In that instant, I turned around to see if it was following us, and I saw that creature in more detail. Though it was skinny, it was still huge. Not like bulky, but long. Its skin was all fleshy with patches of hair. Its hands were too long, ending in sharp points. I wasn't watching my footing, and I was a bit startled by that thing's appearance. My foot ended up getting caught on something. I fell with a girl to the ground. I pulled the pistol from my pants and readied myself, but no matter what we did, it was like there was no stopping this thing. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Nemesis come out of the door and charge at the creature. Nemesis jumped, biting the thing on its forearm. The creature cried out in pain, and it turned its attention to Nemesis. Then the dog ran into the woods, the creature on its tail. Soon after, there was nothing but silence again. We got inside the cabin, locking everything up. Then we tended to the girl's injuries. By then, she was unconscious. We put the girl in my room. Tom and I stayed in the living room, waiting for Nemesis to come back. Or, in the worst case scenario, that creature. By 10 a.m., there was no sign of Nemesis. Tom went out with his gun in the direction Nemesis had run off to, and I stayed at the cabin with that girl. About two hours after Tom left, the girl came too. She told me that she had gone outside to see why her dogs were whining. When she stepped outside, that creature began chasing her. She ran through the woods, trying to lose it, and that's when she found us. Branches and brush from the forest apparently cut her up real bad. Not long after the girl told me her story, Tom came back. Nemesis, our hero didn't make it through the night. He lay lifeless in Tom's arms. We buried him that day. I know if it wasn't for Nemesis, I wouldn't be here to tell the story, nor would that girl. But one thing is on my mind to this day. What even was that thing? The Thing Under the Light From Corey C. I live in Ogden, Utah. This took place just a little south of that. About a year back, I was hanging out with some of my friends. I was at a youth activity thing for my church, and our bishop wanted us to go to a park to play night games. After a couple of hours of fun, it was time for us all to leave, and before I left, I had to use the restroom. As I walked over to the bathrooms toward the door, I gave it a yank only to discover it was locked. So as any young man would do, I made the best of the situation. I went over to the side of the building. Just as I was about to zip up, the motion lights across the building just turned on. I knew it wasn't me that set them off. What I saw under the light was the most disturbing thing. A tall and slender creature, about three quarters of the way up the tall light, as I stared at this thing, I noticed its eyes, or lack thereof. Where I assumed its eyes would be were just black pits. I couldn't move, I was so scared, but also I felt curious. Then I watched as the creature beckoned me towards it, yet it didn't seem like it wanted to move towards me. It just wanted me to go to it. At this point, after I was done silently freaking out, I was finally able to move. Instead of going towards it though, I turned and ran as fast as I could, making my way back to my friend's car. When I got there, they saw I was visibly upset. I slammed the door shut, demanding we leave the park as soon as possible. Once we made it back to the church, they attempted to calm me down, but they were not successful. They decided to take me to my parents, who stayed up with me all night as I cried. All I know is if that light hadn't turned on, 
that thing could have gotten me, and I never would have saw it coming. The Night the Creature Came Home From Michael J.R.D. I once saw a shape-shifting type of cryptid creature when I was about 12 years old in my hometown in Northern California. Upon years of research and listening to stories that were similar, I believe it most correlates with the description of a wendigo or skinwalker. I'm still not sure what it was or whether or not there is a difference. I was out with one of my two brothers at a friend's house, not too far from the local college on the southern side of the woods, which spans many square miles. I'd go to the same friend's house pretty frequently around that time. Usually, I'd get a ride over there after school, and we'd all go skateboarding around the town or just go to the mall and hang out, meeting up with people and playing skate, which is like horse but with skateboard tricks. Afterwards, we'd skate our boards back to the friend's house, and I would usually get picked up around nightfall or soon after. Well, something followed our family vehicle home from that wooded area around the friend's house one night. I first noticed this thing jumping from tree to tree in pursuit of our truck as we headed down a long and dark road. At some point, after a few miles of pursuit, it vanished from sight, and I didn't see it until hours later after getting back home. Later that night, I needed my mother for something. I couldn't find her, so I went out the back door to see if she was there. And then, that's when I heard it. Whatever it was, it had put on a sort of off-putting mimicked voice of my mother. I wasn't sure what it was at first, but I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I didn't trust it, and I felt chills when I heard it. It called from somewhere in the dark out in my backyard, saying, I replied, Mom, is that you? It didn't respond. I figured she was trying to show me something out there. So I walked down my porch stairs, and I asked, Mom, let me know if that's you. I hear it again. Psst. The sound chilled me to the bone, not being sure what it was, hoping that it was my mom. I stepped a few steps closer and asked again, Mom, is that you? Are you out there? That icy voice repeated again. I soon came to the edge of the shadow cast by my porch light being blocked by the corner of my house. At the same time, something approached the edge of the light, as if the border of the shadow and light was its boundary. When I saw it, I froze, and it did the same. I realized what I was looking at then was definitely not my mother. However, up close, it looked more like it was trying to mimic my appearance. Long hair, similar facial features, but it was still too tall and too pale with tight skin and deep black sunken in eyes. It was like I caught something inhuman in the middle of transforming into me. We both stayed petrified. We examined each other. I had no clue as to what its plans were, but as I managed to regain composure of myself, I immediately ran back into the house as fast as I could manage. I did get a glimpse of how fast that thing could move, and I knew that if it had the intention and or capability, it could have had its way with me. But it let me escape, for what reason I'll always be confused about. My brothers and I all slept in the kitchen that night until my mom got back, because she had apparently left the house. But when she did come back, she would later tell me that she had also heard the sound before she left to the store. The Thing in the Jungle From Anonymous My father is a fearless man. He is the type to not take any tomfoolery from people, whether it's from strangers or even close relatives. He's a very level-headed man with friends from distant places. 
Now, in my country, we are a bunch of superstitious people. The supernatural is deeply embedded into our blood, into our culture. We believe that black magic and curses befall people or can be cast or thrown at people. But this is not that type of story. The jungles here are dense and old. When we want to do anything in these jungles, we believe in asking our ancestors permission. Be it camping or relieving ourselves, we always ask permission. Atok nenek, kukunak bong, er kesseltau. Roughly translating to, grandfather, grandmother, I need to relieve myself, okay? And we would continue on with our business. If we didn't do that, it is said that a week of fevers and bad luck will be upon you. Creatures and ghouls are a common topic from where I'm from. We talk about them to warn people before they do anything or to be more aware of their surroundings. Back to my father. When he was a little younger, back in 1992, he wanted to go camping with his buddies in the jungle reservations. They were geared up and packed for a week to trek through the jungle to their destination. They carpooled with a couple of 4x4 jeeps and they were generally excited, having a good time on their journey. They reached the reservation a little late, but they were confident that they could find their camping destination still. At the time, it was near midnight. They were still nowhere near where they wanted to be. Along the beaten path that they drove through, they suddenly saw in the jeep's headlights in front of them a figure. They described it as thin and pale, with legs bent in a squatting position low to the ground. They stopped a little more than 10 to 15 meters away. They were quiet in the jeep, not a word passing between them, the creatures of the night around them chirping and scuttling in the dark. Then they saw that creature beginning to move. It must have realized that it had company now as its head slowly turned towards them. But how could it know? Because apparently it had no eyes and no ears to sense them with. They searched all over its body, but they did not find anything that could be a mouth or even a nose. What they were looking at appeared to just simply be an eerily human-like figure, alarmingly thin with limbs longer than any normal human person. It slowly stood, its movement smooth and calculated, as if it didn't want to spook them. They could see its thin arms and long claws, skin almost glimmering in the dark, reflecting the jeep's headlights. Then, it began to walk towards them, slow, almost non-threatening looking, like a big cat stalking prey. They froze with fear, just staring at this thing as it came closer to them. Quickly, my father came to his senses and slapped his friend who was driving to get him to reverse. He then leaned out the jeep window and signaled his friends in the other jeep to get out of there quickly. They all did so, slightly faster, driving carefully so as to not hit a tree, or else they might swerve right into their deaths. They didn't stop until they left the reserve. They booked it out of there the moment they hit asphalt. Eyes Above the Corn From Bowhunter74 This happened in the late summer of 2017 in Northwest Pennsylvania. To preface this, I've been an avid outdoorsman since I was seven years old. I would bow hunt for deer, bear, and turkey. Wildlife is something I'm very confident in identifying. My buddy, M, and I spend most of the summer nights jigging for walleye. So like clockwork, we left at 10 p.m. one night to fish until 2 a.m. or so. After a good night of fishing, neither of us were tired yet. We decided to go drive around and listen to music while chewing tobacco. M didn't want his mom to know we used tobacco, young country kid struggles. We decided to go park for a few minutes at M's family farm, putting chews in our mouths. We pulled off into the cornfield around 2.15 a.m., the high beams on to see if there might be a big buck in the opening. Just as M put the car into park, 
we noticed red eyes in the back of the field, about 100 yards away from us. There were no red flags yet, not until we realized that whatever those eyes belonged to, it was taller than the fully grown corn stalks. The two of us watched in silence. Then I could have sworn I saw it slowly turn and look right at me. As soon as its eyes met mine, my chest got all tight. I felt as if something was pushing me into the back of my seat. I couldn't move, frozen in an overwhelming feeling of pure terror. That was the last thing I remembered until we were driving down the main road into town at 4.30 a.m. Somehow, we had no recollection of the two hours of that night between 2.15 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. Horrified, we went straight back to M's apartment and ran inside. We only managed to fall asleep around 6 a.m. When I woke up, I asked M if he could recall anything of what happened last night. When he saw those eyes, he said the same thing happened to him, that he'd lost the memories of the two hours after. But how did he drive to the main road if he couldn't remember? We still hunt that strange farm, but nothing has happened since. I don't know what we saw, but nothing in Pennsylvania stands taller than that corn. A Peculiar Place From JP My family and I live in the country, on 10 acres near the Arkansas-Oklahoma state line. I'm not a very spiritual person other than being Christian, never messed around with the supernatural or paranormal stuff, outside of listening to some podcasts when I'm bored. I've sometimes gone on Bigfoot hunts, just for fun, more of an excuse to go on night hikes for a good thrill. I've never seen a ghost or an apparition per se, but I have seen and heard a few weird things that I cannot explain. I do not intend to embellish or twist the facts to make this story sound more interesting for the sake of the show, and I will not mention any details that I'm not certain of. So our little 10-acre plot is mostly wooded, we have plenty of neighbors around in spite of being somewhat secluded and out of city limits. I grew up playing in the woods with my brothers and sisters and later my nieces and nephews. If there are two or more people out there, the atmosphere always seems pretty friendly and cheerful, if you know what I mean. But at night, it always feels like the mood changes. I don't know for sure where I stand on there being or not being ghosts in this world, but I do think that certain spirits haunt certain places. Not like a ghost, more like a lingering feeling left behind by those who have dwelt there before. For instance, a place where a horrendous crime was committed, or a battlefield, or a house full of happy memories and joyous occasions. Either way, the place where you are affects the way you feel. Now to get to my story or stories. I've always been an outdoorsman. Mother Nature is where I feel at peace. I understand the way that the Native Americans felt about this land before we ever set foot here, a kind of partnership with the land and its creatures. I've spent many evenings and will continue to spend many evenings outside next to a campfire under the stars just enjoying God's creations. I often go outside to relax, recover from the workday, to get away from people and the frustrations they may bring. But sometimes, the night feels different on different days. The first time I felt this was on an overcast evening in October of last year. I'd finished music practice, and I had made a campfire outside to spend some time alone. That evening felt different, though like something was telling me to go back inside. But stubborn as usual with me, I didn't listen to my gut feeling. I decided to stay out and enjoy the cool night air, even if the woods felt creepy that night. I'd been sitting out there for about an hour when I began to hear this strange music coming from our woods. It sounded like a flute with long, drawn-out, mournful tones. 
Being a musician myself, this sound captivated me, and I felt as if I could feel the sentiment behind it. It was sad. It was ancient. I quickly went inside and grabbed my mom. She was texting someone and said she would be out in a minute. But the music had stopped, and by then it was too late for anyone besides me to have heard it. Now, it didn't feel creepy or demonic. It felt like the past, nothing more. A few months later, under the same circumstances, I saw the silhouette of a hooded figure walking through our field towards the tree line, where it then disappeared. Again, it didn't feel wrong or malicious. It was like seeing a figure from the past. I say this because we have several really old cabin foundations and ruins on ours and our neighbors' properties, with a few old wells and some really old piles of rubbish that people dumped over time. Some of it dates back all the way to the 1800s. I somehow get the feeling that the hooded figure and the music, which I've heard a few more times now, are one and the same. Not a malicious demon or a silly ghost from a cheesy horror film, just an illusion of a figure from the past. Perhaps an old medicine man or something of the sort. I don't know why, but that's what it feels like to me. I haven't shared the full details of all of this with my family, as they may think I'm weird, which is understandable. But I think that what I've seen here is only for me, as no one else but a select few have seen or heard anything of the sort. I'm not a believer in the traditional white sheet ghost with red eyes kind of stories, but I think our lives leave echoes behind, kind of like a voice in a long tunnel, that even when the voice has stopped, someone farther down the tunnel might hear it if they take the time to listen closely and quietly. Good or bad, these echoes are there even if we choose to talk over the top of them. I hope you enjoyed this story and can relate. Chicken Soup from Jubilee This story was told to me by my friend about his grandma Wyatt. I'll share it with you in his words. When my mother was a teenager, about 13 years old, she lived with Grandma Wyatt in Paxton, Indiana. It was during the Depression in the early 1930s. Times were hard, and that made people harden their hearts to each other. At the time, there was an old woman in town who was very ill and on her last days. Grandma was helping to care for her. She thought a bowl of chicken soup would help make her feel better. But none of the neighbors or any of the people she asked would spare a chicken for her to prepare the meal. She was disappointed by the selfishness of the people around her. As she walked down the dirt road, a chicken of all things emerged from a yard and began to follow her. She shooted back into the yard, locking the gate behind her. Moments later, the chicken was following her once again. She turned and shooted back. To her surprise, the gate was somehow unlocked now. She'd barely taken a few steps down the road when it all happened once more, the gate being unlocked and the chicken at her heels. The third time it happened, she accepted it as a sign that the chicken was supposed to follow her. It was an offering for the old woman's meal. She looked around, didn't see anybody, and took it home to make chicken soup. That turned out to be the woman's last meal. They held a funeral for the old woman, and the holier-than-thou people in town, many of whom had refused to part with a chicken, attended to show how respectful and pious they were. They all placed flowers on the casket. All of a sudden, a wind came out of nowhere and blew the flowers off the casket twice. Grandma went up to the casket, the last to lay hers on it. After that, there were no more breezes. The old woman accepted Grandma's flowers, but not from those hypocrites who would not offer even a bird. My mother said the looks on their faces was memorable, no one said a word. I think that event made a lot of people wonder, maybe even made them feel guilty for being so stingy and uncaring.
it used his voice from the goddess of the void. I live in an apartment complex surrounded by woods in North Carolina. At the time, I was living with two roommates and my boyfriend. My two roommates were the only ones with a TV, and at the time, they were off house-sitting. This will be important later. I remember my boyfriend saying that he was going to go get groceries in a moment. I was exhausted due to my poor health as a result of having cystic fibrosis, and I told my boyfriend I'd be lying down for a nap while he was gone. He left the TV on for me in the other room to make it seem more lively in the apartment while he was gone, and I soon fell asleep. I'm not sure how long I slept, but I woke up to hear my boyfriend calling my name. Melissa, come help me with this, Melissa. I assumed John, my boyfriend, was back from the grocery shopping, but his voice sounded wrong. It sounded like he was talking through a walkie-talkie, or it was somehow mechanical in a way. I shrugged and got out of bed, moving to the back door and opening it, turning on the light. I froze there on the back porch hearing the same call coming from the woods instead of from the parking lot. Melissa, come help me with this, Melissa. I then saw them, two red glowing eyes, seven feet off the ground in the tree line. Suddenly, I felt hands on my shoulders and gasped, nearly screaming. The eyes disappeared then as I turned around. Melissa, what are you doing out here? It was John, the real John. I told him how I thought he was calling my name, but I thought that it couldn't be him. He told me he had been in the other bedroom watching TV the whole time after putting the groceries away. He then looked at me seriously. I, I heard it call me too, using your voice, he said, explaining why he had to come through the back door. I have heard stories like this, and I believe we may have encountered a skinwalker. We've since had the apartment smudged with sage, and we used salt on all entryways that faced the woods. Thankfully, we haven't encountered it again, but we have had other encounters. But those are stories for another time. The Chupa Crazies from TPG So to begin my story, I have to let you know what happened too close to home for comfort. In the winter of 2000, we moved from the Midwest to a southern state, where we purchased a good 80-something acres. We're horse people and love the trail ride, as well as participate in the local rodeos. That being said, we had about eight horses on the property at the time. None of them were very skittish at all. We had many other animals and do a lot of hunting on our land as well. I've never felt scared on our property, even on moonless nights with only the glow of my LG flip phone, or whenever I'd sneak out of the house at night, walking the quarter mile through the fields and trees to the end of my driveway. That's where my friend would be waiting to pick me up for our adventures. One night when I was a bit older, 19 to 20-ish, my younger brother was around 15 or 16, the two of us and my live-in boyfriend at the time decided to go and watch the stars. We had the best view from the middle of our driveway that was between a horse pasture and an open, marshy, tall, grassland-like area. The grass was always tall because it was always so muddy on that side. We could never completely brush hog it all with the tractor or mow it with a lawnmower. This marshy area is to the left side of us and the horse barn to the right. The horse barn was just this open building with stalls, but at the time the horses weren't in there. They were grazing around the barn. We were lying on the warm hood of my Mercury Cougar, with a blanket under us, watching the stars and catching a few shooting stars here and there too. Everything was calm and beautiful as it always felt, listening to the beautiful song of our local coyote pack as they howled at the moon. All of a sudden, a new sound sent chills throughout all of us. We heard this howl that was different from the coyote's howls. It didn't even sound like a wolf. 
My uncle who lived with us was a huge wolf guy. I'd like to think I knew what they sounded like and I could tell the difference between a wolf and a coyote howl. This was neither and when it howled the first time, everything else just shut up in response. Everything went quiet and then not too long later, we heard it again. We then heard the coyotes scattering in the distance, or at least that's what we thought it was. Now I'm not so sure, but at the time it made sense with what we encountered. The horses were acting super nervous when just before, when the coyotes were singing, they were calm and grazing. Now they were snorting and flicking their ears in all directions, noses blowing as they tried to see what the danger was around them. We then decided it would probably be a good time to head back inside the house to grab a gun and flashlight. So we go to turn the car around and we spot something. Whatever it is, it looks like the silhouette of a very large mangy wolf. On the way to the house, we had to cross a creek bed that recently was pretty washed out and it off-centered my car on a rock, getting us stuck. This meant we had to walk in the dark without protection for about a third to a half of the length of a football field. What made this part scary was the fact that we had to climb this big steep hill and go through a bunch of overgrown trees on the way. All the while, that feeling that someone or something was watching and possibly following us. My brother ran like a bullet back to the house, out of breath and freaking out our parents when he got back. He told them what we saw and explained that we needed to investigate. I, however, refused to run because I knew that could trigger a predator's instincts. When you run, they run, wanting to chase down their prey. No, this girl was very cautious, trying to make as little noise as possible. I jogged from tree to tree, hoping that if something did come after me, maybe I could get up one of these trees fast enough. My boyfriend walked fast right up the middle of the hill and was in the house before I was. So yeah, the boys left the only girl alone outside. Soon I made it too. My parents gave us the keys to the truck, a spotlight, and the Beretta handgun. Then the three of us headed for that opening where the horses got nervous. From the truck using the spotlight, there in that marshy area, we spotted about two dozen sets of glowing red eyes. Each set was only about a foot or so off the ground, but these things' backs were much taller. As we tried to get a good look at them, they would stay out of the ring of light from the spotlight. No matter what we did, we couldn't get a really good look at them, but I will describe what we could see. Their heads were low to the ground, and they were super thin and skinny. Their front end was much lower than the hindquarters. They could stand up like a person too, hopping up on a round hay bale like this. They seemed very intelligent too. We pulled the truck in as far as we could, then we shut off the lights of the truck for about five minutes. Then we kicked on the high beams, hoping to surprise these animals. But they were still in the grass just on the edge where our lights would touch the ground and surrounding area instead of them. My boyfriend got out of the truck with the gun to get closer to see if he could shoot one so we could find out what they were. After all, they seemed to be dangerous to the horses. As he did this, my brother and I stayed in the truck, controlling the lights and watching around him for a sneak attack or anything like it. Come to find out, that is exactly what they were trying to do. At least a dozen of them were circled in a half circle around him before long with the truck at his back, while another group of them was off to the right of us under the branches of the tree line they were making noises and jumping on the old rotten hay bales that we had over there at the time. It was insane because it seemed like they were trying to say, hey, look over here, let us distract you. These animals were too smart and there were too many of them. Then it happened. My boyfriend fired a shot, then another. He fired six in a row in rapid succession, which seemed to make contact because something fell to the ground and didn't move. When he tried to get closer to see if he got it, they got protective of it and began to close the circle. He then said screw this, if he did kill it he would just get it tomorrow, when it was safe and the sun was up. He told us, let's get out of here. Quickly, we drove home, telling everyone what happened and what we saw. The next morning after the sun came up around 6.30 to 7ish, we went to go and see if we could find blood or the body. 
but all we found was a flat circle in the grass where you could tell something had laid down there. But no blood, no trail, no hair, nothing. That was the only evidence we had, and it wasn't enough. We talked to so many local hunters, game wardens, park rangers, military, everyone I knew who might have a game camera or possibly had seen it before. But no, the only answers I got were mountain lions or possibly boars. I know for a fact it wasn't either of those. Mountain lions and panthers don't hunt in packs, and they do not act like that. And boars, let's be real, those were not boars. So what was this? A chupacabra? Wild dogs? Coyotes? I don't think we'll ever know. But I still live in the same house, I have my own kids now, and even today I make sure that we are all very cautious. If we are out at night, we have protection and a big fire in the yard. I want to set up game cams, but I think I'd rather not find out what's lurking around our property. By the way, this property used to be Native American land and burial grounds. I know this from the college coming out and finding pottery and arrowheads around here. My son even says he sees these things called hide-behinds at night when he looks out the windows. So maybe we have skinwalkers. But whatever it is, there is always something unexplainable happening around here. But it's still my home, and I would not live anywhere else. Dogman Encounter from Horror Wolf 13. Back in 2016, I had an experience that truly scarred me for life. One night, I'd like to say it was somewhere in the middle of autumn, I'd been planning a sleepover with some friends. If I recall correctly, it was for my birthday, or for one of my friend's birthdays. We were going to have it at my house. The day before the sleepover, I spent all day making sure everything in my house was clean and neat for my friends. When I was outside sweeping the deck, I looked at the miles of forest ahead of me. Then I got an idea. I thought it'd be a fun idea for all of us to explore the woods behind my house during the day. So that day came and I was waiting by the front door for the other girls to arrive. I waited for probably five minutes before Caitlin's mom drove into our driveway. I instantly ran up and hugged Caitlin, excitedly telling her about my plan for us to go into the woods. She happily agreed, and we went inside waiting for the others. Before long, the other two arrived. We were all sitting on the couch then. First off, we watched a movie and did some karaoke. Probably normal for us being 13-year-olds home alone. Then I decided it was finally time for our adventure. Joanna and I packed us some bags of necessities for the hike while Caitlin and Sarah messed around. As we set off into the woods, I noticed that the air had grown a lot chillier since I was last out. I asked my friends, do you guys think we should just head back inside? It's getting pretty cold. But they all just wanted some fresh air, so they disagreed. I hesitantly accepted their answers and led the way. After a bit of walking, I saw something dart in my peripheral vision. My eyes glanced over to where I saw it, but before I could see anything, Sarah nudged me and pointed out a bald eagle in a tree. As soon as I gave her a reaction, I looked back over to where I saw the movement, but I found nothing out of the ordinary. About an hour later, I saw the movement again. Once more, I looked over to it. This time, unlike the last, I actually saw something. Running off into a thick layer of trees was this hairy dog-looking thing. At first, I thought it was just a coyote, but then, as it lifted itself onto two legs like a person, I knew I was mistaken. This thing looked to be about six or seven feet tall on two legs and seemed severely distorted. I screamed and pointed it out to my friends, but it was too late. That creature was gone. They were all confused, questioning me, obviously not believing what I saw. A little while later, after kind of shrugging off the event, my friends and I decided to head back to the house. It was starting to get dark then. We walked for about five minutes before we heard a stick snapping behind us. I knew my friends heard it too. It was too loud to ignore. We all looked back, not expecting much, but there stood the creature that I'd seen earlier. It was staring at us, 
seemingly hungry. It had these beady yellow eyes, a wide gaping mouth, and razor sharp teeth. This time, we all screamed and ran for our lives. I ran until my legs felt as if they were going to fall off. At some point, I turned to look if the creature was still there, and to my surprise, it was gone. A little while after this happened, I scoured the internet for ideas of what this might be and if others have seen it. I found werewolves and dogmen, both of which were things people have reported sighting. Luckily, my friends and I are all still alive to this day, except now we all have a story to share with our future children and families. I know that was a sleepover that we'll never forget. West Coast Rake Encounter From Sea Philly 100 My brother, his ex, our friend Lauren, my two dogs and I took a road trip from Orcas Island, Washington out to the Olympic Peninsula back in 2014. We camped out the first night in the rain. The next night, we drove down to La Push. This is coincidentally where the Twilight movies were filmed. We arrived at our destination, a place called Third Beach, around 4 p.m. and saw that there were no dogs signs posted everywhere. The girls tried to convince me to leave my dogs in the car but I just wasn't going to do that. My dogs are like my children. I love them, and I take them with me everywhere I go. While we were talking, my dogs just kept staring out into the dense foliage, which was kind of creeping me out. But we decided we'd take our chances with the dogs, and we started down the trail. I noticed that it was totally silent. There were no birds singing, no insects chirping. I mean, you could literally hear a pin drop, yeah, the kind of silence that makes your ears ring. My dogs kept stopping and staring out into the forest, which had the trail boxed into either side of us. It got so bad, I had to leash them up just to keep them moving. We got down to the beach. Lauren undressed into her swimming clothes and ran into the ocean. We set up camp right up against the woods, as we could see the tide coming in all the way into where the beach met the forest. So we had a little island of sand to pitch our tent and get a little fire going. It was eerily quiet out there still, but we had a small portable speaker with us, so we played some music to lighten the mood. It got dark and we started to settle down for the night. The girls went to bed and my brother and I stayed up drinking beer. We weren't drunk or anything like that, just enjoying a couple of delicious rainier beers before turning in for the night. Because of how close we were to the woods, I had the ocean to my back and I was facing the forest. We could hear something moving around out there but we thought it was raccoons. There are quite a few of them in that area. My dogs began growling and raising their hackles, so I figured I would try to see what it was just to be sure. I turned on my headlamp, and to my horror, I could see two eyes looking back at me. The eye shine was a milky white in the dim light cast from my headlamp. They looked like two twin moons, marbles the size of a fist and about four to five inches apart. We didn't have any guns, so we started shouting and throwing rocks and sticks at the thing, thinking maybe it was a mountain lion. It turned its head away, and you could see how big it was by the profile of its eyes, making them look even more like big, perfectly round marbles. We could hear it crashing off into the brush, and we went into our tent. The girls sleepily asked us what the heck was going on out there. We told them we had chased off some raccoons, not wanting to creep them out. I couldn't sleep a wink after that. My dogs kept growling and whining, and I could hear sticks snapping in the woods, not even ten feet from the tent. It sounded like something was walking right up to the tent, then it paused before slowly pressing what looked to be a stick into the tent flap. The dogs were growling so low and loud, it sounded like we had a diesel engine in there with us. I don't think any of us were asleep when my dog snapped at the stick or whatever, causing it to withdraw and we could hear the thing walking back off into the woods. What was weird was it sounded like it was dragging something in the sand behind it. It finally started getting light out, and so we got up and tried to enjoy the beach for the day. My dogs were chasing seagulls, and we made some breakfast before making our way down the beach toward a coastal waterfall that we could see a couple miles south from our campsite. While we were walking, we noticed the tide was coming in very quickly. 
We didn't even make it to the waterfall before the tide forced us up onto a big pile of driftwood. The undertow was strong there, and there's also a phenomenon known as sneaker waves, which come out of nowhere and can pull you out into the current. The waves were breaking on the driftwood, and I was worried my dogs were going to get pulled under, so we decided to try to enter the woods and make our way back to the campsite from there. This was no easy feat, as the woods were so thick and overgrown that it made bushwhacking very difficult. We made our way into the bush, and it got extremely quiet again. We could no longer hear the sound of the waves on the beach, and just then, a small branch fell into the brush right in front of me. I looked up just in time to see what looked to be a giant pale white tadpole swinging from tree to tree above us. I say swinging because it had what looked like two arms, but its body was like an overgrown slug or something. I only caught the one brief glimpse and no one else had seen it, so I thought maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. This place was home to the infamous banana slug after all, but this thing was way too big to be a slug and slugs don't have arms, right? We could hardly move through the dense coastal undergrowth, plus it sounded like something was swinging through the trees in circles around us. My dogs were barking and running in circles chasing the sound of whatever the thing was. Lauren thought we were lost, so she started crying, and between the branches breaking and the dogs barking, we were all a bit stressed out. A big branch broke right above us, that thing falling down from the tree right on top of me. I felt a searing pain in my shoulder. I reached up to pull this thing off of me. It was about the size of a dog, maybe 40 pounds, but the head was massive, its teeth still stuck in my shoulder. I could feel warm blood running down my back. My dogs both leapt up and started biting and scratching at this thing, which caused it to release its grip on my shoulder. I threw it into the bush, and my dogs ran after it. What the heck was that? My brother exclaimed. I don't know, man. Let's just get the heck out of here, I replied. The girls were really freaking out now, but we started crashing through the woods, running as fast as we could, incurring more than a few cuts and scratches in the process. I was shouting at the top of my lungs for my dogs, who still had not returned yet. Finally, I saw them up in front of us. They had the thing treed, it was about 20 feet up in a tree, hissing and spitting down at them. It looked up when it saw me and let out a horrible high-pitched shriek. It sounded like a megaphone being played through an amplifier. It made me want to puke. I could see it clearly now. It was holding onto the tree with what looked to be long claws attached to thin bony arms. The tail, if you could call it that, was wrapped around the tree. Its head looked vaguely human but the thing was anything but. Its eyes were clearly the same as the thing we'd seen the night before. Big, milky, white, marble-like eyes that seemed to ooze spite and malice. It had translucent skin that was stretched tight across its skull. It had no nose or ears that I could see, but its mouth was huge, still red with blood from biting my shoulder. I could see rows of tiny little teeth, it had a long pointed tongue that it was using to hiss and spit at the dogs. I picked up a rock the size of a baseball. Biting through the pain, I beamed it right at the thing, hitting it square in its face. It shrieked again and jumped out of the tree. As soon as it hit the ground, it began using its arms to crawl towards me, but the dogs were fast and pinned it to the ground, biting and tearing with all their might. It tried to fight back, but these dogs had a combined weight of at least 150 pounds. They regularly killed small animals, so they had a taste for blood, and they were going berserk. I'm not sure if they killed the thing or what, but it wasn't moving. I grabbed my dogs by their collars, and we got the heck out of there. We made it back to the beach where my brother and the girls were already grabbing our things. We tore up the trail and threw the stuff in the back of my truck before peeling out of there. We'd only gone about 50 yards when that thing threw itself out onto the road in front of us. I didn't have time to react, but we could feel it go under the tires. When I looked back in the rearview mirror, I couldn't see it. I figured it had just crawled off into the brush and kept driving. I wish I could say that was the end of it. We drove straight through Tacoma where we stopped and got a motel for the night. Tacoma has a rather sketchy reputation, 
so we tried to bring as much of our gear inside as we could. Well, I'll be danged. That thing had been clinging to the undercarriage that entire time, and was now crawling up from under the truck and onto the tailgate. Luckily, the dogs were still in the bed of the truck, so they started charging and biting the thing. It fell off and began crawling towards me again, its hideous face mangled and mean. My dogs jumped out of the bed of the truck, commencing to tear the thing to shreds. Now I knew it was dead. The dogs had bitten right through the neck, separating the head from the rest of the body. We called the cops, but no one showed up. The motel must have thought it was just some old roadkill or something, but we didn't stick around to find out. We dropped Lauren off at the SeaTac airport and drove straight back to Anacortes to catch the ferry home. I don't know if this thing was a crawler or rake or what. I always thought that was just the stuff of nightmares, an urban legend if you will. But those legends have to come from something, right? The Backwoods of the Boundary Waters From Prime 8, 5 During the month of July in 2022, a few friends of mine along with their dads were going on a trip into the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters are a huge expanse of totally natural woods, stretching for hundreds of miles. In between these woods are thousands of lakes with small land bridges that we call portages in between the forests. We packed about 200 pounds of gear for five people total. We fit that onto a three-person canoe and a two-person canoe. Before the trip started, I was already nervous of these lands. Due to my native heritage, I've heard many stories about evil spirits and tricksters like the Wendigo, Skinwalker, and Iktomi. Being in their territory of origin was nerve-wracking, along with the knowledge of these spirits enjoying messing with mixed bloods like myself. Starting out at Snowbank Lake, we canoed, portaged, and camped our way deeper and deeper into the woods of the Boundary Waters. It started when we were at the deepest point of our journey, about 15 miles in. My friends J and S had been stung by a wasp and wanted to go back to camp and were discussing the matter. But me being terribly afraid of wasps and insects, I was already gone, sprinting about 15 yards away from them. I knew they would probably be heading back to camp soon to grab medical supplies for their stings, but then I heard a noise that chilled me. A strange, almost uncanny version of what sounded like Jay's voice. All I heard was, Hey. In Jay's soft but commanding voice, warped by something I didn't know. But it came from the opposite direction they were. I froze, feeling goosebumps going up and down my body in waves of fear. Tears welled up in my eyes, and the forest became almost completely silent, except for Jay, S, and their dads talking in the distance. Then, a branch snapped about 25 yards away. As soon as I heard that snapping branch, my head shot right around to strangely shaped branches that I soon realized were antlers. These antlers were seven and a half feet off the ground. My fight-or-flight instinct kicked in. I ran as fast as I ever had before. I bolted back into camp, and when the others looked at me like I was crazy... I told them that I'd run back into the wasp. From then on, I made sure to stay close to everyone else for the rest of the trip. Soon after that, I began to have nightmares. They would lessen in frequency over time, but even now I still have them as of November 2022. This nightmare is fuzzy, except for one part. A skinwalker-looking creature staring at me from the forest while I'm with my family. Its legs are stretched out as long as possible as it stands at eight feet tall, its teeth halfway bared. In my nightmares, it has red eyes, sometimes yellow, but those eyes always pierce into my consciousness like a dagger. It radiates only one thing, death. Every time I look into its eyes, I have this primal fear, 
but I can't move. Now the dream has progressed to me and my family driving away as fast as we can, pushing 80 miles per hour on a narrow state park road. But no matter how fast we go, it just keeps up. Its legs move effortlessly, still outstretched, running like a man, but something is still very off about it. The nightmare ends soon after, and I wake up for the day. No other anomalies have occurred since the dreams began at the Boundary Waters. I have a cross above my bed and on my doorknob, just in case. Remember to stay aware and safe in the woods. I can't help but feel that I saw something out there. Something with antlers, straight from Native American folklore. When to go behind the tree, from Kate and the Skinwalker fan. I was about 14 at the time. It was probably around 10 or 11 p.m. when we heard it. About a week earlier, my friend and I were planning to have a week-long camp out in the woods behind my house. Mind you, I live in the middle of the woods in a very rural area, so my property is teeming with wildlife. Me and her, let's call her Bella for anonymous sake are accustomed to the occasional howl or shriek of a fox. But on the third night of our camp out, we heard something absolutely terrifying. Now, the first two nights were peaceful and fun, but that all changed very soon. So me and Bella, like we had been doing, went to go start up a fire to roast the marshmallows we had brought. That's when we heard it. A distant shriek. Usually we would have ignored it, putting it off as an animal, but this time it was different. While it was distant, we could clearly make out something that sounded like a moose in heat and a woman being brutally murdered. Shocked, we both head to the tent and try to distract ourselves. An hour or so passes by and we feel comfortable enough to go back out for a few minutes, talk a bit, and put the fire out. Everything seems to be pretty much normal, until I see it. Behind a rather large tree is one side of large deer antlers. Only this couldn't have been a deer because the antlers were about seven or eight feet off the ground. Knowing deeply that something is wrong, I nudged Bella softly, whispering, Turn around slowly and make no noise. Following my directions, she turns around and I can hear a faint gasp emerge from her when this thing emerges from behind the tree. It has deep, yellow eyes that seem to stare straight into your soul. It has the head or skull of a deer, but the body of a seven-foot-tall man that has been starving for three months. Its pale gray skin was barely visible in the faint afterglow of our campfire. I almost vomit when the vile stench reaches us, smelling like a rotting corpse in hot air. I tell Bella to hide in the tent and that I'll be there soon. As soon as she secures the tent, the thing says, Bella, it's gone. You can come out. And to my horror, it was speaking in my voice. I quickly tell her that it wasn't me who said that, but the thing. I slowly retreat into the tent, never letting my gaze fall from the creature. When I get inside, I dive into my sleeping bag, but what happens next will scare me for life. After about two minutes of being in the tent, we hear the same blood-curdling shrill as before, and the thing rips open the top of our tent. Oddly enough, the thing does not attack us, but just stares at us for a good 30 seconds. You'd think we would run, right? No, we do not run. In fact, we do not move a muscle. We were literally paralyzed with fear. I've read about infrasound in school before. It's a technique used by large cats to paralyze their prey before they attack. That's exactly what this felt like. Luckily, I had just remembered the first aid kit I had brought just in case of an emergency. It had a full bottle of rubbing alcohol. I slowly reach for the bottle of alcohol. Then I throw it in the fire and it explodes, throwing flammable gas everywhere. Thankfully, the blast was a shield for us and took all the fire straight to the back. This caused it to give one last ear-piercing scream, shrink down into an unnatural-looking rabbit, and zip back into the forest, never to be seen by us again. To this day, me and Bella have never returned there, and certainly do not plan to. After a long night of research, both me and Bella agree that what we saw was most likely, if not definitely, a Wendigo. The Hunt in the Woods From the Huntress Wolf In Missouri, there are loads of wooded areas you can hunt in. I am a hunter at the age of 22, 
and I will always remember this horrific event. I had asked my parents if I could go hunting with my uncle. They agreed, so I packed my hunting gear in my truck and drove over to my uncle's house. The drive was about three hours long. As soon as I got there, my two friends, Ruki and Luna, were waiting for me. They had been talking to my uncle. Hey, sport, you all set to go? My uncle smiled as I got my hunting gear from the truck. Ready as I'll ever be, I answered back. All four of us got in the hunting truck my uncle owned at the time, and we drove off into his property. His property is a huge piece of land, mostly a wooded area. You could see trees for miles and miles. As we drove, my friends and I discussed ex-boyfriends and drama, and soon we arrived at the hunting spot. My uncle got out and told us, All right, Luna and I will go north, Ruki and Ash, you two go west. And my uncle looked at us seriously. Do not get separated, all right? These woods are dangerous when night falls. We all nodded, and we went in our respective directions. I couldn't help but think that my uncle knew something about these woods. He always told us that warning every time. Ruki and I kept walking, soon setting up camp among the trees. I had with me a rifle and pistol, and Ruki had his 9-gauge and a small pistol just in case. We sat and waited as the sun began to go down. Suddenly, from the dark, I heard a branch snap. I thought it was my uncle coming to check on us, but what I heard next sent shivers down my spine. A deafening howl coming from right behind us only ten feet away or so. Ash, you heard that, right? Ruki asked as he held his nine gauge in his hands. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. I replied, holding my rifle close, as the sound of heavy footsteps got closer and closer. We aimed our guns in the direction of the noise. From the dark, I saw what looked to be a bear, but bears don't make that kind of howl. I fired the first shot then. Whatever it was screamed in pain. It wasn't enough to kill it, but it was enough to tee it off. We looked at each other and ran, we soon heard it behind us, chasing us. I whistled the kind of whistle my uncle had taught me whenever I was in trouble or needed help if we were far away. At the same time, I heard Ruki taking two shots at the thing behind us before reloading his 9-gauge. When my eyes adjusted, I turned around as I ran, getting a better look at our pursuer. It looked like a person with a wolf skull, but the way it moved and looked everywhere else I couldn't tell if it was man or something else. Two more gunshots rang out, hitting the creature in the head and in the chest. It was my uncle and Luna. I remember thinking this couldn't be real. Whatever this creature was had taken multiple shots and was not slowing down. We made it back to the truck, and after we climbed in, the creature jumped onto it. As we drove away, we managed to shake the creature off. It rolled onto the ground, howling again. As soon as we made it back to the house, we locked all the doors, every window, and even the basement. My uncle called a Cherokee friend that lived down the road for help. He said that we should not leave the house until morning. We went into our rooms and fell into light, scared slumber. When the next day came, our Cherokee friend came by, performing a blessing ritual on us and the house. What do you think it was? My uncle asked his friend as he gave an odd look, something whose name we cannot speak. That gave me shivers. At the time, I remember thinking it was a werewolf, but the thought of something like a wendigo or a skinwalker being in Missouri, that's creepy. Never go into the woods alone or unarmed. Possible Skinwalker from Ninja Goldfish We were staying at a campground somewhere in northern Alabama. We stayed there for one night. My parents had just started to pack up the tent. My brother and two younger sisters and I decided to go on a nature walk. 
At first, we were walking on the pavement, but then we saw an old gravel road that went into an opening in the forest. The path continued through the opening and went to the road that was blocked off. The entire time we were walking through the clearing, we heard this howling noise. In the brush that was on the side of the path, you could see a shadow. We could hear something stepping in the leaves. Everyone but my older brother got a little nervous. He said that we should walk back to the camp so we could get his knife. When we got back to the campsite, the howling stopped. My parents said that they were almost done and we could go on one more little walk. My older brother grabbed his knife and we set off. We went to a different path that was close to the other. This path had more trees around it and it was not as long. We could hear the howling again, though. We made it to the road that we had been to before, after about five minutes. There, we heard what sounded like cows mooing, but it didn't sound quite right. It was more distorted. Then, we heard the stomping sounds again. My sisters and I were ready to run back, but our older brother stopped us and told us to walk and act calm. He said that whatever it was, it would chase after us if we ran. When we made it back, we jumped in the car and drove off. We have not told anyone the story ever since. What Happened in the Adirondacks From Jacob Exploration This happened in a small town with a man-made pond. I won't say the name, but some can probably guess from that. My cousin, my brother, and I went for a hike, like we normally do around the pond. We usually go out around 8 p.m., we did our normal loop, but I convinced both of them to go down the less bright road. I grew up here, hiking and camping in the area. So I knew the area, and I knew all the people down the road, all around 20 of them. So we walked down the road. And when I say it wasn't well lit, that's because the street lamps were spaced farther apart. We soon hit our first dark space, where the lamps didn't light up around maybe two yards, my cousin decided to yell, Oh no, like something happened to him. I turned around to see him throwing a rock like an idiot. I knew it was him trying to scare me or prank me, and to be honest, I get scared easily. I just saw you throw that, I said. He looked at me and smiled, calling me a dummy. We continued to walk on. We were getting close to the part in the road with crappy signal. At least the lighting was better here. From there, we could hear the river nearby, which was drowned out by our stupid jokes and conversations. For the first time in 20 minutes, though, I began to feel as if I was being watched. I couldn't help but glance here and there over my shoulder into the dark woods. Everything seemed pretty quiet. Eventually, my gaze was led over the river. I looked up and down it, and that's when I first saw it. Whatever it was, it was looking at us, motionless. I squinted my eyes, then pushed it off. I figured it was probably just me being paranoid. I was making shapes out of nothing. We kept walking until we got to the more populated area near a road that leads to the highway. We stopped to sit and rest for a while. By then it was 9pm. We'd been walking for about an hour. My cell phone service was back, so I sent a text to my grandma that we'd likely be back around 10 or 10.30 p.m., depending on whether or not we decided to stop at the small pond on the way back. After a few more restful minutes, we began walking back. We walked a bit slower, because to us, 10 minutes was not enough time for rest from a three-mile walk. Not too long after that, I saw that strange figure again. It was in the water near our side of the river now. Then I was certain it wasn't just a shape I was making out of nothing. We kept walking, and I was now scared beyond thought. I then could hear it move out of the water. I decided then to tell my brother and cousin about it. Guys, someone is following us. I think it's a person. They looked and laughed. Sure, why would we believe that? my cousin said in a mocking tone, my brother just giggling. We continued on, and I kept looking behind us every few moments. I would see that thing every few glances, leaning out from around a tree to look at us. It got closer every time, too, and then I heard it growl towards the end of the dead signal zone. 
What was that? My cousin asked. He had heard it too. I knew it could only be one thing. The darned thing that was following us. Altogether then, we ran until we made it to an area where there were houses closer together. We stopped then to catch our breaths. I hadn't noticed until I caught my breath, but I was crying. My brother was fine, but we were all shaken up at least somewhat. I noticed my cousin was bleeding. He said it was because he fell while we ran. Once we got back to the town, we sat on the beach, looking at the entrance of the road. Nothing came out, and no one went in. About a month after this experience, we found bloody marks in the rail guard of a small bridge down my road, and there were handprints on it. Update. I last wrote about this thing a month ago, but today I'll share what I saw only a week back. The only reason why I walked down that road again was because quarantine had me stuck with only my family around me. This time it was only me and my cousin. My brother was still too worried to go out there. I myself thought the thing would have left by now, because the first anyone saw of it was as I stated in my previous post. Now, it wasn't easy getting my cousin to go. I had to bribe him with a $20 bill. The idea was to not go too far, but to still venture down that road somewhat. Maybe hike, maybe camp, who knows. We left after dinner, and God knows what time it was. We didn't go all the way down the road, we only walked a bit, in the direction that leads to my friend's house. I even called her up and asked if we could go onto her property, and she was okay with it. Around 10 minutes into the trails, we began to hear sticks snapping behind us. I quickly remembered what had happened last time. I didn't wait around at all, I began sprinting away until I heard, it's just me. I turned around, seeing that it was my brother who had decided to come and join us. I yelled at him to never do that again. About an hour into the walk, being under a canopy of trees, it got dark fast. My brother and cousin were now fooling around, yelling dumb things to each other. It's just, it's me. just me. I turned to look at my brother and mockingly said, we know you already said that. But he was looking deep into the forest like a deer in headlights. I didn't say it that time. I looked in the direction he was looking, but I didn't see anything. Come on, let's get to the road. We began to hurry down the trail, and as if it was a horror movie, I tripped. I stood up and checked myself. I could still walk. My arm hurt quite a bit, but there was no blood. I stood up and began to walk down the trail. It's just, it's me. just me. The voice came again. I ignored it but I ended up tripping once more, not as hard this time. But with how scared I was, I ended up curling up in a ball, and I just lay there. As much as I hate to admit it, I began to cry. The voice got closer, saying the same thing over and over. I sat there, and eventually I passed out. I woke up and looked around. There it was. Even in the dimming light, I was able to see it clearly. It was taller than I thought when I first saw it. It looked to stand around eight feet tall. It was ungodly pale, a sickish grin on its face, and it looked as if there was nothing where its eyes should be. It opened its mouth, and out came the words, It's just me! It's just me! It's just me. It's just me. Then I passed out again. When I came to, I was near a rock circle. Freaking out, I looked around to see my cousin and brother sitting on one of the rocks. Where are we? They looked at me. It's our normal spot. I started to look around again. It was our normal spot. I guess I've never seen it at night. What happened? They explained how they found me a few feet off the trail passed out. They brought me here as they knew it was close. We camped there under our base that we made a year ago. We built it because we were bored, and being the oldest, I had brought out a bunch of camping stuff. We had found this area back then that was like a circle. It was near a shallow cave thing or overhang, 
and at night if he didn't know the area well, he might fall in the shallow pool of water. We turned our lantern on, talking about everything that happened, preparing to be yelled at by our parents for not coming back that night. Most of that night was spent in the hangover behind the stick lean-to walls, putting band-aids on my cuts. In the morning, we began to walk back home. Nothing out of the ordinary happened then. And as we had guessed, we did get reprimanded when we got back. But I truly will never forget what I saw. Goatman in Big Sur, California, from C. Philly 100. Many years ago, roughly 20 ton or so, some buddies and I were traveling up the west coast from Joshua Tree to Big Sur, where we stopped to camp for the night. We got our tent set up and walked down to the coast. To get down to the water, you have to pass through some thick undergrowth and a big stand of trees. We heard what we thought was a goat or sheep or something, and we noticed a vile odor hanging rank in the air. We had a nice little buzz going, so we didn't really pay too much attention to this, but kept on our merry way down to the beach. It was getting dark, and it was pretty chilly, but my friend Chance and I jumped in the water, splashing around in the waves and having a ball. Back up on the beach, we drank some wine and reveled in the magic that is California. The stars were just starting to come out, as the sun sank out of sight and the moon rising to the east marked the changing of the guard. We heard that, bah sound again, and smelled the rotten trash smell and decided to head back to camp. As soon as we entered the wood, I could sense that something was different. There was a distinct feeling that we were being watched. You know that feeling? Where the hair on the back of your neck stands up? Yeah, well, it's a pretty creepy feeling, and one I was feeling in spades at that particular point in time. It had gotten pretty dark by then, and it was even darker in the thick coastal forest. I thought I saw someone or something up on the trail ahead of us, but whatever it was ran off before we got close enough to see what it was. And there was that smell again. What the heck is that smell, man? Chance asked. I don't know, I said, but it's making me want to hurl. Suddenly, a branch started shaking violently about 20 yards off to our left, which was weird because the forest was dead calm otherwise. What the? Something came charging out of the thicket, something tall, and I mean tall at least eight or nine feet. It was bipedal and had horns on the top of its head. Run! I yelled at the top of my lungs, and run we did, crashing through the briar and bramble all the way back to camp where we jumped in the car and turned on the lights. Nothing. What the hell was that thing? Chance exclaimed. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know! I couldn't quite process what had just happened. Just then, something walked out into the headlights. It was that... that creature... It had the body of a muscle builder, but its head looked similar to that of a goat. It didn't look quite like a regular farm goat, though. Maybe more like a mountain goat, or very similar to depictions of the French Baphomet. A rather sinister and wicked-looking goat, with pale blue eyes that gleamed brightly in the headlights. I swear it looked like it was smiling at us. It leaped forward, springing off of the ground and landing hard on the hood of the car. Drive! 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 I shouted. Chance punched on the gas and the Goatman creature stepped up onto the roof of the car, and I noticed that it had swollen hocks and huge cloven hooves for feet. Its hands, however, looked like those of a large human man. It started stomping on the roof of the car, almost causing us to swerve off the road. Chance hit the brakes and the Goatman went flying forward, landing on its feet before running off into the woods. We started driving and didn't stop till we got back to civilization, where we got gas, and then kept driving. I feel bad about leaving all our gear and our tent and everything behind, but there was no way in hell we were going back there to get it. I don't know if anyone else has seen this Goatman creature out there in Big Sur, but consider yourself warned. California Goatman, let's never meet again. Wendigo and Taos, from Trace Andrew This story happened when I was around 19. Me and my three friends were out on a camping trip at Double Date in Taos, New Mexico. It was midsummer, so me and my friends drove three hours north to Taos, New Mexico, telling jokes and listening to music. When we arrived, we started setting our tents and chairs up. Then I noticed that Jack's girlfriend was not acting normal. Her happy, talkative self was now quiet and sad. I told Jack, Hey, you should go see what's wrong with her. He walked off in her direction. Me and my girlfriend sat and watched Jack and his girlfriend. When Jack walked up to his girlfriend, she broke down crying. 
Jack then carried her into their tent, and she told Jack why she was acting so strange. She said that when she was 12 years old, she went on a camping trip with her mom and dad. She said something about a Wendigo attacking her dad. It was hard to tell what she was saying because she was crying so much. They sat in the tent for a few hours, while me and my girlfriend started a fire and made food. We ate, put out the fire, and then went to our tents. The next day, we woke up and went on a 20-mile hike. We had a lot of fun, so it was time to head back to camp. A little side note, the hike was 20 miles there and back, so it wasn't a super long hike. We got back around at around 5 o'clock. We went out to my cousin's house. We talked about motorcycles, ATVs, and anything that interested us. It was getting late, so we said our goodbyes and went back to camp. Me and my girlfriend were exhausted, so we went to sleep right away. My girlfriend woke me up and said in a hushed voice, Babe, wake up. Do you hear those noises? It is probably just Jack and Adria getting it up, I replied half awake. No, it's not them. Just listen, she said. Then I heard the voices. They were more like a noise. It sounded like a choir, but deep and demonic. The voice had no emotion and was really harsh. I know you're in there, Trace, the thing said while laughing. I told my girlfriend that we should start praying. Then she said, Wait, do you hear that? It sounds like Adria crying. I'll go check on her. Stay here and don't do anything but pray, I said. I quickly unzipped the zipper on the tent and then walked over to Jack and Adria's tent. I opened the tent and walked in. I knelt down by Adria and asked her in a hushed voice, Hey, Adria, is everything okay? There is someone outside telling me to go out into the woods. It sounds like my dad, but I know it's not him. Adria responded through quiet sobs. I felt bad for Adria, so I told her that I'm going to get my girlfriend and that I'll be right back. I left to go to my tent to get my girlfriend. I had a feeling that someone was behind me. I felt a cold breath on my back. My brain told me not to turn around, but something made me turn around. I saw a creature that had patches of greenish-brown hair on it and had parts of rotting flesh on its body, and it had the head of an elk with antlers, but it had sharp teeth that were dripping saliva. The smell hit me like a freight train. The smell was like moldy dead skunks. I threw up all the food my cousin had gave me. I was scared. I walked back into my tent and shut the zipper. My girlfriend asked me what had happened. Nothing. I just saw a bobcat. I lied to her, which made me feel even worse, because I'm a terrible liar, and she looked at me with disappointment in her face. She went to look out of the tent. I tried to stop her, but she wouldn't listen to me. She opened the tent and said, There's nothing out here, babe. I looked out the tent door and sighed with relief. I told her that we needed to go back to Jack and Adria's tent. I told her that I'd have Adria explain why she was crying. My girlfriend and I walked over to Adria, where my girlfriend sat there and listened to Adria and began to comfort her. I went back to my tent and left my girlfriend with Jack and Adria. I waited for any noise or movement. I started to doze off, but then I heard a low, growling sound. I jumped at the sound and saw my tent zipper moving. My heart stopped and I held my breath. I let out a sigh of relief when I saw it was my girlfriend walking into the tent. We have to go now, she nearly yelled at me. Okay, get your bag and phone and we'll come back for our stuff tomorrow. We got in the truck and left to my cousin's house. I told my cousin about everything that had happened, and as soon as I mentioned when to go, Adria started freaking out and hyperventilating. My cousin's wife went over to Adria and asked her if she wanted tea or something. Adria said yes, so Michelle, my cousin's wife, went to the kitchen. Jack didn't even have a nightmare, or smelt the rotten smell, or even the growling sound. Jack was the lightest sleeper I had ever met. He would wake up if your heartbeat was too loud. We have never gone camping again. Jack and Adria are married now, and me and my fiancé are getting married in July of 2022. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. 
That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.